The Bad Old Woman in Black by Lord Dunsany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Bad Old Woman in Black ran down the street of the ox butchers. Windows at once were opened high up in those crazy gables. Heads were thrust out. It was she. Then there arose the council of anxious voices, calling sideways from window to window or across to opposite houses. Why was she there with her sequins and bugles and old black gown? Why had she left her dreaded house? On what fell errand she hasted? They watched her lean, lithe figure, and the wind in that old black dress, and soon she was gone from the cobbled street and under the town's high gateway. She turned at once to her right and was hid from the view of the houses. Then they all ran down to their doors, and small groups formed on the pavement, and they took counsel together, the eldest speaking first. Of what they had seen they said nothing, for there was no doubt it was she, it was of the future they spoke, and the future only. In what notorious thing would her errand end? What gains had tempted her from her fearful home? What brilliant but sinful scheme had her genius planned? Above all, what future evil did this portend? Thus, at first it was only questions, and then the old grey beards spoke, each one to a little group. They had seen her out before, had known her when she was younger, and had noted the evil things that had followed her goings. The small groups listened well to their low and earnest voices. No one asked questions now or guessed at her infamous errand, but listened only to the wise old men who knew the things that had been, and who told the younger men of the dooms that had come before. Nobody knew how many times she had left her dreaded house, but the oldest recounted all the times that they knew, and the way she had gone each time, and the doom that had followed her going, and two could remember the earthquake that there was in the street of the shearers. So were there many tales of the times that were told on the pavement near the old green doors by the edge of the cobbled street, and the experience that the aged men had bought with their white hairs might be had cheap by the young but from all their experience only this was clear, that never twice in their lives had she done the same infamous thing, and that the same calamity twice had never followed her goings. Therefore it seemed that means were doubtful and few for finding out what thing was about to befall, and an ominous feeling of gloom came down on the street of the ox-butchers. And in the gloom grew fears of the very worst. This comfort they only had when they put their fear into words, that the doom that followed her goings had never yet been anticipated. One feared that with magic she meant to move the moon, and he would have dammed the high tide on the neighbouring coast, knowing that as the moon attracted the sea, the sea must attract the moon, and hoping by his device to humble her spells. Another would have fetched iron bars and clamped them across the street, remembering the earthquake there was in the street of the shearers. Another would have honoured his household gods, the little cat-faced idols seated above his hearth, gods to whom magic was no unusual thing, and, having paid their fees and honoured them well, would have put the whole case before them. His scheme found favour with many, and yet at last was rejected, 
for others ran indoors, and brought out their gods too to be honoured, till there was a herd of gods all seated there on the pavement. Yet would they have honoured them, and put their case before them, but that a fat man ran up last of all, carefully holding under a reverent arm his own two hound-faced gods, though he knew well, as indeed all men must, that they were notoriously at war with the little cat-faced idols. And although the animosities natural to faith had been lulled by the crisis, yet a look of anger had come into the cat-like faces that no one dared disregard, and all perceived that if they stayed a moment longer there would be a flaming round from the jealousy of the gods. So each man hastily took his idols home, leaving the fat man, insisting that his hound-faced gods should be honoured. Then there were schemes again, and voices raised in debate, and many new dangers feared, and new plans made. But in the end they made no defence against danger, for they knew not what it would be, but wrote upon parchment as a warning, in order that all might know. The bad old woman in black ran down the street of the ox butchers. End of The Bad Old Woman in Black by Lord Dunsany Coco by Guy de Maupassant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.com Reading by Matt Perard Coco by Guy de Maupassant Throughout the whole countryside, the Lucas Farm was known as the Manor. No one knew why. The peasants doubtless attached to this word, Manor, a meaning of wealth and of splendor, for this farm was undoubtedly the largest, richest, and the best managed in the whole neighborhood. The immense court, surrounded by five rows of magnificent trees, which sheltered the delicate apple trees from the harsh wind of the plain, enclosed in its confines long brick buildings used for storing fodder and grain beautiful stables built of hard stone and made to accommodate thirty horses and a red brick residence which looked like a little chateau thanks for the good care taken the manure heaps were as little offensive as such things can be the watchdogs lived in kennels and countless poultry paraded through the tall grass Every day at noon, fifteen persons, masters, farmhands, and the women folks, seated themselves around the long kitchen table where the soup was brought in steaming in a large blue-flowered bowl. The beasts, horses, cows, pigs, and sheep, were fat, well-fed, and clean. Maitre Lucas, a tall man who was getting stout, would go round three times a day, overseeing everything and thinking of everything. A very old white horse, which the mistress wished to keep until its natural death, because she had brought it up and had always used it, and also because it recalled many happy memories, was housed through sheer kindness of heart at the end of the stable. A young scamp, about fifteen years old, Isidore Duval by name, and called, for convenience, Zidore, took care of this pensioner gave him his measure of oats and fodder in winter, and in summer was supposed to change his pasturing place four times a day, so that he might have plenty of fresh grass. The animal, almost crippled, lifted with difficulty his legs, large at the knees and swollen above the hoofs. His coat, which was no longer curried, looked like white hair, and his long eyelashes gave to his eyes a sad expression. When Zidore took the animal to pasture, he had to pull on the rope with all his might, because it walked so slowly, and the youth, bent over and out of breath, would swear at it, exasperated at having to care for this old nag. The farmhands, noticing the young rascal's anger against Coco, were amused and would continually talk of the horse to Zidore in order to exasperate him. 
his comrades would make sport with him. In the village, he was called Coco Zidor. The boy would fume, feeling an unholy desire to revenge himself on the horse. He was a thin, long-legged, dirty child, with thick, coarse, bristly red hair. He seemed only half-witted, and stuttered as though ideas were unable to form in his thick, brute-like mind. For a long time he had been unable to understand why Coco should be kept, indignant at seeing things wasted on this useless beast. Since the horse could no longer work, it seemed to him unjust that he should be fed. He revolted at the idea of wasting oats, oats which were so expensive, on this paralyzed old plug. And often, in spite of the orders of Maitre Lucas, he would economize on the nag's food, only giving him half measure. Hatred grew in his confused, childlike mind, the hatred of a stingy, mean, fierce, brutal, and cowardly peasant. When summer came, he had to move the animal about in the pasture. It was some distance away. The rascal, angrier every morning, would start, with his dragging step, across the wheat fields. The men working in the fields would shout to him, jokingly, Hey, Zidore, remember me to Coco. He would not answer, but on the way he would break off a switch, and as soon as he had moved the old horse, he would let it begin grazing. Then, treacherously, sneaking up behind it, he would slash its legs. The animal would try to escape, to kick, to get away from the blows, and run around in a circle about its rope, as though it had been enclosed in a circus ring. And the boy would slash away furiously, running along behind, his teeth clenched in anger. Then he would go away slowly, without turning round, while the horse watched him disappear, his ribs sticking out, panting as a result of his unusual exertions. Not until the blue blouse of the young peasant was out of sight would he lower his thin white head to the grass. As the nights were now warm, Coco was allowed to sleep out of doors, in the field behind the little wood. Zidore alone went to see him. The boy threw stones at him to amuse himself. He would sit down on an embankment about ten feet away and would stay there about half an hour from time to time throwing a sharp stone at the old horse, which remained standing tied before his enemy, watching him continually and not daring to eat before he was gone. This one thought persisted in the mind of the young scamp. Why feed this horse, which is no longer good for anything? It seemed to him that this old nag was stealing the food of the others, the goods of man and God, that he was even robbing him, Zidor, who was working. Then, little by little, each day, the boy began to shorten the length of rope which allowed the horse to graze. The hungry animal was growing thinner and starving. Too feeble to break his bonds, he would stretch his head out toward the tall, green, tempting grass, so near that he could smell, and yet so far that he could not touch it. But one morning Zidore had an idea. It was not to move Coco any more. He was tired of walking so far for that old skeleton. He came, however, in order to enjoy his vengeance. The beast watched him anxiously. He did not beat him that day. He walked around him with hands in his pockets. He even pretended to change his place but he sank the stake in exactly the same hole, and went away overjoyed with his invention. The horse, seeing him leave, neighed to call him back, but the rascal began to run, leaving him alone, entirely alone in his field, well tied down, and without a blade of grass within reach. Starving, he tried to reach the grass, which he could touch with the end of his nose, he got on his knees, stretching out his neck and his long, drooling lips, all in vain. The old animal spent the whole day in useless, terrible efforts. The sight of all that green food, which stretched out on all sides of him, 
served to increase the gnawing pangs of hunger. The scamp did not return that day. He wandered through the woods in search of nests. The next day he appeared upon the scene again. Coco, exhausted, had lain down. When he saw the boy, he got up, expecting at last to have his place changed. But the little peasant did not even touch the mallet, which was lying on the ground. He came nearer, looked at the animal, threw at his head a clump of earth which flattened out against the white hair, and he started off again, whistling. The horse remained standing as long as he could see him. Then, knowing that his attempts to reach the nearby grass would be hopeless, he once more lay down on his side and closed his eyes. The following day, Zidore did not come. When he did come, at last, he found Coco still stretched out. He saw that he was dead. Then he remained standing, looking at him, pleased with what he had done, surprised that it should already be all over. He touched him with his foot, lifted one of his legs, and then let it drop, sat on him, and remained there, his eyes fixed on the grass, thinking of nothing. He returned to the farm, but did not mention the accident, because he wished to wander about at the hours when he used to change the horse's pasture. He went to see him the next day. At his approach, some crows flew away. Countless flies were walking over the body and were buzzing around it. When he returned home, he announced the event. The animal was so old that nobody was surprised. The master said to two of the men, Take your shovels and dig a hole right where he is. The men buried the horse at the place where he had died of hunger, and the grass grew thick, green, and vigorous, fed by the poor body. End of Coco by Guy de Maupassant. The Mysterious Mansion by Honoré de Balzac. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Mysterious Mansion by Honoré de Balzac. About a hundred yards from the town of Vendôme, on the borders of the Loire, there is an old grey house, surrounded by very high gables, and so completely isolated, that neither tan-yard nor shabby hostelry, such as you may find at the entrance to all small towns, exists in its immediate neighbourhood. In front of this building, overlooking the river, is a garden, where the once well-trimmed box borders that used to define the walks now grow wild as they list. Several billows that spring from the Loire have grown as rapidly as the hedge that encloses it and half conceals the house. The rich vegetation of those weeds that we call fowl adorns the sloping shore. Fruit trees, neglected for the last ten years, no longer yield their harvest, and their shoots form coppices. The wall fruit grow like hedges against the walls. Paths once gravelled are overgrown with moss, but, to tell the truth, there is no trace of a path. From the height of the hill to which cling the ruins of the old castle of the Dukes of Vendôme, the only spot whence the eye can plunge into this enclosure, it strikes you that, at a time not easy to determine, this plot of land was the delight of a country gentleman who cultivated roses and tulips and horticulture in general, and who was, besides, a lover of fine fruit. An arbor is visible, or rather the debris of an arbor, where there is a table that time has not quite destroyed. The aspect of this garden of bygone days suggests the negative joys of peaceful provincial life, as one might reconstruct the life of a worthy tradesman by reading the epitaph on his tombstone. 
as if to complete the sweetness and sadness of the ideas that possess one's soul one of the walls displays a sundial decorated with the following commonplace christian inscription ultimam cogita the roof of this house is horribly dilapidated the shutters are always closed the balconies are covered with swallows nests the doors are perpetually shut weeds have drawn green lines in the cracks of the flight of steps the locks and bolts are rusty sun moon winter summer and snow have worn the panelling warped the boards gnawed the paint the lugubrious silence which reigns there is only broken by birds cats martins rats and mice free to course to and fro to fight and to eat each other everywhere an invisible hand has graven the word mystery should your curiosity lead you to glance at this house from the side that points to the road you would perceive a great door which the children of the place have riddled with holes i afterward heard that this door had been closed for the last ten years through the holes broken by the boys you would have observed the perfect harmony that existed between the facades of both garden and courtyard in both the same disorder prevails tufts of weed encircle the paving stones enormous cracks furrow the walls round whose blackened crests twine the thousand garlands of the pellitory the steps are out of joint the wire of the bell is rusted the spouts are cracked what fire from heaven has fallen here what tribunal has decreed that salt should be strewn on this dwelling has god been blasphemed has france been betrayed these are the questions we ask ourselves but get no answer from the crawling things that haunt the place the empty and deserted house is a gigantic enigma of which the key is lost in bygone times it was a small fief and bears the name of the grand bretèche i inferred that i was not the only person to whom my good landlady had communicated the secret of which i was to be the sole recipient and i prepared to listen sir she said when the emperor sent the spanish prisoners of war and others here the government quartered on me a young spaniard who had been sent to vendome on parole parole notwithstanding he went out every day to show himself to the sous-prefet he was a spanish grandee nothing less his name ended in os and dia something like burgos de feridia i have heard his name on my books you can read it if you like oh but he was a handsome young man for a spaniard they are all said to be ugly he was only five feet and a few inches high but he was well grown he had small hands that he took such care of ah you should have seen he had as many brushes for his hands as a woman for her whole dressing apparatus he had thick black hair a fiery eye his skin was rather bronzed but i liked the look of it he wore the finest linen i have ever seen on any one although i have had princesses staying here and among others general bertrand the duke and duchess d'abrantes monsieur de Caz, and the king of spain he didn't eat much but his manners were so polite so amiable that one could not owe him a grudge oh i was very fond of him although he didn't open his lips four times in a day and it was impossible to keep up a conversation with him for if you spoke to him he did not answer it was a fad a mania with them all i heard say he read his breviary like a priest he went to mass and to all the services regularly where did he sit two steps from the chapel of madame de merret 
as he took his place there the first time he went to church nobody suspected him of any intention in so doing besides he never raised his eyes from his prayer book poor young man after that sir in the evening he would walk on the mountains among the castle ruins it was the poor man's only amusement it reminded him of his country they say that spain is all mountains from the commencement of his imprisonment he stayed out late i was anxious when i found that he did not come home before midnight but we got accustomed to this fancy of his he took the key off the door and we left off sitting up for him he lodged in a house of ours in the rue de Cassin. after that one of our stablemen told us that in the evening when he led the horses to the water he thought he had seen the spanish grandee swimming far down the river like a live fish when he returned i told him to take care of the rushes he appeared vexed to have been seen in the water at last one day or rather one morning we did not find him in his room he had not returned after searching everywhere i found some writing in the drawer of a table where there were fifty gold pieces of spain that are called doubloons and were worth about five thousand francs and ten thousand francs worth of diamonds in a small sealed box the writing said that in case he did not return he left us the money and the diamonds on condition of paying for masses to thank god for his escape and for his salvation in those days my husband had not been taken from me he hastened to seek him everywhere and now the strange part of the story he brought home the spaniard's clothes that he had discovered under a big stone in a sort of pile-work by the riverside near the castle nearly opposite to the grand bretesh my husband had gone there so early that no one had seen him after reading the letter he burned the clothes and according to count federia's desire we declared that he had escaped the sous prefet sent all the gendarmerie in pursuit of him but brust they never caught him lepa believed that the spaniard had drowned himself i sir don't think so i am more inclined to believe that he had something to do with the affair of madame de merret seeing that rosalie told me that the crucifix that her mistress thought so much of that she had it buried with her was of ebony and silver now in the beginning of his stay here monsieur de federia had one in ebony and silver that i never saw him with later now sir don't you consider that i have need no scruples about the spaniard's fifteen thousand francs and that i have a right to them certainly but you haven't tried to question rosalie i said oh yes indeed sir but to no purpose the girl's like a wall she knows something but it is impossible to get her to talk after exchanging a few more words with me my landlady left me a prey to vague and gloomy thoughts to a romantic curiosity and a religious terror not unlike the profound impression produced on us when by night on entering a dark church we perceive a faint light under high arches a vague figure glides by the rustle of a robe or cassock is heard and we shudder suddenly the grand bretèche and all its tall weeds its barred windows its rusty ironwork its closed doors its deserted apartments appeared like a fantastic apparition before me i essayed to penetrate the mysterious dwelling and to find the knot of its dark story the drama that had killed three persons in my eyes rosalie became the most interesting person in vendome as i studied her i discovered the traces of secret care despite the radiant health that shone in her plump countenance there was in her the germ of remorse or hope her attitude revealed a secret like the attitude of a bigot who prays to excess or of the infanticide who ever hears the last cry of her child yet her manners were rough and ingenuous her silly smile was not that of a criminal 
and could you but have seen the great kerchief that encompassed her portly bust framed and laced in by a lilac and blue cotton gown you would have dubbed her innocent no i thought i will not leave vendome without learning the history of the grande bretèche to gain my ends i will strike up a friendship with rosalie if needs be rosalie said i one evening sir you are not married she started slightly oh i can find plenty of men when the fancy takes me to be made miserable she said laughing she soon recovered from the effects of her emotion for all women from the great lady to the maid of the inn possess a composure that is peculiar to them you are too good-looking and well favoured to be short of lovers but tell me rosalie why did you take service in an inn after leaving madame de merret did she leave you nothing to live on oh yes but sir my place is the best in all vendome the reply was one of those that judges and lawyers would call evasive rosalie appeared to me to be situated in this romantic history like the square in the midst of a chessboard she was at the heart of the truth and chief interest she seemed to me to be bound in the very knot of it the conquest of rosalie was no longer to be an ordinary siege in this girl was centred the last chapter of a novel therefore from this moment rosalie became the object of my preference one morning i said to rosalie tell me all you know about madame de merret oh she replied in terror do not ask that of me monsieur horars pretty face fell clear bright colour faded and her eyes lost their innocent brightness well then she said at last if you must have it so i will tell you about it but promise to keep my secret done my dear girl i must keep your secret with the honour of a thief which is the most loyal in the world were i to transcribe rosalie's diffuse eloquence faithfully an entire volume would scarcely contain it so i shall abridge the room occupied by madame de merret at the bretèche was on the ground floor a little closet about four feet deep built in the thickness of the wall served as a wardrobe three months before the eventful evening of which i am about to speak madame de merret had been so seriously indisposed that her husband had left her to herself in her own apartment while he occupied another on the first floor by one of those chances that it is impossible to foresee he returned home from the club where he was accustomed to read the papers and discuss politics with the inhabitants of the place two hours later than usual his wife supposed him to be at home in bed and asleep but the invasion of france had been the subject of a most animated discussion the billiard match had been exciting he had lost forty francs an enormous sum for vendome where every one hoards and where manners are restricted within the limits of a praiseworthy modesty which perhaps is the source of the true happiness that no parisian covets for some time m de merret had been satisfied to ask rosalie if his wife had gone to bed and on her reply which was always in the affirmative had immediately gained his own room with a good temper engendered by habit and confidence on entering his house he took it to his head to go and tell his wife of his misadventure perhaps by way of consolation at dinner he found madame de merret most coquettishly attired on his way to the club it had occurred to him that his wife was restored to health and that her convalescence had added to her beauty she was as husbands are wont to be somewhat slow in making this discovery instead of calling rosalie who was occupied just then in watching the cook and coachman play a difficult hand at brisque m de merret went to his wife's room by the light of a lantern that he deposited on the first step of the staircase his unmistakable step resounded under the vaulted corridor at the moment that the count turned the handle of his wife's door 
he fancied he could hear the door of the closet I spoke of close. But when he entered, Madame de Merret was alone before the fireplace. The husband thought ingenuously that Rosalie was in the closet, yet a suspicion that jangled in his ear put him on his guard. He looked at his wife and saw in her eyes I know not what wild and hunted expression. "'You are very late,' she said. Her habitually pure, sweet voice seemed changed to him. Monsieur de Merret did not reply, for at that moment Rosalie entered. It was a thunderbolt for him. He strode about the room, passing from one window to the other, with mechanical motion and folded arms. "'Have you heard bad news, or are you unwell?' inquired his wife timidly, while Rosalie undressed her. He kept silent. "'You can leave me,' said Madame de Merret to her maid. "'I will put my hair in curl papers myself.' From the expression of her husband's face she foresaw trouble and wished to be alone with him. When Rosalie had gone, or was supposed to have gone, for she stayed in the corridor for a few minutes, Monsieur de Merret came and stood in front of his wife and said coldly to her, "'Madame, there is someone in your closet.' She looked calmly at her husband and replied simply, "'No, sir.' This answer was heart-rending to Monsieur de Merret. He did not believe in it, yet his wife had never appeared to him purer or more saintly than at that moment. He rose to open the closet door. Madame de Merret took his hand, looked at him with an expression of melancholy, and said in a voice that betrayed singular emotion, "'If you find no one there, remember this, all will be over between us. The extraordinary dignity of his wife's manner restored the Count's profound esteem for her, and inspired him with one of those resolutions that only lack a vaster stage to become immortal. No, said he, Josephine, I will not go there. In either case it would separate us forever. Hear me. I know how pure you are at heart, and that your life is a holy one. You would not commit a mortal sin to save your life." At these words Madame de Merret turned a haggard gaze upon her husband. "'Here, take your crucifix,' he said. "'Swear to me before God that there is no one in there. I will believe you. I will never open that door.' Madame de Merret took the crucifix and said, "'I swear.' "'Louder!' said the husband, and repeat, I swear before God that there is no one in that closet. She repeated the sentence calmly. That will do, said Monsieur de Merret coldly. After a moment of silence, I never saw this pretty toy before, he said, examining the ebony crucifix inlaid with silver and most artistically chiseled. I found it at Duvivier's, and bought it of a Spanish monk, when the prisoners passed through Vendôme last year. Ah, said Monsieur de Merret, as he replaced the crucifix on the nail, and he rang. Rosalie did not keep him waiting. Monsieur de Merret went quickly to meet her, led her to the bay window that opened on to the garden and whispered to her. Listen, I know that Gorenflot wishes to marry you. Poverty is the only drawback and you told him that you would be his wife if he found the means to establish himself as a master mason. Well, go and fetch him. Tell him to come here with his trowel and tools. Manage not to awaken anyone in this house but himself. His fortune will be more than your desires. Above all, leave this room without babbling, otherwise. He frowned. Rosalie went away. He recalled her. Here, Take my latch-key, he said. Jean, then cried Monsieur de Merret in tones of thunder in the corridor. Jean, who was at the same time his coachman and his confidential servant, left his game of cards and came. Go to bed, all of you, said his master, signing him to approach, and the Count added under his breath, When they are all asleep, asleep, do you hear, you will come down and tell me. 
Monsieur de Merret, who had not lost sight of his wife all the time he was giving his orders, returned quietly to her at the fireside, and began to tell her of the game of billiards and the talk of the club. When Rosalie returned, she found Monsieur and Madame de Merret conversing very amicably. The Count had lately had all the ceilings of his reception rooms on the ground floor repaired. Plaster of Paris is difficult to obtain in Vendôme, the carriage raises its price. The Count had therefore bought a good deal, being well aware that he could find plenty of purchasers for whatever might remain over. This circumstance inspired him with the design he was about to execute. Sir, Gorenflot has arrived, said Rosalie in low tones. Show him in, replied the Count in loud tones. Madame de Merret turned rather pale when she saw the mason. Gorenflot, said her husband, go and fetch bricks from the coach house, and bring sufficient to wall up the door of this closet. You will use the plaster I have over to coat the wall with. Then calling Rosalie and the workmen aside, Listen, Gorenflot, he said in an undertone, you will sleep here tonight but tomorrow you will have a passport to a foreign country, to a town to which I will direct you. I shall give you six thousand francs for your journey. You will stay ten years in that town. If you do not like it, you may establish yourself in another, provided it be in the same country. You will pass through Paris, where you will await me. There I will insure you an additional six thousand francs by contract which will be paid to you on your return, provided you have fulfilled the conditions of our bargain. This is the price for your absolute silence as to what you are about to do tonight. As to you, Rosalie, I will give you ten thousand francs on the day of your wedding, on condition of your marrying Gorinflot. But if you wish to marry, you must hold your tongues, or no dowry. Rosalie, said Madame de Merret, do my hair. The husband walked calmly up and down, watching the door, the mason, and his wife, but without betraying any insulting doubts. Madame de Merret chose a moment when the workman was unloading bricks and her husband was at the other end of the room to say, A thousand francs a year for you, my child, if you can tell Gorenflot to leave a chink at the bottom. Then out loud she added coolly, Go and help him. Monsieur and Madame de Merret were silent all the time that Gorenflot took to brick up the door. This silence on the part of her husband, who did not choose to furnish his wife with a pretext for saying things of a double meaning, had its purpose. On the part of Madame de Merret it was either pride or prudence. When the wall was halfway up, the sly workman took advantage of a moment when the Count's back was turned to strike a blow with his trowel in one of the glass panes of the closet door. This act informed Madame de Merret that Rosalie had spoken to Gorenflot. All three then saw a man's face. It was dark and gloomy, with black hair and eyes of flame. Before her husband turned, the poor woman had time to make a sign to the stranger that signified hope. At four o'clock to a dawn, for it was the month of September, the construction was finished. The mason was handed over to the care of Jean, and Monsieur de Merret went to bed in his wife's room. On rising the following morning, he said carelessly, The deuce! I must go to Marie for the passport. He put his hat on his head, advanced three steps toward the door, altered his mind, and took the crucifix. His wife trembled for joy. He is going to Duvivier, she thought. As soon as the Count had left, Madame de Merret rang for Rosalie, then in a terrible voice. The trowel, the trowel, she cried, and quick to work. I saw how Gorenflot did it. We shall have time to make a hole and to mend it again. In the twinkling of an eye, Rosalie brought a sort of mattock to her mistress, who, with unparalleled ardour, set about demolishing the wall. She had already knocked out several bricks and was preparing to strike a more decisive blow when she perceived Monsieur de Merret behind her. She fainted. Lay Madame on her bed, said the Count coldly. 
he had foreseen what would happen in his absence, and had set a trap for his wife. He had simply written to the mayor, and had sent for Duvivier. The jeweller arrived just as the room had been put in order. Duvivier, inquired the Count, did you buy crucifixes of the Spaniards who passed through here? No, sir. That will do, thank you, he said, looking at his wife like a tiger. Jean, he added, you will see that my meals are served in the Countess's room. She is ill, and I shall not leave her until she has recovered. The cruel gentleman stayed with his wife for twenty days. In the beginning, when there were sounds in the walled closet, and Josephine attempted to implore his pity for the dying stranger, he replied, without permitting her to say a word, You have sworn on the cross that there is no one there. End of The Mysterious Mansion by Honoré de Balzac Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama The Upper Birth by F. Marion Crawford. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Upper Birth by F. Marion Crawford. Read for you by Michelle Chevalier. Forum name Beagle Mixtape. Somebody asked for the cigars. We had talked long, and the conversation was beginning to languish. The tobacco smoke had got into the heavy curtains, the wine had got into those brains which were liable to become heavy, and it was already perfectly evident that, unless somebody did something to rouse our oppressed spirits, the meeting would soon come to its natural conclusion, and we, the guests, would speedily go home to bed, and most certainly to sleep. No one had said anything very remarkable. It may be that no one had anything very remarkable to say. Jones had given us every particular of his last hunting adventure in Yorkshire. Mr. Tomkins of Boston had explained at elaborate length those working principles by the due and careful maintenance of which the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad not only extended its territory, increased its departmental influence, and transported livestock without starving them to death before the day of actual delivery, but had also for years succeeded in deceiving those passengers who bought its tickets into the fallacious belief that the corporation aforesaid was really able to transport human life without destroying it. Signor Tambola had endeavored to persuade us, by arguments which we took no trouble to oppose, that the unity of his country in no way resembled the average modern torpedo, carefully planned, constructed with all of the skill of the greatest European arsenals, but when constructed, destined to be directed by feeble hands into a region where it must undoubtedly explode, unseen, unfeared, and unheard, into the illimitable wastes of political chaos. It is unnecessary to go into further details. The conversation had assumed proportions which would have bored Prometheus on his rock, which would have driven Tantalus to distraction, and which would have impelled Ixion to seek relaxation in the simple but instructive dialogues of Herr Ollendorf, rather than to submit to the greater evil of listening to our talk. We had sat at table for hours, we were bored, we were tired, and nobody showed signs of moving. Somebody called for cigars. We all instinctively looked towards the speaker. Brisbane was a man of five and thirty years of age, and remarkable for those gifts which chiefly attract the attention of men. He was a strong man. The external proportions of his figure presented nothing extraordinary to the common eye, though his size was above the average. He was a little over six feet in height, and moderately broad in the shoulder. He did not appear to be stout, but on the other hand he was certainly not thin. His small head was supported by a strong and sinewy neck, his broad muscular hands appeared to possess a peculiar skill in breaking walnuts without the assistance of the ordinary cracker, and, seeing him in profile, one could not help remarking the extraordinary breadth of his sleeves and the unusual thickness of his chest. He was one of those men who are commonly spoken of among men as deceptive, that is to say, that though he looked exceedingly strong, he was in reality very much stronger than he looked. Of his features I need say little. His head is small, his hair is thin, his eyes are blue, his nose is large, he has a small mustache and a square jaw. Everybody knows Brisbane, and when he asked for a cigar, everybody looked at him. It is a very singular thing, said Brisbane. Everybody stopped talking. Brisbane's voice was not loud, but possessed a peculiar quality of penetrating general conversation and cutting it like a knife. Everybody listened. 
Brisbane, perceiving that he had attracted their general attention, lit his cigar with great equanimity. "'It is very singular,' he continued, "'that thing about ghosts. People are always asking whether anybody has seen a ghost. I have.' "'Bosh! What, you? You don't mean to say so, Brisbane. Well, for a man of his intelligence!' A chorus of exclamations greeted Brisbane's remarkable statement. Everybody called for cigars, and Stubbs the butler suddenly appeared from the depths of nowhere with a fresh bottle of dry champagne. The situation was saved. Brisbane was going to tell a story. "'I am an old sailor,' said Brisbane, "'and as I have to cross the Atlantic pretty often, I have my favorites. Most men have their favorites.' I have seen a man wait in a Broadway bar for three quarters of an hour for a particular car which he liked. I believe the barkeeper made at least one third of his living by that man's preference. I have a habit of waiting for certain ships when I am obliged to cross that duck pond. It may be a prejudice, but I was never cheated out of a good passage but once in my life. I remember it very well. It was a warm morning in June, and the Custom House officials, who were hanging about waiting for a steamer already on her way up from the quarantine, presented a peculiarly hazy and thoughtful appearance. I had not much luggage. I never have. I mingled with the crowd of passengers, porters, and officious individuals in blue coats and brass buttons, who seemed to spring up like mushrooms from the deck of a moored steamer to obtrude their unnecessary services upon the independent passenger. I have often noticed with a certain interest the spontaneous evolution of these fellows. They are not there when you arrive. Five minutes after the pilot has called, go ahead, they, or at least their blue coats and brass buttons, have disappeared from deck and gangway as completely as though they had been consigned to that locker which tradition unanimously ascribes to Davy Jones. But at the moment of starting, they are there, clean-shaved, blue-coated, and ravenous for fees. I hastened on board. The Camp Shotka was one of my favorite ships. I say was, because she emphatically no longer is. I cannot conceive of any inducement which could entice me to make another voyage in her. Yes, I know what you are going to say. She is uncommonly clean in the run aft, she has enough bluffing off in the bows to keep her dry, and the lower berths are most of them double. She has a lot of advantages, but I won't cross in her again. Excuse the digression. I got on board. I hailed a steward, whose red nose and redder whiskers were equally familiar to me. One hundred and five lower berth, said I, in the business-like tone peculiar to men who think no more of crossing the Atlantic than taking a whiskey cocktail at downtown Delmonico's. The steward took my portmanteau, great coat, and rug. I shall never forget the expression on his face. Not that he turned pale. It is maintained by the most eminent divines that even miracles cannot change the course of nature. I have no hesitation in saying that he did not turn pale, but from his expression I judged that he was either about to shed tears, to sneeze, or to drop my portmanteau. As the latter contained two bottles of particularly fine old cherry presented to me for my voyage by my old friend Sniggensid von Pickens, I felt extremely nervous. But the steward did none of these things. "'Well, I'm damned,' said he in a low voice, and led the way. I supposed my Hermes, as he led me to the lower regions, had had a little grog, but I said nothing, and followed him. One hundred and five was on the port side, well aft. There was nothing remarkable about the stateroom. The lower berth, like most of those upon the camp Shotka, was double. There was plenty of room, there was the usual washing apparatus, calculated to convey an idea of luxury to the mind of a North American Indian. There were the usual inefficient racks of brown wood, in which it is more easy to hang a large-sized umbrella than the common toothbrush of commerce. Upon the uninviting mattresses were carefully folded together those blankets which a great modern humorist has aptly compared to cold buckwheat cakes. The question of towels was left entirely to the imagination. The glass decanters were filled with a transparent liquid faintly tinged with brown, but from which an odor less faint, but not more pleasing, ascended to the nostrils, like a far-off seasick reminiscence of oily machinery. Sad-colored curtains half-closed the upper berth. The hazy June daylights shed a faint illumination upon the desolate little scene. Ugh! Oh, how I hate that stateroom! The steward deposited my traps and looked at me, as though he wanted to get away, probably in search of more passengers and more fees. 
It is always a good plan to start in favor with those functionaries, and I accordingly gave him certain coins there and then. I'll try and make her comfortable all I can, he remarked, as he put the coins in his pocket. Nevertheless, there was a doubtful intonation in his voice which surprised me. Perhaps his scale of fees had gone up, and he was not satisfied. But on the whole, I was inclined to think that, as he himself would have expressed it, he was the better for a glass. I was wrong, however, and did the man injustice. 2. Nothing especially worthy of mention occurred during that day. We left the pier punctually, and it was very pleasant to be fairly under way, for the weather was warm and sultry, and the motion of the steamer produced a refreshing breeze. Everybody knows what the first day at sea is like. People pace the decks and stare at each other, and occasionally meet acquaintances whom they did not know to be on board. There is the usual uncertainty as to whether the food will be good, bad, or indifferent, until the first two meals have put the matter beyond a doubt. There is the usual uncertainty about the weather, until the ship is fairly off Fire Island. The tables are crowded at first, and then suddenly thinned. Pale-faced people spring from their seats and precipitate themselves toward the door, and each old sailor breathes more freely as his seasick neighbor rushes from his side, leaving him plenty of elbow room and an unlimited command over the mustard. One passage across the Atlantic is very much like another, and we who cross very often do not make the voyage for the sake of novelty. Whales and icebergs are indeed always objects of interest, but after all, one whale is very much like another whale, and one rarely sees an iceberg at close quarters. To the majority of us, the most delightful moment of the day on board an ocean steamer is when we have taken our last turn on deck, have smoked our last cigar, and having succeeded in tiring ourselves, feel at liberty to turn in with a clear conscience. On that first night of the voyage I felt particularly lazy, and went to bed in 105 rather earlier than I usually do. As I turned in, I was amazed to see that I was to have a companion. A portmanteau, very like my own, lay in the opposite corner, and in the upper berth had been deposited a neatly folded rug with a stick and umbrella. I had hoped to be alone, and I was disappointed, but I wondered who my roommate was to be, and I determined to have a look at him. Before I had been long in bed, he entered. He was, as far as I could see, a very tall man, very thin, very pale, with sandy hair and whiskers and colorless gray eyes. He had about him, I thought, an air of rather dubious fashion, the sort of man you might see in Wall Street, without being able precisely to say what he was doing there, the sort of man who frequents the Café Anglais, who always seems to be alone and who drinks champagne. You might meet him on a race course, but he would never appear to be doing anything there either. A little overdressed, a little odd. There are three or four of his kind on every ocean steamer. I made up my mind that I did not care to make his acquaintance, and I went to sleep saying to myself that I would study his habits in order to avoid him. If he rose early, I would rise late. If he went to bed late, I would go to bed early. I did not care to know him. If you once know people of that kind, they are always turning up. Poor fellow! I need not have taken the trouble to come to so many decisions about him, for I never saw him again after that first night in 105. I was sleeping soundly when I was suddenly waked by a loud noise. To judge from the sound, my roommate must have sprung with a single leap from the upper berth to the floor. I heard him fumbling with the latch and bolt of the door, which opened almost immediately. And then I heard his footsteps as he ran at full speed down the passage, leaving the door open behind him. The ship was rolling a little, and I expected to hear him stumble or fall, but he ran as though he were running for his life. The door swung on its hinges with the motion of the vessel, and the sound annoyed me. I got up and shut it, and groped my way back to my berth in the darkness. I went to sleep again, but I have no idea how long I slept. When I awoke it was still quite dark, but I felt a disagreeable sensation of cold, and it seemed to me that the air was damp. You know the peculiar smell of a cabin which has been wet with sea water. I covered myself up as well as I could and dozed off again, framing complaints to be made the next day, and selecting the most powerful epithets in the language. I could hear my roommate turn over in the upper berth. He had probably returned while I was asleep. 
Once I thought I heard him groan, and I argued that he was seasick. That is particularly unpleasant when one is below. Nevertheless, I dozed off and slept till early daylight. The ship was rolling heavily, much more than on the previous evening, and the gray light which came in through the porthole changed in tint with every movement according as the angle of the vessel's side turned the glass seawards or skywards. It was very cold, unaccountably so for the month of June. I turned my head and looked at the porthole, and saw to my surprise that it was wide open and hooked back. I believe I swore audibly. Then I got up and shut it. As I turned back, I glanced at the upper berth. The curtains were drawn together. My companion had probably felt cold as well as I. It struck me that I had slept enough. The stateroom was uncomfortable, though. Strange to say, I could not smell the dampness which had annoyed me in the night. My roommate was still asleep. Excellent opportunity for avoiding him, so I dressed at once and went on deck. The day was warm and cloudy, with an oily smell in the water. It was seven o'clock as I came out, much later than I had imagined. I came across the doctor, who was taking his first sniff of the morning air. He was a young man from the west of Ireland, a tremendous fellow, with black hair and blue eyes, already inclined to be stout. He had a happy-go-lucky, healthy look about him which was rather attractive. "'Fine morning,' I remarked by way of introduction. "'Well,' said he, eyeing me with an air of ready interest, "'it's a fine morning, and it's not a fine morning. I don't think it's much of a morning.' "'Well, no, it is not so very fine,' said I. "'It's just what I call fuggly weather,' replied the doctor. "'It was very cold last night, too, I thought,' I remarked. "'However, when I looked about, I found that the porthole was wide open. "'I had not noticed it when I went to bed, and the stateroom was damp, too.' "'Damp,' said he. "'Whereabouts are you?' "'One hundred and five. To my surprise, the doctor started visibly and stared at me. "'What is the matter?' I asked. "'Oh, nothing,' he answered. "'Only everybody has complained of that stateroom for the last three trips.' "'I shall complain, too,' I said. "'It has certainly not been properly aired. It is a shame.' "'I don't believe it can be helped,' answered the doctor. "'I believe there is something—well, it is not my business to frighten passengers.' "'You need not be afraid of frightening me,' I replied. "'I can stand any amount of damp. "'If I should get a bad cold, I will come to you.' "'I offered the doctor a cigar, which he took and examined very critically. "'It is not so much the damp,' he remarked. "'However, I dare say you will get on very well. "'Have you a roommate?' "'Yes, a deuce of a fellow who bolts out in the middle of the night and leaves the door open.' Again the doctor glanced curiously at me. Then he lit the cigar and looked grave. "'Did he come back?' he asked presently. "'Yes. I was asleep, and I waked up and heard him moving. Then I felt cold and went to sleep again. This morning I found the porthole open.' "'Look here,' said the doctor quietly. "'I don't care much for this ship. I don't care a rap for her reputation. I tell you what I will do.' I have a good-sized place up here. I will share it with you, though I don't know you from Adam." I was very much surprised at the proposition. I couldn't imagine why he would take such a sudden interest in my welfare. However, his manner as he spoke of the ship was peculiar. "'You are very good, doctor,' I said. But really, I believe even now the cabin could be aired, or cleaned out, or something. Why do you not care for the ship?' "'We are not superstitious in our profession, sir,' replied the doctor. "'But the sea makes people so. "'I don't want to prejudice you, and I don't want to frighten you. "'But if you will take my advice, you will move in here. "'I would as soon see you overboard,' he added, "'as know that you or any other man was to sleep in 105. "'Good gracious! Why?' I asked. "'Just because on the last three trips the people who have slept there "'actually have gone overboard.' he answered gravely. The intelligence was startling and exceedingly unpleasant, I confess. I looked hard at the doctor to see whether he was making game of me, but he looked perfectly serious. I thanked him warmly for his offer, but told him I intended to be the exception to the rule by which everyone who slept in that particular stateroom went overboard. 
He did not say much, but looked as grave as ever, and hinted that before we got across I should probably reconsider his proposal. In the course of time we went to breakfast, at which only an inconsiderable number of passengers assembled. I noticed that one or two of the officers who breakfasted with us looked grave. After breakfast I went into my stateroom in order to get a book. The curtains of the upper berth were still closely drawn. Not a word was to be heard. My roommate was probably still asleep. As I came out I met the steward whose business it was to look after me. He whispered that the captain wanted to see me, and then scuttled away down the passage as if very anxious to avoid any questions. I went toward the captain's cabin and found him waiting for me. Sir, said he, I want to ask a favor of you. I answered that I would do anything to oblige him. Your roommate has disappeared, he said. He is known to have turned in early last night. Did you notice anything extraordinary in his manner? The question coming, as it did, an exact confirmation of the fears the doctor had expressed half an hour earlier, staggered me. You don't mean to say he's gone overboard? I asked. I fear he has, answered the captain. This is the most extraordinary thing, I began. Why? he asked. He is the fourth, then, I explained. In answer to another question from the captain, I explained, without mentioning the doctor, that I had heard the story concerning 105. He seemed very much annoyed at hearing that I knew of it. I told him what had occurred in the night. "'What you say,' he replied, "'coincides almost exactly with what was told me by the roommates of two of the other three. They bolt out of bed and run down the passage. Two of them were seen to go overboard by the watch. We stopped and lowered boats, but they were not found. Nobody, however, saw or heard the man who was lost last night, if he is really lost.' The steward, who was a superstitious fellow, perhaps, and expected something to go wrong, went to look for him this morning, and found his berth empty, but his clothes lying about, just as he had left them. The steward was the only man on board who knew him by sight, and he has been searching everywhere for him. He has disappeared. Now, sir, I want to beg you not to mention the circumstance to any of the passengers. I don't want the ship to get a bad name, and nothing hangs about an ocean-goer like stories of suicides. You shall have your choice of any one of the officers' cabins you like, including my own, for the rest of the passage. Is that a fair bargain? Very, said I, and I am much obliged to you. But since I am alone, and have the stateroom to myself, I would rather not move. If the steward will take out that unfortunate man's things, I would as leave stay where I am. I will not say anything about the matter, and I think I can promise you that I will not follow my roommate. The captain tried to dissuade me from my intention, but I preferred having a stateroom alone to being the chum of any officer on board. I do not know whether I acted foolishly, but if I had taken his advice, I should have had nothing more to tell. There would have remained the disagreeable coincidence of several suicides occurring among men who had slept in the same cabin, but that would have been all. That was not the end of the matter, however, by any means. I obstinately made up my mind that I would not be disturbed by such tales, and I even went so far as to argue the question with the captain. There was something wrong about the stateroom, I said. It was rather damp. The porthole had been left open last night. My roommate might have been ill when he came on board, and he might have become delirious after he went to bed. He might even now be hiding somewhere on board, and might be found later. The place ought to be aired, and the fastening of the port looked to. If the captain would give me leave, I would see that what I thought necessary were done immediately. "'Of course you have a right to stay where you are, if you please,' he replied rather petulantly. "'But I wish you would turn out and let me lock the place up and be done with it.' I did not see it in the same light, and left the captain, after promising to be silent concerning the disappearance of my companion. The latter had had no acquaintances on board, and was not missed in the course of the day. Towards evening I met the doctor again, and he asked me whether I had changed my mind. I told him I had not. "'Then you will before very long,' he said gravely. 3. We played whist in the evening, and I went to bed late. I will confess now that I felt a disagreeable sensation when I entered my stateroom. I could not help thinking of the tall man I had seen on the previous night, 
who was now dead, drowned, tossing about in the long swell, two or three hundred miles astern. His face rose very distinctly before me as I undressed, and I even went so far as to draw back the curtains of the upper berth, though as to persuade myself that he was actually gone. I also bolted the door of the stateroom. Suddenly I became aware that the porthole was open and fastened back. This was more than I could stand. I hastily threw on my dressing gown and went in search of Robert, the steward of my passage. I was very angry, I remember, and when I found him I dragged him roughly to the door of 105 and pushed him towards the open porthole. "'What the deuce do you mean, you scoundrel, by leaving that port open every night? Don't you know it is against the regulations? Don't you know that if the ship heeled and the water began to come in, ten men could not shut it? I will report you to the captain, you blackguard, for endangering the ship.' I was exceedingly wroth. The man trembled and turned pale, and then began to shut the round glass plate with the heavy brass fittings. "'Why don't you answer me?' I said roughly. "'If you please, sir,' faltered Robert, "'there's nobody on board as can keep this here port shut at night. You can try it yourself, sir. I ain't going to stop any longer on board of this vessel, sir, I ain't indeed. But if I was you, sir, I'd just clear out and go and sleep with a surgeon or something I would. Look here, sir. Is that fastened what you may call securely or not, sir? Try it, sir. See if it will move a hinch. I tried the port and found it perfectly tight. Well, sir, continued Robert triumphantly, I wage my reputation as an A-1 steward that in half an hour it'll be open again. Fastened back, too, sir. That's the horful thing. Fastened back. I examined the great screw and the loop nut that ran on it. If I find it open in the night, Robert, I will give you a sovereign. It is not possible. You may go. Sovereign, did you say, sir? Very good, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Pleasant repose, sir, and all manner of hinchant and dreams, sir. Robert scuttled away, delighted at being released. Of course, I thought he was trying to account for his negligence by a silly story, intended to frighten me, and I disbelieved him. The consequence was that he got his sovereign, and I spent a very peculiarly unpleasant night. I went to bed, and five minutes after I had rolled myself up in my blankets, the inexorable Robert extinguished the light that burned steadily behind the ground glass pane near the door. I lay quite still in the dark trying to go to sleep, but I soon found that impossible. It had been some satisfaction to be angry with the steward, and the diversion had banished that unpleasant sensation I had at first experienced when I thought of the drowned man who had been my chum. But I was no longer sleepy, and I lay awake for some time, occasionally glancing at the porthole, which I could just see from where I lay, and which in the darkness looked like a faintly luminous soup plate suspended in blackness. I believe I must have lain there for an hour, and, as I remember, I was just dozing into sleep when I was roused by a draught of cold air, and by distinctly feeling the spray of the sea blown upon my face. I started to my feet, and not having allowed in the dark for the motion of the ship, I was instantly thrown violently against the stateroom upon the couch which was placed beneath the porthole. I recovered myself immediately, however, and climbed upon my knees. The porthole was again wide open and fastened back. Now these things are facts. I was wide awake when I got up, and as I should certainly have been waked by the fall had I still been dozing. Moreover, I bruised my elbows and knees badly, and the bruises were there on the following morning to testify to the fact, if I myself had doubted it. The porthole was wide open and fastened back. A thing so unaccountable that I remember feeling very well astonishment rather than fear when I discovered it. I at once closed the plate again and screwed down the loop nut with all my strength. It was very dark in the stateroom. I reflected that the port had certainly been opened within an hour after Robert had it first shut it in my presence, and I determined to watch it and see whether it would open again. Those brass fittings are very heavy and by no means easy to move. I could not believe that the clump had been turned by the shaking of the screw. I stood peering out through the thick glass at the alternate white and gray streaks of the sea that foamed beneath the ship's side. I must have remained there a quarter of an hour. Suddenly, as I stood, I distinctly heard something moving behind me in one of the berths and a moment afterwards 
just as I turned instinctively to look. Though I could, of course, see nothing in the darkness, I heard a very faint groan. I sprang across the stateroom and tore the curtains of the upper berth aside, thrusting in my hands to discover if there were anyone there. There was someone. I remember that the sensation as I put my hands forward was as though I were plunging them into the air of a damp cellar, and from behind the curtain came a gust of wind that smelled horribly of stagnant seawater. I laid hold of something that had the shape of a man's arm, but was smooth and wet and icy cold. But suddenly as I pulled, the creature sprang violently forward against me, a clammy, oozy mass, as it seemed to me, heavy and wet, yet endowed with a sort of supernatural strength. I reeled across the stateroom, and an instant the door opened and the thing rushed out. I had not had time to be frightened, and quickly recovering myself, I sprang through the door and gave chase at the top of my speed, but I was too late. Ten yards before me I could see, I am sure I saw it, a dark shadow moving in the dimly lighted passage, quickly as the shadow of a fast horse thrown before a dog-cart by the lamp on a dark night. But in a moment it had disappeared, and I found myself holding on to the polished rail that ran along the bulkhead where the passage turned towards the companion. My hair stood on end, and the cold perspiration rolled down my face. I am not ashamed of it in the least. I was very badly frightened. Still, I doubted my senses, and pulled myself together. It was absurd, I thought. The Welsh rarebit I had eaten had disagreed with me. I had been in a nightmare. I made my way back to my stateroom, and entered it with an effort. The whole place smelled of stagnant seawater, as it had when I had waked on the previous evening. It required my utmost strength to go in and grope among my things for a box of wax lights. As I lighted a railway reading lantern, which I always carry in case I want to read after the lamps are out, I perceived that the porthole was again open, and a sort of creeping horror began to take possession of me, which I never felt before, nor wished to feel again. But I got a light and proceeded to examine the upper berth, expecting to find it drenched with sea water. But I was disappointed. The bed had been slept in, and the smell of the sea was strong, but the bedding was as dry as a bone. I fancied that Robert had not had the courage to make the bed after the accident of the previous night. It had all been a hideous dream. I drew the curtains back as far as I could and examined the piece very carefully. It was perfectly dry, but the porthole was open again, with a sort of dull bewilderment of horror. I closed it and screwed it down, and thrusting my heavy stick through the brass loop, wrenched it with all my might till the thick metal began to bend under the pressure. Then I hooked my reading lantern into the red velvet at the head of the couch, and sat down to recover my senses if I could. I sat there all night, unable to think of rest, hardly able to think at all. But the porthole remained closed, and I did not believe it would now open again without the application of a considerable force. The morning dawned at last, and I dressed myself slowly, thinking over all that had happened in the night. It was a beautiful day, and I went on deck, glad to get out in the early pure sunshine, and to smell the breeze from the blue water, so different from the noisome, stagnant odor from my stateroom. Instantly I turned aft, towards the surgeon's cabin. There he stood with a pipe in his mouth, taking his morning airing precisely as on the preceding day. "'Good morning,' said he quietly, but looking at me with evident curiosity. "'Doctor, you were quite right,' said I. "'There is something wrong about that place.' "'I thought you would change your mind,' he answered rather triumphantly. "'You have had a bad night, eh? Shall I make you a pick-me-up? I have a capital recipe.' "'No, thanks,' I cried, but I would like to tell you what happened.' I then tried to explain as clearly as possible precisely what had occurred, not omitting to state that I had been scared as I had never been scared in my whole life before. I dwelt particularly on the phenomenon of the porthole, which was a fact to which I could testify, even if the rest had been an illusion. 
I had closed it twice in the night, and the second time I had actually bent the brass in wrenching it with my stick. I believe I insisted a good deal on this point. "'You seem to think I am likely to doubt the story,' said the doctor, smiling at the detailed account of the state of the porthole. "'I do not doubt it in the least. I renew my invitation to you. Bring your traps here and take half my cabin.' "'Come and take half of mine for one night,' I said. "'Help me to get at the bottom of this thing.' "'You will get to the bottom of something else if you try,' answered the doctor. "'What?' I asked. "'The bottom of the sea. I am going to leave the ship. It is not canny.' "'Then you will not help me to find out? Not I,' said the doctor, quickly. "'It is my business to keep my wits about me, not to go fiddling about with ghosts and things.' "'Do you really believe it is a ghost?' I inquired, rather contemptuously. But as I spoke I remembered very well the horrible sensation of the supernatural which had got possession of me during the night. The doctor turned sharply on me. "'Have you any reasonable explanation of these things to offer?' he asked. "'No, you have not. Well, you say you will find an explanation. I say that you won't, sir, simply because there is not any.' "'But, my dear sir,' I retorted, "'do you, a man of science, mean to tell me that such things cannot be explained?' "'I do,' he answered stoutly, "'and if they could, I would not be concerned in the explanation.' I did not care to spend another night alone in the stateroom, and yet I was obstinately determined to get at the root of the disturbances. I do not believe there are many men who would have slept there alone after passing two such nights, but I made up my mind to try it if I could not get any one to share a watch with me. The doctor was evidently not inclined for such an experiment. He said he was a surgeon, and that in case any accident occurred on board he must always be in readiness. He could not afford to have his nerves unsettled. Perhaps he was quite right, but I am inclined to think that his precaution was prompted by his inclination. On inquiry he informed me that there was no one on board who would be likely to join me in my investigations, and after a little more conversation I left him. A little later I met the captain, and told him my story. I said that if no one would spend the night with me, I would ask leave to have the light burning all night, and would try it all alone. "'Look here,' said he. "'I will tell you what I will do. I will share your watch myself, and we will see what happens. It is my belief that we can find out between us. There may be some fellow skulking on board who steals a passage by frightening the passengers.' It is just possible that there may be something queer in the carpentering of that berth. I suggested taking the ship's carpenter below and examining the place, but I was overjoyed at the captain's offer to spend the night with me. He accordingly sent for the workman and ordered him to do anything I required. We went below at once. I had all the bedding cleared out of the upper berth, and we examined the place thoroughly to see if there was a board loose anywhere or a panel which could be opened or pushed aside. We tried the planks everywhere, tapped the flooring, unscrewed the fittings of the lower berth, and took it to pieces. In short, there was not a square inch of the stateroom which was not searched and tested. Everything was in perfect order, and we put everything back in its place. As we were finishing our work, Robert came to the door and looked in. "'Well, sir, find anything, sir?' he asked with a ghastly grin. "'You were right about the porthole, Robert,' I said, and I gave him the promised sovereign." The carpenter did his work silently and skillfully, following my directions. When he had done, he spoke. "'I'm a plain man, sir,' he said, "'but it's my belief you had better just turn out your things and let me run half a dozen four-inch screws through the door of this cabin. There's no good never came of this cabin yet, sir, and that's all about it. There's been four lives lost out here, to my own remembrance, and that in four trips. Better give it up, sir. Better give it up.' "'I will try it for one night more,' I said. "'Better give it up, sir, better give it up. "'It's a precious bad job,' repeated the workman, "'putting his tools in his bag and leaving the cabin. "'But my spirits had risen considerably "'at the prospect of having the captain's company, "'and I made up my mind not to be prevented "'from going to the end of the strange business. "'I abstained from Welsh rarebits and grog that evening "'and did not even join in the customary game of whist.' I wanted to be quite sure of my nerves, and my vanity made me anxious to make a good figure in the captain's eyes. 4. The captain was one of those splendidly tough and cheerful specimens of seafaring humanity whose combined courage, 
hardihood, and calmness in difficulty leads them naturally into high positions of trust. He was not the first man to be led away by an idle tale, and the mere fact that he was willing to join me in the investigation was proof that he thought that there was something seriously wrong, which could not be accounted for on ordinary theories, nor laughed down as a common superstition. To some extent, too, his reputation was at stake, as well as the reputation of the ship. It is no light thing to lose passengers overboard, and he knew it. About ten o'clock that evening, as I was smoking a last cigar, he came up to me and drew me aside from the beat of the other passengers who were patrolling the deck in the warm darkness. "'This is a serious matter, Mr. Brisbane,' he said. "'We must make up our minds either way, to be disappointed or to have a pretty rough time of it. You see, I cannot afford to laugh at the affair, and I will ask you to sign your name to a statement of whatever occurs. If nothing happens tonight, we will try it again tomorrow and next day. Are you ready?' So we went below and entered the stateroom. As we went in, I could see Robert the steward, who stood a little further down the passage, watching us with his usual grin, as though certain that something dreadful was about to happen. The captain closed the door behind us and bolted it. "'Supposing we put your portmanteau before the door,' he suggested. "'One of us can sit on it. Nothing can get out then. Is the port screwed down?' I found as I had left it in the morning, indeed without using a lever as I had done. No one could have opened it. I drew back the curtains of the upper berth so that I could see well into it. By the captain's advice I lighted my reading lantern, and placed it so that it shone upon the white sheets above. He insisted upon sitting on the portmanteau, declaring that he wished to be able to swear that he had sat before the door. Then he requested me to search the stateroom thoroughly. An operation very soon accomplished, as it consisted merely in looking beneath the lower berth and under the couch below the porthole. The spaces were quite empty. "'It is impossible for any human being to get in,' I said, "'or for any human being to open the port.' "'Very good,' said the captain calmly. "'If we see anything now, it must be either imagination or something supernatural.' I sat down on the lower edge of the berth. "'The first time it happened,' said the captain, crossing his legs and leaning back against the door, "'was in March.' The passenger who slept here, in the upper berth, turned out to have been a lunatic. At all events, he was known to have been a little touched, and he had taken his passage without the knowledge of his friends. He rushed out in the middle of the night and threw himself overboard, before the officer who had the watch could stop him. We stopped and lowered a boat. It was a quiet night, just before that heavy weather came on, but we could not find him. Of course his suicide was afterwards accounted for on the grounds of his insanity. "'I suppose that often happens,' I remarked, rather absently. "'Not often, no,' said the captain. "'Never before in my experience, though I have heard of it happening on board of other ships. "'Well, as I was saying, that occurred in March. "'On the very next trip—' "'What are you looking at?' he asked me, stopping suddenly in his narration. "'I believe I gave no answer. "'My eyes were riveted upon the porthole.' It seemed to me that the brass loop nut was very beginning to slowly turn upon the screw, so slowly, however, that I was not sure it moved at all. I watched it intently, fixing its position in my mind, and trying to ascertain whether it changed. Seeing where I was looking, the captain looked too. "'It moves!' he exclaimed, in a tone of conviction. "'No, it does not,' he added after a minute. If it were the jarring of the screw, said I, it would have opened during the day, but I found it this evening jammed tight as it left it this morning. I rose and tried the nut. It was certainly loosened, for by an effort I could move it with my hands. The queer thing, said the captain, is that the second man who was lost is supposed to have got through that very port. We had a terrible time over it. It was in the middle of the night, and the weather was very heavy. There was an alarm that one of the ports was open and the sea running in. I came below and found everything flooded, the water pouring in every time she rolled, and the whole port swinging from the top bolts, not the porthole in the middle. Well, we managed to shut it, but the water did some damage. Ever since that, the place smells of seawater from time to time. We suppose the passenger had thrown himself out, though the Lord only knows how he did it. The steward kept telling me that he could not keep anything shut here. Upon my word! "'I can smell it now, cannot you?' he inquired, sniffing the air suspiciously. "'Yes,' 
distinctly i said and i shuddered as that same odor of stagnant sea water grew stronger in the cabin now to smell like this the place must be damp i continued and yet when i examined it with the carpenter this morning everything was perfectly dry it is most extraordinary hello my reading lantern which had been placed in the upper berth was suddenly extinguished there was still a good deal of light from the pane of ground glass near the door behind which loomed the regulation lamp the ship rolled heavily and the curtain of the upper berth swung far out into the stateroom and back again i rose quickly from my seat on the edge of the bed and the captain at the same moment started to his feet with a loud cry of surprise i had turned with the intention of taking down the lantern to examine it when i heard his exclamation and immediately afterwards his call for help i sprang towards him he was wrestling with all his might with the brass loop of the port it seemed to turn against his hands in spite of all his efforts i caught up my cane a heavy oak stick i always used to carry and thrust it through the ring and bore on it with all my strength but the strong wood snapped suddenly and i fell upon the couch when i rose again the port was wide open and the captain was standing with his back against the door pale to the lips there is something in that berth he cried in a strange voice his eyes almost starting from his head hold the door while i look it shall not escape us whatever it is but instead of taking his place i sprang upon the lower bed and seized something which lay in the upper berth it was something ghostly horrible beyond words and it moved in my grip it was like the body of a man long drowned and yet it moved and had the strength of ten men living but i gripped it with all my might the slippery oozy horrible thing the dead white eyes seemed to stare at me out of the dusk the putrid odor of rank sea water was about it and its shiny hair hung in foul wet curls over its dead face i wrestled with the dead thing it thrust itself upon me and forced me back and nearly broke my arms it wound its corpse's arms about my neck the living death and overpowered me so that i at last cried aloud and fell and left my hold as i fell the thing sprang across me and seemed to throw itself upon the captain when i last saw him on his feet his face was white and his lips set it seemed to me that he struck a violent blow at the dead being and then he too fell forward upon his face with an inarticulate cry of horror the thing paused an instant seeming to hover over his prostrate body and i could have screamed again for very fright but i had no voice left the thing vanished suddenly and it seemed to my disturbed senses that it made its exit through the open port though how that was possible considering the smallness of the aperture is more than any one can tell i lay a long time upon the floor and the captain lay beside me at last i partially recovered my senses and moved and i instantly knew that my arm was broken the small bone of the left forearm near the wrist i got upon my feet somehow and with my remaining hand i tried to raise the captain he groaned and moved and at last came to himself he was not hurt but he seemed badly stunned well do you want to hear any more there is nothing more that is the end of my story the carpenter carried out his scheme of running half a dozen four-inch screws through the door of 105 and if ever you take a passage in the camp shotka you may ask for a berth in that stateroom you will be told it is engaged yes it is engaged by that dead thing i finished the trip in the surgeon's cabin he doctored my broken arm and advised me not to fiddle about with ghosts and things any more the captain was very silent and never sailed again in that ship though it is still running and i will not sail in her either it was a very disagreeable experience and i was very badly frightened which is a thing i do not like that is all that is how i saw a ghost if it was a ghost it was dead anyhow end of the upper berth by francis marion crawford the 
the squaw by bram stoker this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jeff chestnut the squaw by bram stoker nurnberg at the time was not so much exploited as it has been since then Irving had not been playing Faust, and the very name of the old town was hardly known to the great bulk of the traveling public. My wife and I, being in the second week of our honeymoon, naturally wanted someone else to join our party, so that when the cheery stranger, Elias P. Hutchison, hailing from Isthmian City, Bleeding Gulch, Maple Tree County, Nebraska, turned up at the station in Frankfurt, and casually remarked that he was going on to see the most all-fired old Methuselah of a town in Europe, and that he guessed that so much traveling alone was enough to send an intelligent, active citizen into the melancholy ward of a daft house, we took the pretty broad hint and suggested that we should join forces. We found, on comparing notes afterwards, that we had each intended to speak with some diffidence or hesitation, so as not to appear too eager, such not being a good compliment to the success of our married life. But the effect was entirely marred by our both beginning to speak at the same instant, stopping simultaneously, and then going on together again. Anyhow, no matter how, it was done, and Elias P. Hutchison became one of our party. Straightway, Amelia and I found the pleasant benefit. Instead of quarreling as we had been doing, we found that the restraining influence of a third party was such that we now took every opportunity of spooning in odd corners. Amelia declares that ever since she has, as the result of that experience, advised all her friends to take a friend on the honeymoon. Well, we did Nuremberg together, and much enjoyed the racy remarks of our transatlantic friend, who, from his quaint speech and his wonderful stock of adventures, might have stepped out of a novel. We kept for the last object of interest in the city to be visited the Burg, and on the day appointed for the visit, strolled round the outer wall of the city by the eastern side. The Burg is seated on a rock dominating the town, and an immensely deep fosse guards it on the northern side. Nuremberg has been happy in that it was never sacked. Had it been, it would certainly not be so spick and span perfect as it is at present. The ditch has not been used for centuries, and now its base is spread with tea gardens and orchards, of which some of the trees are of quite respectable growth. As we wandered round the wall, dawdling in the hot July sunshine, we often paused to admire the views spread before us, and in especial the great plain covered with towns and villages and bounded with a blue line of hills, like a landscape of Claude Lorraine. From this we always turn with new delight to the city itself, with its myriad of quaint old gables and acre-wide red roofs dotted with dormer windows, tier upon tier. A little to our right rose the towers of the burg, and nearer still, standing grim the torture tower which was and is perhaps the most interesting place in the city for centuries the tradition of the iron virgin of nuremberg has been handed down as an instance of the horrors of cruelty of which man is capable we had long looked forward to seeing it and here at last was its home in one of our pauses we leaned over the wall of the moat and looked down the garden seemed quite fifty or sixty feet below us, and the sun pouring into it with an intense, moveless heat like that of an oven. Beyond rose the gray, grim wall, seemingly of endless height, and losing itself right and left in the angles of bastion and counterscarp. Trees and bushes crowned the wall, and above again towered the lofty houses on whose massive beauty time has only set the hand of approval. The sun was hot and we were lazy. Time was our own, and we lingered, leaning on the wall. 
Just below us was a pretty sight. A great black cat lying stretched in the sun, whilst round her gambled prettily a tiny black kitten. The mother would wave her tail for the kitten to play with, or would raise her feet and push away the little one as an encouragement to further play. They were just at the foot of the wall, and Elias P. Hutchison, in order to help the play, stooped and took from the walk a moderate-sized pebble. See, he said, I will drop it near the kitten, and they will both wonder where it came from. Oh, be careful, said my wife. You might hit the dear little thing. Not me, ma'am, said Elias P. Why, I'm as tender as a main cherry tree, Lord bless ye. I wouldn't hurt the poor pooty little critter more than I'd scalp a baby, and you may bet your variegated socks on that. See, I'll drop it fur away on the outside so's not to go near her. Thus saying, he leaned over and held his arm out at full length and dropped the stone. It may be that there is some attractive force which draws lesser matters to greater, or more probably that the wall was not plumb but sloped to its base, we not noticing the inclination from above. But the stone fell with a sickening thud that came up to us through the hot air right on the kitten's head and shattered out its little brains then and there. The black cat cast a swift upward glance, and we saw her eyes like green fire fixed an instant on Elias P. Hutchison, and then her attention was given to the kitten, which lay still with just a quiver of her tiny limbs, whilst a thin red stream trickled from a gaping wound. With a muffled cry such as a human being might give, she bent over the kitten, licking its wounds and moaning. Suddenly she seemed to realize that it was dead, and again threw her eyes up at us. I shall never forget the sight, for she looked the perfect incarnation of hate. Her green eyes blazed with lurid fire, and the white, sharp teeth seemed to almost shine through the blood which dabbled her mouth and whiskers. She gnashed her teeth, and her claws stood out stark and at full length on every paw. Then she made a wild rush up the wall as if to reach us, but when the momentum ended fell back, and further added to her horrible appearance, for she fell on the kitten, and rose with her black fur smeared with its brains and blood. Amelia turned quite faint, and I had to lift her back from the wall. There was a seat close by, in shade of a spreading plane tree, and here I placed her while she composed herself. Then I went back to Hutchison, who stood without moving, looking down at the angry cat below. As I joined him, he said, Well, I guess that air the savagest beast I ever see, except once when an Apache squaw had an edge on a half-breed, what they nicknamed Splinters, cause of the way he fixed up her papoose, which he stole on a raid just to show that he appreciated the way they had given his mother the fire torture, she got that kinder look so set on her face that it just seemed to grow there. She followed Splinters more than three years till at last the Braves got him and handed him over to her. They did say that no man, white or Injun, had ever been so long a dying under the tortures of the Apaches. The only time I ever seen her smile was when I wiped her out. I came on the camp just in time to see Splinters pass in his checks, and he wasn't sorry to go, either. He was a hard citizen, and though I can never shake with him after that papoose business, for it was bitter bad and he should have been a white man, for he looked like one, I see he had got paid out in full. Durn me, but I took a piece of his hide from one of his skinning posts and had it made into a pocketbook. It's here now. And he slapped the breast pocket of his coat. Whilst he was speaking, the cat was continuing her frantic efforts to get up the wall. She would take a run back and then charge up, sometimes reaching an incredible height. She did not seem to mind the heavy fall which she got each time, but started with renewed vigor, and at every tumble her appearance became more horrible. Hutchison was a kind-hearted man. My wife and I had both noticed little acts of kindness to animals as well as to persons, 
and he seemed concerned at the state of fury to which the cat had wrought herself. "'Wall, now,' he said, "'I do declare that that poor critter seems quite desperate. "'There, there, poor thing, it was all an accident, "'though that won't bring back your little one to you. "'Say, I wouldn't have had such a thing happen for a thousand. "'Just shows what a clumsy old fool of a man can do when he tries to play.' Seems I'm too darn slipper-handed to even play with a cat. Say, Colonel, it was a pleasant way he had to bestow titles freely. I hope your wife doesn't hold no grudge against me on account of this unpleasantness. Why, I wouldn't have had it occur on no account. He came over to Amelia, and apologized profusely, and she, with her usual kindness of heart, hastened to assure him that she quite understood that it was an accident. Then we all went again to the wall and looked over. The cat, missing Hutchison's face, had drawn back across the moat, and was sitting on her haunches as though ready to spring. Indeed, the very instant she saw him she did spring, and with a blind, unreasoning fury which would have been grotesque, only that it was so frightfully real. She did not try to run up the wall, but simply launched herself at him, as though hate and fury could lend her wings to pass straight through the great distance between them. Amelia, womanlike, got quite concerned and said to Elias P. in a warning voice, Oh, you must be very careful. That animal would try to kill you if she were here. Her eyes look like positive murder. He laughed out jovially. Excuse me, ma'am, he said but I can't help laughing. Fancy a man that has fought grizzlies and injuns being careful of being murdered by a cat. When the cat heard him laugh, her whole demeanor seemed to change. She no longer tried to jump or run up the wall, but went quietly over and sitting again beside the dead kitten, began to lick and fondle it as though it were alive. See, said I, the effect of a really strong man. Even that animal in the midst of her fury recognizes the voice of a master and bows to him. Like a squaw, was the only comment of Elias P. Hutchison as we moved on our way round the city fosse. Every now and then we looked over the wall and each time saw the cat following us. At first she had kept going back to her dead kitten, and then as the distance grew greater, took it in her mouth and so followed. After a while, however, she abandoned this, for we saw her following all alone. She had evidently hidden the body somewhere. Amelia's alarm grew at the cat's persistence, and more than once she repeated her warning, but the American always laughed with amusement, till finally, seeing that she was beginning to be worried, he said, I say, ma'am, you needn't be scared over that cat. I go healed, I do. Here he slapped his pistol pocket at the back of his lumbar region. Why, sooner than have you worried, I'll shoot the critter right here and risk the police interfering with a citizen of the United States for carrying arms contrary to regulations. As he spoke, he looked over the wall, but the cat on seeing him retreated with a growl into a bed of tall flowers and was hidden. He went on. Blessed if that critter ain't got more sense of what's good for her than most Christians. I guess we've seen the last of her. You bet she'll go back now to that busted kitten and have a private funeral of it all to herself. Amelia did not like to say more, lest he might, in mistaken kindness to her, fulfill his threat of shooting the cat. And so we went on and crossed the little wooden bridge leading to the gateway which ran the steep paved roadway between the berg and the pentagonal torture tower. As we crossed the bridge, we saw the cat again down below us. When she saw us, her fury seemed to return, and she made frantic efforts to get up the steep wall. Hutchison laughed as he looked down at her and said, Goodbye, old girl. Sorry I injured your feelings, but you'll get over it in time. So long and then we passed through the long, dim archway, and came to the gate of the burg. When we came out again after our survey of this most beautiful old place, 
which not even the well-intentioned efforts of the Gothic restorers of forty years ago have been able to spoil, though their restoration was then glaring white, we seem to have quite forgotten the unpleasant episode of the morning. The old lime tree with its great trunk gnarled with the passing of nearly nine centuries, the deep well cut through the heart of the rock by those captives of old, and the lovely view from the city wall whence we heard, spread over almost a full quarter of an hour, the multitudinous chimes of the city had all helped to wipe out from our minds the incident of the slain kitten. We were the only visitors who had entered the torture tower that morning, so at least said the old custodian and as we had the place all to ourselves, we were able to make a minute and more satisfactory survey than would have otherwise been possible. The custodian, looking to us as the sole source of his gains for the day, was willing to meet our wishes in any way. The torture tower is truly a grim place, even now when many thousands of visitors have sent a stream of life, and the joys that follow life, into the place. But at the time I mention, it wore its grimmest and most gruesome aspect. The dust of ages seemed to have settled on it, and the darkness and the horror of its memory seemed to have become sentient in a way that would have satisfied the pantheistic souls of Philo or Spinoza. The lower chamber, where we entered, was seemingly, in its normal state, filled with incarnate darkness. Even the hot sunlight streaming in through the door seemed to be lost in the vast thickness of the walls, and only showed the masonry rough as when the builder's scaffolding had come down, but coated with dust and marked here and there with patches of dark stain which, if walls could speak, could have given their own dread memories of fear and pain. We were glad to pass up the dusty wooden staircase the custodian leaving the outer door open to light us somewhat on our way, for to our eyes the one long-wicked, evil-smelling candle stuck in a sconce on the wall gave an inadequate light. When we came up through the open trap in the corner of the chamber overhead, Amelia held on to me so tightly that I could actually feel her heart beat. I must say, for my own part, that I was not surprised at her fear for this room was even more gruesome than that below. Here there was certainly more light, but only just sufficient to realize the horrible surroundings of the place. The builders of the tower had evidently intended that only they who should gain the top should have any of the joys of light and prospect. There, as we had noticed from below, were ranges of windows, albeit of medieval smallness, but elsewhere in the tower were only a very few narrow slits, such as were habitual in places of medieval defense. A few of these only lit the chamber, and these so high up in the wall that from no part could the sky be seen through the thickness of the walls. In racks and leaning in disorder against the walls were a number of headsmen's swords, great double-handed weapons with broad blade and keen edge. Hard by were several blocks where on the necks of victims had lain, with here and there deep notches where the steel had bitten through the guard of flesh and shored into the wood. Round the chamber, placed in all sorts of irregular ways, were many implements of torture which made one's heart ache to see. Chairs full of spikes which gave instant and excruciating pain. Chairs and couches with dull knobs whose torture was seemingly less, but which, though slower, were equally efficacious. Racks, belts, boots, gloves, collars, all made for compressing at will. Steel baskets in which the head could be slowly crushed into a pulp if necessary. Watchman's hooks with long handle and knife that cut at resistance. This is a specialty of the old Nuremberg police system and many, many other devices for man's injury to man. Amelia grew quite pale with the horror of the things, but fortunately did not faint, for being a little overcome she sat down on a torture chair, but jumped up again with a shriek, all tendency to faint gone. We both pretended that it was the injury done to her dress by the dust of the chair and the rusty spikes which had upset her, 
and Mr. Hutchison acquiesced in accepting the explanation with a kind-hearted laugh. But the central object of the whole of this chamber of horrors was the engine known as the Iron Virgin, which stood near the center of the room. It was a rudely shaped figure of a woman, something of the bell order, or, to make a closer comparison, of the figure of Mrs. Noah in the children's ark, but without that slimness of waist and perfect rondure of hip which marks the aesthetic type of the Noah family. One would hardly have recognized it as intended for a human figure at all, had not the founder shaped on the forehead a rude semblance of a woman's face. This machine was coated with rust without, and covered with dust. A rope was fastened to a ring in the front of the figure, about where the waist should have been, and was drawn through a pulley, fastened on the wooden pillar which sustained the flooring above. The custodian, pulling this rope, showed that a section of the front was hinged like a door at one side. We then saw that the engine was of considerable thickness, leaving just room enough inside for a man to be placed. The door was of equal thickness and of great weight, for it took the custodian all his strength, aided though he was by the contrivance of the pulley, to open it. This weight was partly due to the fact that the door was of manifest purpose hung so as to throw its weight downwards so that it might shut of its own accord when the strain was released. The inside was honeycombed with rust. Nay, more, the rust alone that comes through time would hardly have eaten so deep into the iron walls. The rust of the cruel stains was deep indeed. It was only, however, when we came to look at the inside of the door that the diabolical intention was manifest to the full. Here were several long spikes, square and massive, broad at the base and sharp at the points, placed in such a position that when the door should close the upper ones would pierce the eyes of the victim and the lower ones his heart and vitals. The sight was too much for poor Amelia, and this time she fainted dead off, and I had to carry her down the stairs and place her on a bench outside till she recovered. That she felt it to the quick was afterwards shown by the fact that my eldest son bears to this day a rude birthmark on his breast, which has, by family consent, been accepted as representing the Nuremberg Virgin. When we got back to the chamber, we found Hutchison still opposite the Iron Virgin. He had been evidently philosophizing, and now gave us the benefit of his thought in the shape of a sort of exordium. Well, I guess I've been learning something here while the madam has been getting over her faint. Pears to me that we're a long way behind the times on our side of the big drink. We used to think out on the plains that the engine could give us points in trying to make a man uncomfortable, but I guess your old medieval law and order party could raise him every time. Splinters was pretty good in his bluff on the squaw, but this here young miss held a straight flush all high on him. The points of them spikes air sharp enough still, though even the edges air eaten out by what used to be on em. It'd be a good thing for our Indian section to get some specimens of this here play toy to send round to the reservations, just to knock the stuffin' out of the bucks and the squaws too, by showing them as how old civilization lays over them at their best. Yes, but I'll get in that box a minute just to see how it feels. Oh, no, no! said Amelia. It's too terrible. Yes, ma'am, nothing's too terrible to the exploring mind. I've been in some queer places in my time. Spent a night inside a dead horse while a prairie fire swept over me in Montana territory, and another time slept inside a dead buffler when the Comanches was on the warpath and I didn't care to leave my kyard on them. I've been two days in a caved-in tunnel in the Billy Bronco gold mine in New Mexico, and was one of the four shut up for three parts of a day in the caisson what slid over on her side when we was settin' the foundations of the Buffalo Bridge. I've not funked an odd experience yet, and I don't propose to begin now. We saw that he was set on the experiment, so I said, Well, hurry up, old man, and get through it quick. 
All right, General, said he. But I calculate we ain't quite ready yet. The gentlemen, my predecessors, what stood in that thar canister, didn't volunteer for the office, not much. And I guess there was some ornamental tying up before the big stroke was made. I want to go into this thing fair and square, so I must get fixed up proper first. I dare say this old galoot can rise some string and tie me up according to sample. This was said interrogatively to the old custodian, but the latter, who understood the drift of his speech, though perhaps not appreciating to the full the niceties of dialect and imagery, shook his head. His protest was, however, only formal and made to be overcome. The American thrust a gold piece into his hand, saying, Take it, pard, it's your pot, and don't be scared. This ain't no necktie party that you're asked to assist in. He produced some thin, frayed rope, and proceeded to bind our companion with sufficient strictness for the purpose. When the upper part of his body was bound, Hutchison said, Hold on a minute, Judge. Guess I'm too heavy for you to tote into the canister. You just let me walk in, and then you can wash up regarding my legs. Whilst speaking, he had backed himself into the opening, which was just enough to hold him. It was a close fit, and no mistake. Amelia looked on with fear in her eyes, but she evidently did not like to say anything. Then the custodian completed his task by tying the American's feet together, so that he was now absolutely helpless and fixed in his voluntary prison. He seemed to really enjoy it, and the incipient smile which was habitual to his face blossomed into actuality as he said, Yes, this here Eve was made out of the rib of a dwarf. There ain't much room for a full-grown citizen of the United States to hustle. We used to make our coffins more roomier in Idaho territory. Now, Judge, you just begin to let this door down slow onto me. I want to feel the same pleasure as those other jays had when those spikes began to move toward their eyes. Oh, no, 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 broke in Amelia hysterically. It is too terrible. I can't bear to see it. I can't, I can't. But the American was obdurate. Say, Colonel, said he, why not take Madame for a little promenade? I wouldn't hurt her feelings for the world, but now that I am here, having come eight thousand miles, wouldn't it be too hard to give up the very experience I've been pining and pantin' for? A man can't get to feel like canned goods every time. Me and the judge here'll fix up this thing in no time, and then you'll come back and we'll all laugh together. Once more the resolution that is born of curiosity triumphed and Amelia stayed holding tight to my arm and shivering whilst the custodian began to slacken slowly, inch by inch, the rope that held back the iron door. Hutchison's face was positively radiant as his eyes followed the first movement of the spikes. Wall, he said, I guess I've not had enjoyment like this since I left New York. Bar a scrap with a French sailor at Wapping, and that warn't much of a picnic neither, I've not had a show for pleasure in this dod-rotted continent where there ain't no bars nor no engines and where nary a man goes healed. Slow there, Judge. Don't you rush this business. I want to show for my money this game, I do. The custodian must have had in him some of the blood of his predecessors in that ghastly tower, for he worked the engine with a deliberate and excruciating slowness, which after five minutes in which the outer edge of the door had not moved half as many inches, began to overcome Amelia. I saw her lips whiten and felt her hold upon my arm relax. I looked around an instant for a place whereon to lay her, and when I looked at her again found that her eye had become fixed on the side of the Virgin. Following its direction, I saw the black cat crouching out of sight. Her green eyes shone like danger lamps in the gloom of the place, and their color was heightened by the blood which still smeared her coat and reddened her mouth. I cried out, The cat! Look out for the cat! For even then she sprang out before the engine. At this moment she looked like a triumphant demon. Her eyes blazed with ferocity, her hair bristled out till she seemed twice her normal size, 
and her tail lashed about as does a tiger's when the quarry is before it. Elias P. Hutchison, when he saw her, was amused, and his eyes positively sparkled with fun as he said, "'Darned if the squaw hain't got on all her war paint. Just give her a shove off if she comes any of her tricks on me, for I'm so fixed everlastingly by the boss that dern my skin if I can keep my eyes from her if she wants them. Easy there, Judge. Don't you slack that air rope, or I'm euchred. At that moment, Amelia completed her feint, and I had to clutch hold of her round the waist or she would have fallen to the floor. Whilst attending to her, I saw the black cat crouching for a spring and jumped up to turn the creature out. But at that instant, with a sort of hellish scream, she hurled herself, not, as we expected at Hutchison, but straight at the face of the custodian. Her claws seemed to be tarried wildly as one sees in the Chinese drawings of the dragon rampant, and as I looked, I saw one of them light on the poor man's eye and actually tear through it and down his cheek, leaving a wide band of red where the blood seemed to spurt from every vein. With a yell of sheer terror which came quicker than even his sense of pain, the man leaped back, dropping as he did so the rope which held back the iron door. I jumped for it, but it was too late, for the cord ran like lightning through the pulley block, and the heavy mass fell forward from its own weight. As the door closed, I caught a glimpse of our poor companion's face. He seemed frozen with terror. His eyes stared with a horrible anguish, as if dazed, and no sound came from his lips. And then the spikes did their work. Happily, the end was quick, for when I wrenched open the door, they had pierced so deep that they had locked in the bones of the skull through which they had crushed and actually tore him, it, out of his iron prison till, bound as he was, he fell at full length with a sickly thud upon the floor, the face turning upward as he fell. I rushed to my wife lifted her up and carried her out, for I feared for her very reason if she should wake from her faint to such a scene. I laid her on the bench outside and ran back. Leaning against the wooden column was the custodian, moaning in pain, whilst he held his reddening handkerchief to his eyes. And sitting on the head of the poor American was the cat, purring loudly as she licked the blood which trickled through the gash socket of his eyes. I think no one will call me cruel because I seized one of the old executioner's swords and shore her in two as she sat. End of the Squaw Transition by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Craster. Transition by Algernon Blackwood. John Mudbury was on his way home from the shops, his arms full of Christmas presents. It was after six o'clock, and the streets were very crowded. He was an ordinary man, lived in an ordinary suburban flat, with an ordinary wife and ordinary children. He did not think them ordinary, but everybody else did. He had ordinary presents for each one, a cheap blotter for his wife, a cheap air gun for the boy, and so forth. He was over fifty, bald, in an office, decent in mind and habits, of uncertain opinions, uncertain politics, and uncertain religion. Yet he considered himself a decided positive gentleman, quite unaware that the morning newspaper determined his opinions for the day. He just lived, from day to day. Physically he was fit enough, except for a weak heart, which never troubled him, and his summer holiday was bad golf, while the children bathed and his wife read Garvice on the sands. Like the majority of men, he dreamed idly of the past, muddled away the present, and guessed vaguely after imaginative reading on occasion at the future. "'I'd like to survive all right,' he said, "'provided it's better than this. 
surveying his wife and children, and thinking of his daily toil. Otherwise, and he shrugged his shoulders, as a brave man should. He went to church regularly, but nothing in church convinced him that he did survive, just as nothing in church enticed him into hoping that he would. On the other hand, nothing in life persuaded him that he didn't, wouldn't, couldn't. I am an evolutionist, he loved to say to thoughtful cronies, over a glass, having never heard that Darwinism had been questioned. And so he came home gaily, happily with his bunch of Christmas presents, for the wife and little ones, stroking himself upon their keen enjoyment and excitement. The night before he had taken the wife to see magic at a select London theatre, where the intellectuals went, and had been extraordinarily stirred. He had gone questioningly, yet expected something out of the common. It's not musical, he warned her, nor farce, nor comedy, so to speak. And in answer to her question as to what the critics had said, he had wriggled, sighed, and put his gaudy necktie straight four times in quick succession. For no man in the street, with any claim to self-respect, could be expected to understand what the critics had said, even if he understood the play. And John had answered truthfully, Oh, they just said things. But the theatre's always full, and that's the only test. And just now, as he crossed the crowded circus to catch his bus, it chanced that his mind, having glimpsed an advertisement, was full of this particular play, or rather of the effect it had produced upon him at the time. For it had thrilled him, inexplicably, with its marvellous speculative hint, its big audacity, its alert and spiritual beauty. Thought plunged to find something. Plunged after this bizarre suggestion of a bigger universe, after this quasi-jocular suggestion that man is not the only, then dashed full tilt against a sentence that memory thrust beneath his nose. Science does not exhaust the universe, and at the same time dashed full tilt against destruction of another kind as well. How it happened he never exactly knew. He saw a monster glaring at him with eyes of blazing fire. It was horrible. It rushed upon him. He dodged. Another monster met him round the corner. Both came at him simultaneously. He dodged again. A leap that might have cleared a hurdle easily, but was too late. Between the pair of them, his heart literally in his gullet, he was mercilessly caught. Bones crunched. There was a soft sensation, icy cold and hot as fire. Horns and voices roared. Battering rams he saw, and a carapace of iron. Then dazzling light. Always face the traffic he remembered with a frantic yell, and, by some extraordinary luck, escaped miraculously onto the opposite pavement. There was no doubt about it. By the skin of his teeth he had dodged a rather ugly death. First, he felt for his presence. All was safe. And then, instead of congratulating himself and taking breath, he hurried homewards, on foot, which proved that his mind had lost control a bit thinking only how disappointed the wife and children would have been if, well, if anything had happened. Another thing he realized, oddly enough, was that he no longer really loved his wife, but had only great affection for her. What made him think of that, heaven only knows, but he did think of it. He was an honest man without pretense. This came as a discovery somehow. He turned a moment, and saw the crowd gathered about the entangled taxicabs, policemen's helmets gleaming in the lights of the shop windows, then hurried on again, his thoughts full of the joy his presence would give, of the scampering children, and of his wife, bless her silly heart, eyeing the mysterious parcels. And though he could never explain how, he presently stood at the door of the jail-like building that contained his flat, having walked the whole three miles. His thoughts had been so busy and absorbed that he had hardly noticed the length of a weary trudge. Besides, he reflected, thinking of the narrow escape, 
I've had a nasty shock. It was a damned near thing, now I come to think of it. He still felt a bit shaky and bewildered. Yet, at the same time, he felt extraordinarily jolly and light-hearted. He counted his Christmas parcels, hugged himself in anticipatory joy, and let himself in swiftly with his latch-key. I'm late, he realized. But when she sees the brown paper parcels, she'll forget to say a word. God bless the old faithful soul. And he softly used the key a second time and entered his flat on tiptoe. In his mind was the master impulse of that afternoon, the pleasure these Christmas presents would give his wife and children. He heard a noise. He hung up hat and coat in the pokey vestibule. They never called it hall, and moved softly towards the parlour door, holding the packages behind him. Only of them, he thought, not of himself. Of his family, that is, not of the packages. Pushing the door cunningly ajar, he peeped in shyly. To his amazement, the room was full of people. He withdrew quickly, wondering what it meant. A party? And without his knowing about it? Extraordinary! Keen disappointment came over him. But as he stepped back, the vestibule he saw was full of people too. He was uncommonly surprised, yet somehow not surprised at all. People were congratulating him. There was a perfect mob of them. Moreover, he knew them all, vaguely remembered them at least, and they all knew him. Isn't it a game? laughed someone, patting him on the back. They haven't the least idea. And the speaker? It was old John Palmer, the bookkeeper at the office, emphasized the they. Not the least idea, he answered with a smile, saying something he didn't understand, yet knew was right. His face apparently showed the utter bewilderment he felt. The shock of the collision had been greater than he realized evidently. His mind was wandering. Possibly. Only the odd thing was, he had never felt so clear-headed in his life. Ten thousand things grew simple suddenly. But how thickly these people pressed about him! And how familiarly! My parcels, he said joyously pushing his way across the throng. These are Christmas presents. I bought for them. He nodded toward the room. I've saved for weeks, stopped cigars and billiards and several other good things to buy them. Good man, said Palmer, with a happy laugh. It's the heart that counts. Mudbury looked at him. Palmer had said an amazing truth. Only, people would hardly understand and believe him, would they? Eh? he asked, feeling stuffed and stupid, muddied somewhere between two meanings, one of which was gorgeous and the other stupid beyond belief. If you please, Mr. Mudbury, step inside. They are expecting you, said a kindly pompous voice, and turning sharply he met the gentle foolish eyes of Sir James Epiphany, director of the bank where he worked. The effect of the voice was instantaneous from long habit. They are, he smiled from his heart and advanced as from the custom of many years. Oh, how happy and gay he felt! His affection for his wife was real. Romance indeed had gone, but he needed her, and she needed him. And the children, Millie, Bill, and Jean, he deeply loved them. Life was worth living indeed. In the room was a crowd, but an astounding silence. John Mudbury looked round him. He advanced towards his wife, who sat in the corner armchair with Millie on her knee. A lot of people talked and moved about. Momentarily the crowd increased. He stood in front of them, in front of Millie and his wife, and he spoke, holding out his packages. It's Christmas Eve, he whispered shyly, and I've brought you something, something for everybody. Look. He held the packages before their eyes. Of course, of course, said a voice behind him. But you may hold them out like that for a century. They'll never see them. Of course they won't. But I love to do the old sweet thing, replied John Mudbury. Then wondered with a gasp of stark amazement why he said it. I think, whispered Millie, staring around her. Well, what do you think? Her mother asked sharply. 
you're always thinking something queer. I think, the girl continued dreamily, that Daddy's already here. She paused, then added with a child's impossible conviction, I'm sure he is. I feel him. There was an extraordinary laugh. Sir James Epiphany laughed. The others, the whole crowd of them, also turned their heads and smiled. But the mother, thrusting the child away from her, rose up suddenly with a violent start. Her face had turned to chalk. She stretched her arms out into the air before her. She gasped and shivered. There was anguish in her eyes. Look, repeated John, these are the presents that I brought. But his voice apparently was soundless, and with a spasm of icy pain, he remembered that Palmer and Sir James some years ago had died. It's magic, he cried. But I love you, Ginny. I love you, and and I have always been true to you, as true as steel. We need each other. Oh, can't you see? We go on together, you and I, forever and ever. Think, interrupted an exquisitely tender voice. Don't shout. They can't hear you now. And turning, John Mudbury met the eyes of Everard Minturn, their president of the year before. Minturn had gone down with the Titanic. He dropped his parcels then. His heart gave an enormous leap of joy. He saw her face, the face of his wife, look through him. But the child gazed straight into his eyes. She saw him. The next thing he knew was that he heard something tinkling, far, far away. It sounded miles below him. Inside him he was sounding himself, all utterly bewildering, like a bell. It was a bell. Millie stooped down and picked the parcels up. Her face shone with happiness and laughter. But a man came in soon after. A man with a ridiculous, solemn face, a pencil and a notebook. He wore a dark blue helmet. Behind him came a string of other men. They carried something. Something. He could not see exactly what it was. But when he pressed forward through the laughing throng to gaze upon it, he dimly made out two eyes, a nose, a chin, a deep red smear, and a pair of folded hands upon an overcoat. A woman's form fell down upon them then, and he heard the soft sounds of children weeping strangely, and other sounds, as of familiar voices laughing, laughing gaily. They'll join us presently. It goes like a flash. And turning with great happiness in his heart, he saw that Sir James had said it, holding Palmer by the arm as with some natural yet unexpected love of sympathetic friendship. Come on, said Palmer, smiling like a man who accepts a gift in universal friendship. Let's help him. They'll never understand. Still, we can always try. The entire throng moved up with laughter and amusement. It was a moment of hearty, genuine life at last. Delight and joy and peace were everywhere. Then John Mudbury realized the truth, that he was dead. End of The Transition by Algernon Blackwood Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama At the Gate by Myla Joe Closser This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. At the Gate by Myla Jo Closer. A shaggy Airedale scented his way along the high road. He had not been there before, but he was guided by the trail of his brethren who had preceded him. He had gone unwillingly upon this journey, yet with a perfect training of dogs he had accepted it without complaint. The path had been lonely and his heart would have failed him, travelling as he must without his people, had not these traces of countless dogs before him promised companionship of a sort at the end of the road. The landscape had appeared arid at first, 
for the translation from recent agony into freedom from pain had been so numbing in its swiftness that it was some time before he could fully appreciate the pleasant dog country through which he was passing there were woods with leaves upon the ground through which to scurry long grassy slopes for extended runs and lakes into which he might plunge for sticks and bring them back to but he did not complete this thought for the boy was not with him a little wave of homesickness possessed him it made his mind easier to see far ahead a great gate as high as the heavens wide enough for all he understood that only man built such barriers and by straining his eyes he fancied he could discern humans passing through to whatever lay beyond he broke into a run that he might the more quickly gain this enclosure made beautiful by men and women but his thoughts outran his pace and he remembered that he had left the family behind and again this lovely new compound became not perfect since it would lack the family the scent of the dogs grew very strong now and coming nearer he discovered to his astonishment that of the myriads of those who had arrived ahead of him thousands were still gathered on the outside of the portal they sat in a wide circle spreading out on each side of the entrance big little curly handsome mongrel thoroughbred dogs of every age complexion and personality all were apparently waiting for something someone at the end of the pad of the airedale's feet on the hard road they arose and looked in his direction that the interest passed as soon as they discovered the newcomer to be a dog puzzled him in his former dwelling place a four-footed brother was greeted with enthusiasm when he was a friend with suspicious diplomacy when a stranger and with sharp reproof when an enemy but never had he been utterly ignored he remembered something that he had read many times on great buildings with lofty entrances dogs not admitted the signs had said and he feared this might be the reason for the waiting circle outside the gate it might be that this noble portal stood at the dividing line between mere dogs and humans but he had been a member of the family romping with them in the living room sitting at meals with them in the dining room going upstairs at night with them and the thought that he had to be kept out would be unendurable he despised the passive dogs they should be treating a barrier after the fashion of their old country leaping against it barking and scratching the nicely painted door he bounded up the last hill to set them an example for he was still full of the rebellion of the world but he found no door to leap against he could see beyond the entrance dear masses of people yet no dog crossed the threshold they continued in their patient ring their gaze upon the winding road he now advanced cautiously to examine the gate it occurred to him that it must be fly time in this region and he did not wish to make himself ridiculous before all these strangers by trying to bolt through an invisible mesh like the one that had baffled him when he was a little chap yet there were no screens and despair entered his soul what bitter punishment these poor beasts must have suffered before they learned to stay on this side of the arch that led to human beings what had they done on earth to merit this stolen bones troubled his conscience runaway days sleeping in the best chair until the key clicked in the lock these were sins at that moment an english bull terrier white with liver-colored spots and a jaunty manner approached him snuffling in a friendly manner no sooner had the bull terrier smelt his collar than he fell to expressing his joy at meeting him the airedale's reserve was quite thawed by this welcome though he did not know just what to make of it i know you i know you exclaimed the bull terrier adding inconsequently what's your name tam o shanter they call me tammy was the answer 
with a pardonable break in his voice. "'I know them,' said the bull terrier. "'Nice folks.' "'Best ever,' said the Airedale, trying to be nonchalant, and scratching a flea which was not there. "'I don't remember you. When did you know them?' "'About fourteen tags ago, when they were first married. We keep track of time here by the license tags. I had four. This is my first and only one. You were before my time, I guess.' He felt young and shy. "'Come for a walk and tell me all about them,' was his new friend's invitation. "'Aren't we allowed in there?' asked Tam, looking toward the gate. "'Sure. You can go in whenever you want to. Some of us do at first, but we don't stay. "'Like it better outside?' "'No, no, it isn't that. "'Then why are all of you fellows hanging around here? "'Any old dog can see it's better beyond the arch.' You see, we are waiting for our folks to come. The Airedale grasped it at once, and nodded understandingly. I felt that way when I came along the road. It wouldn't be what it's supposed to be without them. It wouldn't be the perfect place. Not to us, said the bull terrier. Fine, I have stolen bones, but it must be that I have been forgiven, if I am to see them here again. It's the great good place, all right. But look here, he added as a new thought struck him. Do they wait for us? The older inhabitant coughed in slight embarrassment. The humans couldn't do that very well. It wouldn't be the thing to have them hang around outside for just a dog. Not dignified. Quite right, agreed Tam. I'm glad they go straight to their mansions. I'd... I'd hate to have them missing me as I am missing them, he sighed. But then, they wouldn't have to wait so long. Oh, well, they're getting on. Don't be discouraged, comforted the terrier. And in the meantime, it's like a big hotel in summer, watching the new arrivals. See, there is something doing now. All the dogs were aroused to excitement by a little figure making its way uncertainly up the last slope. Half of them started to meet it, crowding about in a loving, eager pack. "'Look out! Don't scare it!' cautioned the older animals, while word was passed to those farthest from the gate. "'Quick! Quick! A baby's come!' Before they had entirely assembled, however, a gaunt yellow hound pushed through the crowd, gave one sniff at the small child, and with a yelp of joy crouched at its feet. The baby embraced the hound in recognition and the two moved toward the gate. Just outside, the hound stopped to speak to an aristocratic St. Bernard, who had been friendly. "'Sorry to leave you, old fellow,' he said, "'but I'm going in to watch over the kid. "'You see, I'm all she has up here.' The bull terror looked at the Airedale for appreciation. "'That's the way we do it,' he said proudly. "'Yes, but—' The Airedale put his head on one side in perplexity. Yes, but what? asked the guide. The dogs that don't have any people. The nobodies' dogs. That's the best of all. Oh, everything is thought out here. Crouch down. You must be tired. And watch, said the bull terrier. Soon they spied another small form making the turn in the road. He wore a Boy Scout's uniform, but he was a little fearful. For all that. So new was this adventure. The dogs rose again and snuffled, but the better groomed of the circle held back, and in their place a pack of odds and ends of the company ran down to meet him. The boy scout was reassured by their friendly attitude, and after petting them impartially, he chose an old-fashioned black and tan, and the two passed in. Tam looked questioningly. They don't know each other, he exclaimed but they've always wanted to. That's one of the boys who used to beg for a dog, but his father wouldn't let him have one. So all our strays wait for just such little fellows to come along. Every boy gets a dog, and every dog gets a master. I expect the boy's father would like to know that now, commented the Airedale. 
No doubt he thinks quite often. I wish I'd let him have a dog. The bull terrier laughed. You're pretty near the earth yet, aren't you? Tam admitted it. I've a lot of sympathy with fathers and with boys. Having them both in the family, and a mother as well. The bull terrier leaped up in astonishment. You don't mean to say they keep a boy? Sure, greatest boy on earth. Ten this year. Well, well, there is news. I wish they'd kept a boy when I was there. The Airedale looked at his new friend intently. See here, who are you? he demanded. But the other hurried on. I used to run away from them just to play with the boy. They'd punish me. And I always wanted to tell them it was their fault for not getting one. Who are you anyway? repeated Tam. Taking all this interest in me too, whose dog were you? You already guessed. I see it in your quivering snout. I'm the old dog that had to leave them about ten years ago. Their old dog, Bully. Yes, I'm Bully. They nosed each other with deeper affection, then strolled about the glades shoulder to shoulder. Bully the more eagerly pressed for news. Tell me, how are they getting along? Very well indeed. They've paid for the house. I... I suppose you occupied the kennel. No, they said they couldn't stand it to see another dog in your old place. Bully stopped to howl gently. That touches me. It's generous in you to tell it, to think they've missed me. For a little while they went on in silence. But as evening fell, and the light from the golden streets inside of the city gave the only glow to the scene, Bully grew nervous and suggested that they go back. We can't see so well at night, and I like to be pretty close to the path, especially toward morning. Tam assented. And I will point them out. You might not know them just at first. Oh, we know them. Sometimes the babies have grown up. They're rather hazy in their recollection of how we look. They think we are bigger than we are. But you can't fool us dogs. It's understood, Tam cunningly arranged that when he or she arrives, you'll sort of make them feel at home while I wait for the boy. That's the best plan, assented Bully, kindly. And if by any chance the little fellow should come first. There's been a lot of them this summer. Of course you'll introduce me. I shall be proud to do it. And so with muzzles sunk between their paws, and with their eyes straining down the pilgrim's road, they waited outside the gate. End of At the Gate by Myla Joe Closser Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama Lycanthropus by C. Edgar Bowling This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut Lycanthropus by C. Edgar Bolin The jellied night has oozed its miry black from out the hills to fill the valley floor. Atop the ragged hills the torn cloud-rack Is lightning-limbed into a hellish door. A gust of wind across the sky is hurled. The gods of old are loosed upon the world. Age old, the bloodlust wells within my throat. Tensely I wait and feel my body shrink. My hairless hide becomes a furry coat. Blood hungry, through the open door I slink. I raise my head and howl in horrid glee, and from the plain a howl comes back to me. End of Lycanthropus The Nightwire by H. F. Arnold. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Gerzinski. The Nightwire by H. F. Arnold. New York, September 30th, CP. Flash. Ambassador Hollywell died here today. The end came suddenly as the ambassador was alone in his study. There was something ungodly about these night wire jobs. You sit up here on the top floor of a skyscraper and listen into the whispers of a civilization. New York, London, Calcutta, Bombay, Singapore. They're your next door neighbors after the street lights go dim and the world has gone to sleep. Alone in the quiet hours between two and four, the receiving operators doze over their sounders and the news comes in. Fires and disasters and suicides, murders, crowds, catastrophes, sometimes an earthquake with a casualty list as long as your arm. The night wire man takes it down almost in his sleep, picking it off on his typewriter with one finger. Once in a long time you prick up your ears and listen. You've heard of someone you knew in Singapore, Halifax, or Paris long ago. Maybe they've been promoted, but more probably they've been murdered or drowned. Perhaps they just decided to quit and took some bizarre way out. Made it interesting enough to get in the news. But that doesn't happen often. Most of the time you sit and doze and tap, tap on your typewriter and wish you were home in bed. Sometimes, though, queer things happen. One did the other night, and I haven't got over it yet. I wish I could. You see, I handle the night manager's desk in a western seaport town. What the name is doesn't matter. There is, or rather was, only one night operator on my staff, a fellow named John Morgan, about 40 years of age, I should say, and a sober, hard-working sort. He was one of the best operators I ever knew. What is known as a double man. That means he could handle two instruments at once and type the stories on different typewriters at the same time. He was one of the three men I ever knew who could do it consistently hour after hour and never make a mistake. Generally, we used only one wire at night, but sometimes when it was late and the news was coming fast, the Chicago and Denver stations would open a second wire. And then Morgan would do his stuff. He was a wizard. A mechanical automatic wizard which functioned marvelously but was without imagination. On the night of the 16th, he complained of feeling tired. It was the first and last time I had ever heard him say a word about himself. And I had known him for three years. It was just three o'clock, and we were running only one wire. I was nodding over the reports at my desk and not paying much attention to him when he spoke. Jim, he said, does it feel close in here to you? Why no, John, I answered, but I'll open a window if you like. Never mind, he said. I reckon I'm just a little tired. That was all that was said, and I went on working. Every ten minutes or so, I would walk over and take a pile of copy that had stacked up neatly beside the typewriter as the messages were printed out in triplicate. It must have been twenty minutes after he spoke that I noticed he had opened up the other wire and was using both typewriters. I thought it was a little unusual as there was nothing very hot coming in, but my next trip... I picked up the copy from both machines and took it back to my desk to sort out the duplicates. The first wire was running out the usual sort of stuff, and I just looked over it hurriedly. Then I turned to the second pile of copy. I remembered it particularly because the story was from a town I had never heard of. Zebico. Here is the dispatch. I saved a duplicate of it from our files. Zebico, September 16, CP. Bulletin. The heaviest mist in the history of the city settled over the town at four o'clock yesterday afternoon. All traffic was stopped, and the mist hangs like a pall over everything. Lights of ordinary intensity fail to pierce the fog, which is constantly growing heavier. Scientists are unable to agree as to the cause, and the local weather bureau states that the like has never occurred before in the history of the city. At 7 p.m. last night, the municipal authorities... More. That was all there was. Nothing out of the ordinary at a bureau headquarters, but, as I say, I noticed the story because of the name of the town. 
It must have been fifteen minutes later that I went over for another batch of copy. Morgan was slumped down in his chair and had switched his green electric light shade so that the gleam missed his eyes and hit only the top of the two typewriters. Only the usual stuff was in the right-hand pile, but the left-hand batch carried another story from Zebico. All press dispatches come in takes, meaning that parts of many different stories are strung along together, perhaps with but a few paragraphs of each coming through at a time. This second story was marked Add Fog. Here is the copy. At 7 p.m., the fog had increased noticeably. All lights were now invisible, and the town was shrouded in pitch darkness. As a peculiarity of the phenomenon, the fog is accompanied by a sickly odor, comparable to nothing yet experienced here. Below that, in customary press fashion, was the hour, 327, and the initials of the operator, J.M. There was only one other story in the pile from the second wire. Here it is. Second, add Zebico fog. Accounts as to the origin of the mist differ greatly. Among the most unusual is that of the sexton of the local church, who groped his way to headquarters in a hysterical condition, and declared that the fog originated in the village churchyard. It was first visible as a soft gray blanket, clinging to the earth above the graves, he stated. Then it began to rise higher and higher. A subterranean breeze seemed to blow it in billows, which split up and then joined together again. Fog phantoms writhing in anguish twisted the mist into queer forms and figures, and then in the very thick midst of the mass something moved. I turned and ran from the accursed spot. Behind me I heard screams coming from the houses bordering on the graveyard. Although the sexton story is generally discredited, a party has left to investigate. Immediately after telling his story, the sexton collapsed and is now in a local hospital, unconscious. Queer story, wasn't it? Not that we aren't used to it, for a lot of unusual stories come in over the wire. But for some reason or other, perhaps because it was so quiet that night, the report of the fog made a great impression on me. It was almost with dread that I went over to the waiting piles of copy. Morgan did not move, and the only sound in the room was the tap-tap of the sounders. It was ominous, nerve-wracking. And there was another story from Zebico in the pile of copy. I seized on it anxiously. New lead, Zebico Fog, CP. The rescue party, which went out at 11 p.m. to investigate a weird story of the origin of a fog, which, since late yesterday, has shrouded the city in darkness, has failed to return. Another and larger party has been dispatched. Meanwhile, the fog has, if possible, grown heavier. It seeps through the cracks in the doors and fills the atmosphere with a depressing odor of decay. It is oppressive, terrifying, bearing with it a subtle impression of things long dead. Residents of the city have left their homes and gathered in the local church, where the priests are holding services of prayer. The scene is beyond description. Grown folk and children are alike terrified, and many are almost beside themselves with fear. Amid the wisps of vapor which partly veil the church auditorium, an old priest is praying for the welfare of his flock. They alternately wail and cross themselves. From the outskirts of the city may be heard cries of unknown voices. They echo through the fog in queer, uncadenced minor keys. The sounds resemble nothing so much as wind whistling through a gigantic tunnel. But the night is calm and there is no wind. The second rescue party... More. I am a calm man, and never in a dozen years spent with the wires have I been known to become excited. But despite myself, I rose from my chair and walked to the window. Could I be mistaken, or far down in the canyons of the city beneath me did I see a faint trace of fog? Pshaw! It was all imagination. In the press room, the click of the sounders seemed to have raised the tempo of their tune. 
Morgan alone had not stirred from his chair, his head sunk between his shoulders. He tapped the dispatches out on the typewriters with one finger of each hand. He looked asleep, but no, endlessly, efficiently, the two machines rattled off line after line, as relentlessly and effortlessly as death itself. There was something about the monotonous movement of the typewriter keys that fascinated me. I walked over and stood behind his chair, reading over his shoulder the type as it came into being, word by word. Ah! Here was another. Flash! Zebico! CP! There will be no more bulletins from this office. The impossible has happened. No messages have come into this room for twenty minutes. We are cut off from the outside and even from the streets below us. I will stay with the wire until the end. It is the end, indeed. Since 4 p.m. yesterday, the fog has hung over the city. Following reports from the sexton of the local church, two rescue parties were sent out to investigate conditions on the outskirts of the city. Neither party has ever returned, nor was any word received from them. It is quite certain now they will never return. From my instrument, I can gaze down on the city beneath me. From the position of this room on the thirteenth floor, nearly the entire city can be seen. Now I can see only a thick blanket of blackness, where customarily are lights and life. I fear greatly that the wailing cries heard constantly from the outskirts of the city are the death cries of the inhabitants. They are constantly increasing in volume and are approaching the center of the city. The fog yet hangs over everything. If possible, it is even heavier than before, but the conditions have changed. Instead of an opaque, impenetrable wall of odorous vapor, there now swirls and writhes this shapeless mass and contortions of almost human agony. Now and again the mass parts, and I catch a brief glimpse of the streets below. People are running to and fro, screaming in despair. A vast bedlam of sound flies up to my window, and above all is the immense whistling of unseen and unfelt winds. The fog has again swept over the city, and the whistling is coming closer and closer. It is now directly beneath me. God! An instant ago the mist opened, and I caught a glimpse of the streets below. The fog is not simply vapor. It lives. By the side of each moaning and weeping human is a companion figure. An aura of strange and varicolored hues. How the shapes cling each to a living thing. The men and women are down, flat on their faces. The fog figures caress them lovingly. They are kneeling beside them. They are... But I dare not tell it. The prone and writhing bodies have been stripped of their clothing. They are being consumed piecemeal. A merciful wall of hot steaming vapor has swept over the whole scene. I can see no more. Beneath me the wall of vapor is changing colors. It seems to be lighted by internal fires. No, it isn't. I made a mistake. The colors are from above, reflections from the sky. Look up! Look up! The whole sky is in flames. Colors as yet unseen by man or demon. The flames are moving. They have started to intermix. The colors are rearranging themselves. They're so brilliant that my eyes burn. They are a long way off. Now they have begun to swirl, to circle in and out, twisting in intricate designs and patterns. The lights are racing each with each a kaleidoscope of unearthly brilliance. I've made a discovery. There is nothing harmful in the lights. They radiate force and friendliness, almost cheeriness, but by their very strength they hurt. As I look, they are swinging closer and closer, a million miles at each jump, millions of miles with the speed of light. I, it is light of quintessence of all light. Beneath it, the fog melts into a jeweled mist, radiant, rainbow-colored, of a thousand varied spectra. I can see the streets. Why, they are filled with people. The lights are coming closer. They are all around me. I'm enveloped. I... 
The message stopped abruptly. The wire to Zepico was dead. Beneath my eyes, in the narrow circle of light from under the green lampshade, the black printing no longer spun itself letter by letter across the page. The room seemed filled with a solemn quiet, a silence vaguely impressive, powerful. I looked down at Morgan. His hands had dropped nervously at his sides. His whole body had hunched over peculiarly. I turned the lampshade back, throwing light squarely in his face. His eyes were staring, fixed. Filled with a sudden foreboding, I stepped beside him and called Chicago on the wire. After a second, the sounder clicked its answer. Why? But there was something wrong. Chicago was reporting that wire two had not been used throughout the evening. Morgan, I shouted. Morgan, wake up. It isn't true. Someone has been hoaxing us. Why? In my eagerness, I grabbed him by the shoulder. His body was quite cold. Morgan had been dead for hours. Could it be that his sensitized brain and automatic fingers had continued to record impressions even after the end? I shall never know, for I shall never again handle the night shift. Search in a world atlas discloses no town of Zebico. Whatever it was that killed John Morgan will forever remain a mystery. End of The Night Wire by H. F. Arnold Read by Dan Gerzinski The Haunted Cove by Sir George Douglas This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Haunted Cove by Sir George Douglas Commonplace in itself and showing positive vulgarity in the style in which its pleasure grounds are laid out. Clive, near Berwick on Tweed, has yet one delightful feature of its own. To it, a private bay to which access is obtained by a tunnel seventy or eighty yards long, cut through the soft formation of the cliff from the sloping gardens above. The result is that, if you are a visitor at Clive, you have your own private bathing ground, your own private beach, where the children may play, without fear of being encroached upon, unless indeed a boat should be run in among the rocks from seaward. In the early nineties of the last century, the only daughter of the house of Clive was engaged to be married to a young officer quartered at the military depot at Berwick. They were a blameless, but not particularly interesting couple and one of their hobbies was to meet and promenade on the smooth sands of Clive Bay, in the brilliant autumn moonlight. In order to prevent possible intrusion from the sea, the seaward end of the tunnel was closed by a heavy iron gate, and upon the inner side of this gate the lieutenant was to wait until his fiancée should steal forth, bringing with her the key, which would give her access to the beach. It was all very foolish and romantic, no doubt for they might have met just as conveniently in the conservatory of Clive House, where their privacy would have been equally respected, and where Miss Alex's satin shoes and diaphanous draperies would have exposed her to no risk of a chill. Lovers are like that, however, and had they not been so on this occasion, I should have had no story to tell. Like the exemplary swain he was, Dick arrived early at the rendezvous, that is to say, early in respect to the time agreed upon, though, as a matter of fact, it was nearly eleven o'clock. There he lit a cigarette, and approaching the heavy iron bars of the locked gate, looked forth upon the peaceful scene beyond. It was a perfect night, the harvest moon riding through fleecy cloud aloft, whilst the breaking of the sea between the rocky points to right and left was soothing in its gentle iteration. Dick had been on parade extremely early that morning, and, tell it not in gaff, his eyes involuntarily closed. Starting awake again, he saw with surprise that though Alex had not yet come forward, he was no longer alone. No, 
the sacred beach had been invaded, and a female figure, clad in light draperies, was pacing slowly in the moonlight betwixt himself and the distant rocks. Who on earth could she be? And how had she got there? were the questions he asked himself, his first sensation being one of annoyance at so unexpected and so ill-timed an intrusion. But as the moments passed and the figure came more clearly into view, impatience gave way to curiosity, and curiosity to something like awe. What he saw was the tall and slender form of a young girl, whose hands were clasped in front of her, and whose eyes were fixed on the ground in a pensive, not to say sorrowful, attitude. Clear as was the moonlight, at least in the intervals of the moon's passage through the broken clouds, her features were not plainly visible, but her every movement was instinct with grace. What could she be doing there? Under other circumstances, possibly Dick might have felt inclined to pass the gate and himself step forth onto the sands. But, besides that, the gate was locked. He gradually became conscious of a singular delicacy or unwillingness to intrude upon the privacy of this solitary, inexplicable, and impressive figure. He was content, therefore, to watch her noiseless progress, and, as he did so, even his untrained masculine eye seemed to note something unusual, out of date, it might be, in the fashion of her garments. So perhaps might some old-world portrait have appeared, had it stepped down from its frame against the wall. This, however, stirred him little. What he was not prepared for was the gesture of anguish, nay, of positive despair, with which, when about opposite him, the figure threw her head back and her arms aloft, as if in mute and agonized appeal to heaven. The action was heart-rending even to look on, nor to a male eye did it lose aught from the fact that, as the moonlight now fell for the first time on her upturned face, it showed it to be deadly pale indeed, but also exquisitely lovely. Another moment or two, and the graceful and appealing form had passed beyond his field of vision, for, as the locked gate stood some little way back from the mouth of the tunnel, his view was restricted. A short time only, though he knew not exactly how long had passed, when Alex stood beside him. "'I had some difficulty,' she archly explained, in eluding prying eyes. For an ardent lover, Dick's greetings were perfunctory, after which, being still powerfully under the impression of what he had just seen, he told Alex all about it. "'We shall soon see who she is,' replied that practical young lady, as she placed the heavy key in the cumbrous lock. "'And I shall also take leave to inform her that this bit of coast is strictly private.' And strictly private it appeared to be when they emerged from the tunnel. For though their eyes swept the beach to right and left, and though the moon was then just unobscured, they saw no trace of any living form. "'She must have landed from a boat.' said Alex, but as little trace of a boat could they discover. Still, it was quite possible that she might pass unobserved against the dark rocks, so they turned first to the right, then to the left, keeping a keen lookout for any sign of motion. They detected nothing, and by this time I am bound to confess that a slightly uncomplimentary suspicion had more than once crossed the brain of Alex. She knew that, as a rule, her dick was a pattern of moderation, but even the most prudent may be liable to be occasionally overtaken, and she recalled his having mentioned that this was to be a guest night at the mess. Indeed, it was chiefly upon that account that the assignation had been fixed so late. This present portentous solemnity was certainly most unlike him. Was it possible that the poor fellow had taken just one more whiskey and soda than he could conveniently carry? Outspoken by nature, she blurted out her suspicion, which was strengthened rather than the reverse by the great earnestness with which he repelled it. Less convinced than before, Alex then exclaimed, Look here, Dick, if, as you say, the young woman passed this way, she must have left tracks in the smooth sand. Where do you say the place was? With some uncertainty, Dick then led her to what he took to be the place. No tracks were there. He then tried farther back from the mouth of the tunnel, and with as little success. It was true the tide was coming up, 
but it could scarcely yet have reached footmarks which had been imprinted so far inshore as he supposed these to have been. In spite of a levity which jarred on him, Alex now recommended her lover to go back to his quarters and have a good sleep, and then, having again passed through the gate and pushed their way back up the tunnel, the two young people parted in something very like a tiff. Dick did not call at Clive House the next day, and when he called on the day following, Alex met him in a complacent mood. After all, she had no wish to quarrel with him, and very soon she said, "'Going back to what you told me you had seen the other night, Dick, it occurred to me, after you were gone, that it fits in rather curiously with an old story connected with this place.' And then, at his request, she proceeded to tell him how, some thirty years ago, her grandmother had had a favourite maid, a friendless orphan girl named Barbara, to whom attached a mystery. Barbara was a very lovely creature of refinement and education above her station, and she had, of course, numerous admirers. Young as she was, her discretion was faultless, with the sole exception that her native amiability and desire to please sometimes betrayed her into conduct which meant less than her admirers wished to think it did. Well, at last, Barbara became plighted to a respectable young fisherman, part owner of a boat sailing from the Greenses, and, though details were vague, it was generally understood that, as a consequence, several hearts were severely damaged. As Barbara had no relatives, it was arranged by her employer that she should remain in her situation until the wedding day and should be married from Clive House. Considerable preparations had also been made to do honour to the occasion, when, judge of the consternation of the inmates of the house, upon the morning of the wedding day, Barbara was not to be found. She was believed to have retired to rest in the previous night as usual, yet her bed had not been slept in, nor, although most of her clothes were packed in anticipation of a change of domicile, had she apparently taken anything with her. Nothing in the least unusual had been observed in her demeanour, nor could the unhappy bridegroom suggest any possible motive for her conduct. Exhaustive inquiries and exhaustive search was made. But to cut the story short, nothing had ever been seen or heard of the fair Barbara to that day. Her mistress, who had been sincerely attached to her, had long moaned for her, and in after times would often sing her praises. But, in order to be quite candid, it must be acknowledged that there were others, not a few, who declined to believe that the girl had come to an untimely end, and who, knowing that she had several suitors, and had sometimes appeared uncertain which to favour, preferred to think that she had changed her mind at the last moment, and deciding to throw over her fisherman, had made her escape from Clive House during the night to join some more eligible swain. This would have been a desperate step indeed nor could her conduct in withholding subsequent explanations be absolved of heartlessness. But, after all, she was a sort of girl who, when no actual misconduct was involved, might easily allow herself to be over-persuaded. And certainly the tangled skein of love does sometimes present a knot which must be cut rather than untied. The lieutenant professed himself profoundly interested in this narrative which he and Alex then proceeded to discuss in all its bearings, and more particularly, of course, in its relation to the figure seen by him in the cove. It is true that Alex never quite believed in the germaneness of the apparition, but seeing that Dick really wished to have it taken seriously, she decided tactfully to humour him, and made quite a nine days' wonder of the mysterious occurrence. Their own wedding day was, however, fast drawing on, so they soon found other things to talk and think of. To be brief, they were in due course married, and, amid the cares and pleasures of wedded life, the story, though not forgotten, came to be very seldom referred to. So twenty years passed, at the end of which time the colonel, as he now was, accompanied by his wife and several youngsters, paid one of his not very frequent visits to his wife's parents at Clive House. On the first night of the visit, after dinner, Alex's father had significantly recalled the story of the maid Barbara's disappearance, and, after stating that the mystery had now been finally cleared up, had gone on to relate the following particulars. A few days previously, 
they had lain at the point of death in the infirmary at berwick an aged fisherman who had long been known in the seaport town of his solitary habits and morose and violent ways as death drew near it became evident that his mind was sorely troubled and to one of the nurses or doctors who had sought to comfort him he had been led to make the acknowledgment that a guilty secret weighed upon his soul making him fearful to confront his maker he then told how as a young man he had passionately loved a pretty servant girl employed at clive house misled by those smiles and that graciousness of manner which in the guileless amiability of her nature the girl lavished upon all alike he had for a moment imagined himself her favourite suitor how bitter then was the blow and how rude the awakening when he learned that a younger brother of his own a mere boy was preferred before himself nor was it only unrequited love that grieved him no he believed or managed to persuade himself that an unfair advantage had been taken off him by which he had been made the lover's dupe a silent man he took no one into his confidence but abode his time until the eve of the wedding day on that day he had accidentally intercepted a note from the girl barbara addressed to his brother in which she had agreed to meet her bridegroom of the morrow in the cove below clive house one hour before midnight to spend a final hour together before the momentous crisis in their lives instantly it had occurred to the elder brother to use the knowledge gained from the note in order to make one last desperate appeal on his own account to the sweet girl he loved so madly accordingly he kept back the missive and to make assurance doubly sure mixed a soporific drug with his brother's drink when the latter came in from fishing then whilst the youngster slumbered heavily he himself embarked in a cockle boat and unobserved rode quietly round the headland into clive cove where he ran his boat into a safe creek he knew of and jumped ashore poor barbara had come down to the water's edge to meet the boat and great was her consternation on finding herself confronted by the wrong brother then an impassioned scene was enacted in which the seaman used every means of persuasion known to him to get the girl to give up his brother and plight herself to him but though alternately distressed and terrified barbara had stood her ground and gentle and yielding though she appeared to be neither threats nor vows had had the slightest effect upon her constancy and then of a sudden the reckless brother had seen red if he could not have this girl to wife then neither should another and a moment later her white form lay stretched upon the dark rocks at his feet the sight brought him to himself there was no room for doubt that life was extinct and if he was to escape suspicion he must act at once for the summer night was short and the dread interview had lasted long he accordingly placed the body in the boat and having collected several heavy stones proceeded to make use of this sea craft by binding them closely and firmly about the girl's body by means of a clothing then he rowed out to sea some mile or more and there quietly dropped the body overboard such in essentials was the story told by the dying fisherman and so it had come about that the bride of that fatal morning was never seen or heard of more though possibly intended to be regarded as confidential certain it is that the confession had leaked out and very soon became public property for a few days it attracted great attention and then like other more important things which had preceded it it ceased save very occasionally to be alluded to at all but the colonel never forgot it any more than he ever forgot the lovely and inexplicable vision which had appeared to him for so brief an interval in the moonlight on the shore below clive house it is true that he seldom referred to it nor did that stately dame who had once been miss alex and who was now believed to command the regiment encourage him to do so for she had observed that he was always most ready to tell the story after an exceptionally good dinner and with her high sense of what was due to his rank she fancied that it made him mildly ridiculous neither it might be had her earliest doubts been ever wholly laid to rest but the members of the fair sex when they are practical are apt to be practical indeed end of the haunted cove by sir george douglas read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama
the tractate midoth by m r james this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read for you by chiquito craster the tractate midoth by m r james towards the end of an autumn afternoon an elderly man with a thin face and grey piccadilly weepers pushed open the swing door leading into the vestibule of a certain famous library and addressing himself to an attendant stated that he believed he was entitled to use the library and inquired if he might take a book out yes if he were on the list of those to whom the privilege was given he produced his card mr john eldred and the register being consulted a favourable answer was given now another point said he it is a long time since i was here and i do not know my way about your building besides it is near closing time and it is bad for me to hurry up and down stairs i have here the title of the book i want is there any one at liberty who could go and find it for me after a moment's thought, the doorkeeper beckoned to a young man who was passing. Mr. Garrett, he said, have you a minute to assist this gentleman? With pleasure, was Mr. Garrett's answer. The slip with the title was handed to him. I think I can put my hand on this. It happens to be in the class I inspected last quarter, but I'll just look it up in the catalogue to make sure i suppose it is that particular edition that you require sir yes if you please that and no other said mr eldred i am exceedingly obliged to you don't mention it i beg sir said mr garrett and hurried off i thought so he said to himself when his finger travelling down the pages of the catalogue stopped at a particular entry talmud tractate Middoth, with a commentary of Nicmanides, Amsterdam, 1707, 11.3.34. Hebrew class, of course. Not a very difficult job, this. Mr. Eldred, accommodated with a chair in the vestibule, awaited anxiously the return of his messenger, and his disappointment at seeing an empty-handed Mr. Garrett running down the staircase was very evident i'm sorry to disappoint you sir said the young man but the book is out oh dear said mr eldred is that so you are sure there can be no mistake i don't think there is much chance of it sir but it's possible if you like to wait a minute that you might meet the very gentleman that's got it he must be leaving the library soon and I think I saw him take that particular book out of the shelf. Indeed, you didn't recognize him, I suppose? Would it be one of the professors or one of the students? I don't think so. Certainly not a professor. I should have known him. But the light isn't very good in that part of the library at this time of day. And I didn't see his face. I should have said he was a shortish old gentleman perhaps a clergyman, in a cloak. If you could wait, I can easily find out whether he wants the book very particularly. No, no, said Mr. Eldred. I won't. I can't wait now. Thank you. No, I must be off. But I'll call again tomorrow, if I may, and perhaps you could find out who has it. Certainly, sir. And I'll have the book ready for you, if we... But Mr. Eldred was already off and hurrying more than one would have thought wholesome for him. Garrett had a few moments to spare, and thought he, I'll go back to that case and see if I can find the old man. Most likely he could put off using the book for a few days. I dare say the other one doesn't want to keep it for long. So off with him to the Hebrew class. But when he got there it was unoccupied, and the volume marked 11.3.34 was in its place on the shelf. 
It was vexatious to Garrett's self-respect to have disappointed an inquirer with so little reason, and he would have liked, had it not been against library rules, to take the book down to the vestibule then and there, so that it might be ready for Mr. Eldred when he called. However, the next morning he would be on the lookout for him, and he begged the doorkeeper to send and let him know when the moment came. As a matter of fact, he was himself in the vestibule when Mr. Eldred arrived, very soon after the library opened, and when hardly anyone besides the staff were in the building. "'I am very sorry,' he said. "'It's not often that I make such a stupid mistake. But I did feel sure that the old gentleman I saw took out that very book and kept it in his hand without opening it, just as people do, you know, sir.' when they mean to take a book out of the library and not merely refer to it. But, however, I'll run up now at once and get it for you this time. And here intervened a pause. Mr. Eldred paced the entry, read all the notices, consulted his watch, sat and gazed up the staircase, did all that a very impatient man could, until some twenty minutes had run out. At last he addressed himself to the doorkeeper, and inquired if it was a very long way to that part of the library to which Mr. Garrett had gone. "'Well, I was thinking it was funny, sir. He's a quick man as a rule. But to be sure, he might have been sent for by the librarian. But even so, I think he'd have mentioned to him that you was waiting. I'll just speak him up on the tube and see.' And to the tube he addressed himself. As he absorbed the reply to his question, his face changed, and he made one or two supplementary inquiries which were shortly answered. Then he came forward to his counter and spoke in a lower tone. "'I'm sorry to hear, sir, that something seems to have happened a little awkward. Mr. Garrett has been took poorly, it appears, and the library sent him home in a cab the other way. Something of an attack by what I can hear. What, really, do you mean that someone has injured him? No, sir, not violence here, but as I should judge, it attacked with an attack, what you might term it uh, of illness. Not a strong constitution, Mr. Garrett. But as to your book, sir, perhaps you might be able to find it for yourself. It's too bad you should be disappointed this way twice over. Er, uh, well, but I'm so sorry that Mr. Garrett should have taken ill in this way while he was obliging me. I think I must leave the book and call and inquire after him. You can give me his address, I suppose. That was easily done. Mr. Garrett, it appeared, lodged in rooms not far from the station. And one other question. Did you happen to notice of an old gentleman, perhaps a clergyman in a, yes, uh, in a black coat? left the library after I did yesterday. I think he may have been a, I think that is, that he may be staying, or rather that I may have known him. Not in a black cloak, sir, no. There were only two gentlemen left later than what you done, sir, both of them youngish men. There was Mr. Carter, who took out a music book, and one of the professors with a couple of novels. That's the lot, sir. And then I went off to meet tea, and glad to get it. Thank you, sir. Much obliged. Mr. Eldred, still a prey to anxiety, betook himself in a cab to Mr. Garrett's address. But the young man was not yet in a condition to receive visitors. He was better, but his landlady considered that he must have had a severe shock. She thought most likely from what the doctor said that he would be able to see Mr. Eldred tomorrow. Mr. Eldred returned to his hotel at dusk and spent, I fear, but a dull evening. On the next day he was able to see Mr. Garrett. When in health, Mr. Garrett was a cheerful and pleasant-looking young man. Now he was a very white and shaky being, propped up in an armchair by the fire, and inclined to shiver and keep an eye on the door. If, however, there were visitors whom he was not prepared to welcome, Mr. Eldred was not among them. It really is I who owe you an apology and I was despairing of being able to pay it, for I didn't know your address. But I am very glad that you have called. 
I do dislike and regret giving all this trouble. But you know I could not have foreseen this. This attack which I had. Of course not. But now, I am something of a doctor. You'll excuse my asking. You have had, I am sure, good advice. Was it a fall you had? No, I did fall on the floor, but not from any height. It was really a shock. You mean something startled you? Was it anything you thought you saw? Not much thinking in the case, I am afraid. Yes, it was something I saw. You remember when you called the first time at the library? Yes, of course. Well, now, let me beg you not to try to describe it. It will not be good for you to recall it, I am sure. But indeed, it would be a relief to me to tell anyone like yourself. You might be able to explain it away. It was just when I was going into the class where your book is. Indeed, Mr. Garrett, I insist. Besides, my watch tells me I have but very little time left in which to get my things together and take the train. No, not another word. It would be more distressing to you than you imagine, perhaps. Now, there is just one thing I want to say. I feel that I am really indirectly responsible for this illness of yours, and I think I ought to defray the expense which it has, eh? But this offer was quite distinctly declined. Mr. Elred, not pressing it, left almost at once. Not, however, before Mr. Garrett had insisted upon his taking a note to the class mark of the tractate Middoth, which, as he said, Mr. Elred could at leisure get for himself. But Mr. Elred did not reappear at the library. William Garrett had another visitor that day in the person of a contemporary and colleague from the library, one George Earle. Earl had been one of those who found Garrett lying insensible on the floor just inside the class, or cubicle, opening upon the central alley of a spacious gallery, in which the Hebrew books were placed, and Earl had naturally been very anxious about his friend's condition. So as soon as library hours were over, he appeared at the lodgings. Well, he said, after other conversation, I've no notion what it was that put you wrong but I've got the idea that there's something wrong in the atmosphere of the library. I know this, that just before we found you, I was coming along the gallery with Davis, and I said to him, Did you ever know such a musty smell anywhere as there is about here? It can't be wholesome. Well, now, if one goes on living a long time with a smell of that kind, I tell you it was worse than I ever knew it. It must get into the system and break out some time, don't you think? Garrett shook his head. That's all very well about the smell, but it isn't always there, though I've noticed it the last day or two, a sort of unnaturally strong smell of dust. But no, that's not what did for me. It was something I saw, and I want to tell you about it. I went into that Hebrew class to get a book for a man that was inquiring for it down below. Now, that same book I'd made a mistake about the day before. I'd been for it for the same man and made sure that I saw an old parson in a cloak taking it out. I told my man it was out. Off he went to call again the next day. I went back to see if I could get it out of the parson. No parson there. And the book on the shelf. Well, yesterday, as I say, I went again. This time, if you please, ten o'clock in the morning, remember? And as much light as ever you get in those classes. And there was my parson again, back to me, looking at the books on the shelf I wanted. His hat was on the table, and he had a bald head. I waited a second or two, looking at him rather particularly. I tell you, he had a very nasty bald head. It looked to me dry, and it looked dusty, and the streaks of hair across it were much less like hair than cobwebs. Well, I made a bit of a noise on purpose, coughed and moved my feet. He turned round and let me see his face, which I hadn't seen before. I tell you again, I'm not mistaken, though for one reason or another I didn't take in the lower part of his face. I did see the upper part and it was perfectly dry, and the eyes were very deep sunk, and over them from the eyebrows to the cheekbone. 
there were cobwebs thick now that closed me up as they say and i can't tell you anything more what explanations were furnished by earl of this phenomenon it does not very much concern us to inquire at all events they did not convince garrett that he had not seen what he had seen before william garrett returned to work at the library the librarian insisted upon his taking a week's rest and change of air within a few days time therefore he was at the station with his bag looking for a desirable smoking compartment in which to travel to burnstow on sea which he had not previously visited one compartment and one only seemed to be suitable but just as he approached it he saw standing in front of the door a figure so like one bound up with recent unpleasant associations that with a sickening qualm and hardly knowing what he did he tore open the door of the next compartment and pulled himself into it as quickly as if death were at his heels the train moved off and he must have turned quite faint for he was next conscious of a smelling bottle being put to his nose his physician was a nice-looking old lady who with her daughter was the only passenger in the carriage but for this incident it is not very likely that he would have made any overtures to his fellow travellers as it was thanks and inquiries and general conversation supervened inevitably and garrett found himself provided before the journey's end not only with a physician but with a landlady for mrs simpson had apartments to let at burnstow which seemed in all ways suitable the place was empty at that season so that garrett was thrown a good deal into the society of the mother and daughter he found them very acceptable company on the third evening of his stay he was on such terms with them as to be asked to spend the evening in their private sitting-room during their talk it transpired that garrett's work lay in a library ah libraries are fine places said mrs simpson putting down her work with a sigh but for all that books have played me a sad turn or rather a book has well books give me my living mrs simpson and i should be sorry to say a word against them i don't like to hear that they have been bad for you perhaps mr garrett could help us solve our puzzle mother said miss simpson i don't want to set mr garrett off on a hunt that might waste a lifetime my dear nor yet to trouble him with our private affairs but if you think it is in the least likely that i could be of use i do beg you to tell me what the puzzle is mrs simpson if it is finding out anything about a book you see i am in rather a good position to do it yes i do see that but the worst of it is that we don't know the name of the book nor what it is about no nor that either except that we don't think it's in english mother and that is not much of a clue well mr garrett said mrs simpson who had not yet resumed her work and was looking at the fire thoughtfully i shall tell you the story now you will please keep it to yourself if you don't mind thank you now it is just this i had an old uncle a dr rant perhaps you may have heard of him not that he was a distinguished man but from the odd way he chose to be buried i rather think i have seen the name in some guide-book that would be it said miss simpson he left directions horrid old man that he was to be put sitting at a table in his ordinary clothes in a brick room that he'd had made underground in a field near his house of course the country people say he's been seen about there in his old black cloak well dear i don't know much about such things mrs simpson went on but anyhow he is dead these twenty years and more he was a clergyman though i am sure i can't imagine how he got to be one but he did no duty for the last part of his life which i think was a good thing and he lived on his own property a very nice estate not a great way from here he had no wife or family only one niece who was myself and one nephew and he had no particular liking for either of us nor for any one else as far as that goes if anything 
he liked my cousin better than he did me, for John was much more like him in his temper, and I'm afraid I must say, his very mean, sharp ways. It might have been different if I had not married, but I did, and that he very much resented. Very well. Here he was with this estate and a good deal of money, as it turned out, of which he had the absolute disposal, and it was understood that we, my cousin and I, would share it equally at his death. In a certain winter, over twenty years back, as I said, he was taken ill, and I was sent for to nurse him. My husband was alive then, but the old man would not hear of his coming. As I drove up to the house, I saw my cousin John driving away from it in an open fly, and looking, I noticed, in very good spirits. I went up and did what I could for my uncle, but I was very soon sure that this would be his last illness, and he was convinced of it too. During the day before he died, he got me to sit by him all the time, and I could see there was something, and probably something unpleasant that he was saving up to tell me and putting it off as long as he felt he could afford the strength. I'm afraid, purposely, in order to keep me on the stretch. But at last out it came. Mary, he said. Mary, I've made my will in John's favour. He has everything, Mary. Well, of course, that came as a bit of shock to me, for we, my husband and I, were not rich people, and if he could manage to live a little easier than he was obliged to do, I felt it might be the prolonging of his life, but I said little or nothing to my uncle, except that he had a right to do what he pleased, partly because I couldn't think of anything to say, and partly because I was sure there was more to come, and so there was. But Mary, he said, I'm not very fond of John, and I've made another will in your favour. You can have everything, only you've got to find the will, you see and I don't mean to tell you where it is. And he chuckled to himself, and I waited, for again I was sure he hadn't finished. That's a good girl, he said after a time. You wait, and I'll tell you as much as I told John. But just let me remind you, you can't go into court with what I'm saying to you, for you won't be able to produce any collateral evidence beyond your own word, and John's a man that can do a little hard swearing if necessary. Very well, then, that's understood. Now, I had the fancy that I wouldn't write this will quite in the common way, so I wrote it in a book, Mary, a printed book, and there's several thousand books in this house, but there, you needn't trouble yourself with them, for it isn't one of them. It's in safe keeping elsewhere, in a place where John can go and find it any day, if he only knew. And you can't. A good will it is, properly signed and witnessed, but I don't think you'll find the witnesses in a hurry. Still I had nothing. If I had moved at all, I must have taken hold of the old wretch and shaken him. He lay there, laughing to himself, and at last he said, Well, well, you've taken it very quietly, and as I want to start you both on equal terms, and John has a bit of a purchase in being able to go where the book is, I'll tell you just two other things which I didn't tell him. The will's in English, but you won't know that if ever you see it. That's one thing. And another is that when I am gone, you'll find an envelope in my desk directed to you, and inside it something that would help you to find it, if only you have the wits to use it. In a few hours from that he was gone, and though I made an appeal to John Eldred about it, John Eldred. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Simpson. I think I've seen a Mr. John Eldred. What does he like to look at? It must be ten years since I saw him. He would be a thin elderly man now, and unless he has shaved them off, he has the sort of whiskers which people used to call Dundreary or Piccadilly something. Weepers. Yes, that is the man. Where did you come across him, Mr. Garrett? I don't know if I could tell you, said Garrett mendaciously, in some public place. But you hadn't finished. 
Really, I had nothing much to add, only that John Eldred, of course, paid no attention whatever to my letters, and has enjoyed the estate ever since, while my daughter and I have had to take to the lodging-house business here, which I must say has not turned out by any means so unpleasant as I feared it might. But about the envelope? To be sure. Why, the puzzle turns on that. Give Mr. Garrett the paper out of my desk. It was a small slip with nothing whatever on it but five numerals, not divided or punctuated in any way. One, one, three, three, four. Mr. Garrett pondered, but there was a light in his eye. Suddenly he made a face and then asked, Do you suppose that Mr. Eldred can have any more clue than you have to the title of the book? I have sometimes thought he must, said Mrs. Simpson, and in this way, that my uncle must have made the will not very long before he died, that, I think, he said himself, and got rid of the book immediately afterwards. But all his books were very carefully catalogued, and John has the catalogue, and John was most particular that no books whatever should be sold out of the house. And I am told that he is always journeying about to booksellers and libraries, so I fancy he must have found out just which books are missing from my uncle's library of those which are entered in the catalogue, and must be hunting for them. "'Just so, just so,' said Mr. Garrett, and relapsed into thought. No later than the next day, he received a letter which, as he told Mrs. Simpson with great regret, made it absolutely necessary for him to cut short his stay at Burnstow. Sorry as he was to leave them, and they were at least as sorry to part with him, he had begun to feel that a crisis, all important to Mrs., and shall we add Miss Simpson, was very possibly supervening. In the train, Garrett was uneasy and excited. He racked his brains to think whether the press mark of the book, which Mr. Eldred had been inquiring after, was one in any way corresponding to the numbers on Mrs. Simpson's little bit of paper. But he found to his dismay that the shock of the previous week had really so upset him that he could neither remember any vestige of the title or nature of the book, or even of the locality to which he had gone to seek it and yet all other parts of library, topography, and work were very clear as ever in his mind. And another thing. He stamped with annoyance as he thought of it. He had at first hesitated, and then had forgotten to ask Mrs. Simpson for the name of the place where Eldred lived. That, however, he could write about. At least he had his clue in the figures on the paper. If they referred to a press mark in his library, they were only susceptible of a limited number of interpretations. They might be divided into 1.13.34, or 11.33.4, or 11.3.34. He could try all these in the space of a few minutes, and if any one were missing, he had every means of tracing it. He got very quickly to work though a few minutes had to be spent in explaining his early return to his landlady and his colleagues. 1.13.34 was in place, and contained no extraneous writing. As he drew near to class 11 in the same gallery, its association struck him like a chill. But he must go on. After a cursory glance at 11.33.4, which first confronted him and was a perfectly new book, he ran his eye along the line of quartos which fills 11.3. The gap he feared was there. 34 was out. A moment was spent in making sure that it had not been misplaced, and then he was off to the vestibule. Has 11.3.34 gone out? Do you recollect noticing that number? Notice the number. What do you take me for, Mr. Garrett? There, take and look over the tickets for yourself, if you've got a free day before you. Well then, has a Mr. Eldred called again? The old gentleman who came the day I was taken ill. Come, you'd remember him. What do you suppose? Of course I recollect him. Oh, he haven't been in again, not since you went off on your holiday. And yet I seem to... There now. Roberts will know. Roberts? Do you recollect of the name of Heldred? Nor half, said Roberts. You mean the man that sent a bob over the price for the parcel? And I wish they all did. Do you mean to say you've been sending books to Mr. Eldred? 
Come, do speak up. Have you? Well, now, Mr. Garrett, if a gentleman sends the ticket all wrote correct, and the secretary says his book may go, and the box-ready address sent with a note, and a sum of money sufficient to defray the railway charges, what would be your action in the matter, Mr. Garrett, if I may take the liberty to ask such a question? Would you or would you not have taken the trouble to oblige, or would you have chucked the old thing under the counter and— You were perfectly right, of course, Hodgson, perfectly right. Only, would you kindly oblige me by showing me the ticket Mr. Eldred sent, and letting me know his address? To be sure, Mr. Garrett, so long as I am not acted about and informed that I don't know my duty, I am willing to oblige in every way feasible to my power. There is the ticket on the file, J. Eldred, 11.3.34. Title of work, T.A.L.M. Well, there, you can make what you like of it. Not a novel, I should hazard the guess. And here is Mr. Helred's note applying for the book in question, which I see he terms it a track. Thanks, thanks. But the address? There's none on the note. Ah, indeed, well, now. Uh, stay now, Mr. Garrett, I have it. Why, that note come inside of the parcel, which was directed very thoughtful to save all trouble, ready to be sent back with the book inside. And if I have made any mistake in this old transaction, it lays just in the one point that I neglected to enter the address in my little book here what I keep. Not but what I dare say there was good reasons for me not entering of it. But there. I haven't the time, neither have you, I dare say, to go into him just now. And no, Mr. Garrett, I do not carry it in my head, else what would be the use of my keeping this little book here? Just a ordinary common notebook, you see, which I make a practice of entering all such names and addresses in it as I see fit to do. Admirable arrangement, to be sure. But all right, thank you. When did the parcel go off? Half past ten this morning. Oh, good. And it's just one now. Garrett went upstairs in deep thought. How was he to get the address? A telegram to Mrs. Simpson? He might miss a train by waiting for the answer. Yes, there was one other way. She had said that Eldred lived on his uncle's estate. If this was so, he might find that place entered in the donation book. That he could run through quickly, now that he knew the title of the book. The register was soon before him, and knowing that the old man had died more than twenty years ago, he gave him a good margin and turned back to 1870. There was but one entry possible. 1875, August 14th, Talmud, Tractatus Middo, Cum Com, R. Nachmanidae, Amstelord, 1707, given by J. Rant, D. D. of Bretfield Manor. A gazetteer showed Bretfield to be three miles from a small station on the main line. Now to ask the doorkeeper whether he recollected if the name on the parcel had been anything like Bretfield. No, nothing like. It was, now you mention it, Mr. Garrett, either Breadfield or Britfield, but nothing like that other name that you quoted. So far well. Next, a timetable. A train could be got in twenty minutes, taking two hours over the journey. The only chance, and not one to be missed, and the train was taken. If he had been fidgety on the journey up, he was almost distracted on the journey down. If he found Eldred, what could he say? That it had been discovered that the book was a rarity and must be recalled, an obvious untruth, or that it was believed to contain important manuscript notes. Eldred would of course show him the book, but from which the leaf would already have been removed. He might perhaps find traces of the removal, a torn edge or a fly-leaf probably, and who could disprove what Eldred was certain to say? that he too had noticed and regretted the mutilation. Altogether the chase seemed very hopeless. The one chance was this. The book had left the library at 10.30. It might not have been put into the first possible train at 11.20. Granted that, then he might be lucky enough to arrive simultaneously with it and patch up some story which would induce Eldred to give it up. It was drawing towards evening when he got out upon the platform of his station, and like most country stations, 
this one seemed unnaturally quiet. He waited about till the one or two passengers who got out with him had drifted off, and then inquired of the station master whether Mr. Eldred was in the neighbourhood. Yes, and pretty near too, I believe. I fancy he means calling here for a parcel he expects. Called for it once today already, didn't he, Bob? To the porter. Yes, sir, he did, and appeared to think it was all along of me that it didn't come by the two o'clock. Anyhow, I've got it for him now and the porter flourished a square parcel which, a glance assured Garrett, contained all that was of any importance to him at that particular moment. Breadfield, sir? Yes, three miles just about. Shortcut across these three fields brings it down by half a mile. There, there's Mr. Eldred's trap. A dog-cart drove up with two men in it, of whom Garrett, gazing back as he crossed the little station yard, easily recognised one. The fact that Eldred was driving was slightly in his favour, for most likely he would not open the parcel in the presence of his servant. On the other hand, he would get home quickly, and unless Garrett were there within a very few minutes of his arrival, all would be over. He must hurry, and that he did. His shortcut took him along one side of a triangle, while the cart had two sides to traverse, and it was delayed a little at the station, so that Garrett was in the third of the three fields, when he heard the wheels fairly near. He had made the best progress possible, but the pace at which the cart was coming made him despair. At this rate it must reach home ten minutes before him, and ten minutes would more than suffice for the fulfilment of Mr. Eldred's project. It was just at this time that the luck fairly turned. The evening was still, and sounds came clearly. Seldom has any sound given greater relief than that which he now heard, that of the cart pulling up. A few words were exchanged, and it drove on. Garrett, halting in the utmost anxiety, was able to see it as it drove past the stile, near which he now stood, that it contained only the servant and not Eldred. Further, he made out that Eldred was following on foot. From behind the tall hedge by the stile, leading into the road, he watched the thin, wiry figure pass quickly by, with the parcel beneath his arm, and feeling in his pockets. Just as he passed the stile, something fell out of a pocket upon the grass, but with so little sound that Eldred was not conscious of it. In a moment more it was safe for Garrett to cross the stile into the road and pick up a box of matches. Eldred went on, and as he went his arms made hasty movements, difficult to interpret in the shadow of the trees that overhung the road. But as Garrett followed cautiously, he found at various points the key to them, a piece of string, and then the wrapper of the parcel, meant to be thrown over the hedge but sticking in it. Now Eldred was walking slower, and it could just be made out that he had opened the book and was turning over the leaves. He stopped, evidently troubled by the failing light. Garrett slipped into a gate opening, but still watched. Eldred, hastily looking around, sat down on a felled tree trunk by the roadside, and held the open book up close to his eyes. Suddenly he laid it, still open, on his knee, and felt in all his pockets, clearly in vain and clearly to his annoyance. You would be glad of your matches now, thought Garrett. Then he took hold of a leaf and was carefully tearing it out, when two things happened. First, something black seemed to drop upon the white leaf and run down it. And then, as Eldred started and was turning to look behind him, a little dark form appeared to rise out of the shadow behind the tree trunk, and from it two arms enclosing a mass of blackness came before Eldred's face and covered his head and neck. His legs and arms were vilely flourished, but no sound came. Then there was no more movement. Eldred was alone. He had fallen back into the grass behind the tree trunk. The book was cast into the roadway. Garrett, his anger and suspicion gone for the moment at the sight of this horrid struggle, rushed up with loud cries of help, and so too, to his enormous relief, did a labourer who had just emerged from a field opposite. Together they bent over and supported Eldred, but to no purpose. The conclusion that he was dead was inevitable. Who a gentleman, said Garrett to the labourer, when they had laid him down. What happened to him, do you think? I wasn't two hundred yards away, said the man, when I see Squire Eldred setting, reading in his book, and to my thinking he was 
took with just one of these fits. Faye seemed to go all over black. Just so, said Garrett. You didn't see anyone near him. It couldn't have been an assault. Not possible. No one couldn't have got away without you or me seeing them. So I thought. Well, we must get some help, and the doctor and the policeman, and perhaps I had better give them this book. It was obviously a case for an inquest, and obvious also that Garrett must stay at Bretfield and give his evidence. The medical inspection showed that, though some black dust was found in the face and in the mouth of the deceased, the cause of death was a shock to a weak heart and not asphyxiation. The fateful book was produced, a respectable quarto printed wholly in Hebrew, and not of an aspect likely to excite even the most sensitive. You say, Mr. Garrett, that the deceased gentleman appeared at the moment before his attack to be tearing a leaf out of this book? Yes, I think one of the fly leaves. There is here a fly leaf partially torn through. It has Hebrew writing on it. Will you kindly inspect it? There are three names in English, sir, also, and a date. But I am sorry to say I cannot read Hebrew writing. Thank you. The names have the appearance of being signatures. They are John Rant, Walter Gibson, and James Frost. And the date is 20th July, 1875. Does anyone here know any of these names? The rector who was present and volunteered a statement that the uncle of the deceased from whom he inherited had been named Rant. The book being handed to him, he shook a puzzled head. This is not like any Hebrew I ever learnt. You are sure that it is Hebrew? What? Yes, I suppose. No, my dear sir, you are perfectly right. That is, your suggestion is exactly to the point. Of course it is not Hebrew at all. It is English, and it is a will. It did not take many minutes to show that there was indeed a will of Dr. John Rant, bequeathing the whole of the property lately held by John Elred to Mrs. Mary Simpson. Clearly the discovery of such a document would amply justify Mr. Elred's agitation. As to the partial tearing of the leaf, the coroner pointed out that no useful purpose could be attained by speculations whose correctness it would never be possible to establish. The tractate Middot was naturally taken in charge by the coroner for further investigation, and Mr. Garrett explained privately to him the history of it, and the position of events so far as he knew or guessed them. He returned to his work next day, and on his walk to the station passed the scene of Mr. Elred's catastrophe. He could hardly leave it without another look, though the recollection of what he had seen there made him shiver, even on that bright morning. He walked round, with some misgivings, behind the fell tree. Something dark that still lay there made him start back for a moment. But it hardly stirred. Looking closer, he saw that it was a thick black mass of cobwebs, and as he stirred it gingerly with a stick, Several large spiders ran out of it into the grass. There is no great difficulty in imagining the steps by which Mr. William Garrett, from being an assistant in a great library, attained to his present position of prospective owner of Bretfield Manor, now in the occupation of his mother-in-law, Mrs. Mary Simpson. End of The Tractate Middot By M. R. James Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama The Music on the Hill by Saki. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Music on the Hill by Saki. Sylvia Selton ate her breakfast in the morning room at Yesney with a pleasant sense of ultimate victory such as a fervent ironside might have permitted himself on the morrow of worcester fight she was scarcely pugnacious by temperament but belonged to that more successful class of fighters who are pugnacious by circumstance fate had willed that her life should be occupied with a series of small struggles usually with the odds slightly against her 
and usually she had just managed to come through winning. And now she felt that she had brought her hardest and certainly her most important struggle to a successful issue. To have married Mortimer Selton, dead Mortimer, as his more intimate enemies called him, in the teeth of the cold hostility of his family, and in spite of his affected indifference to women, was indeed an achievement that had needed some determination and adroitness to carry through. Yesterday she had brought her victory to its concluding stage, by wrenching her husband away from town and its group of satellite watering places, and settling him down, in the vocabulary of her kind, in this remote woodgirt manor farm which was his country house. "'You'll never get Mortimer to go,' his mother had said, carpingly. "'But if he once goes, he'll stay. Yesney throws almost as much a spell over him as town does. One can understand what holds him to town, but Yesney!' And the dowager had shrugged her shoulders. There was a sombre, almost savage wildness about Yesney that was certainly not likely to appeal to town-bred tastes, and Sylvia, notwithstanding her name, was accustomed to nothing more sylvan than leafy Kensington. She looked in the country as something excellent and wholesome in its way, which was apt to become troublesome if you encouraged it overmuch. Distrust of town life had been a new thing with her, born of her marriage with Mortimer, and she had watched with satisfaction the gradual fading of what she called the Germain street look in his eyes as the woods and heather of Yesney had closed in on them yesternight. Her will-power and strategy had prevailed. Mortimer would stay. Outside the morning room windows was a triangular slope of turf, which the indulgent might call a lawn, and beyond its low hedge of neglected fuchsia bushes, a steeper slope of heather and bracken dropped down into cavernous combes, overgrown with oak and yew. In its wild open savagery there seemed a stealthy linking of the joy of life with the terror of unseen things. Sylvia smiled complacently as she gazed with a school of art appreciation at the landscape, and then of a sudden she almost shuddered. Two. It is very wild, she said to Mortimer, who had joined her. One could almost think that in such a place the worship of Pan had never quite died out. The worship of Pan never has died out, said Mortimer. Other newer gods have drawn aside his votaries from time to time, but he is the nature god, to whom all must come back at last. He has been called the father of all the gods, but most of his children have been stillborn. Sylvia was religious in an honest, vaguely devotional kind of way, and did not like to hear her beliefs spoken of as mere aftergrowths. But it was at least something new and hopeful to hear dead Mortimer speak with such energy and conviction on any subject. You don't really believe in Pan? she asked incredulously. "'I've been a fool in most things,' said Mortimer, quietly. "'But I'm not such a fool as not to believe in Pan when I'm down here. And if you're wise, you won't disbelieve in him too boastfully while you're in his country.' It was not till a week later, when Sylvia had exhausted the attractions of the woodland walks round Yesney, that she ventured on a tour of inspection of the farm buildings. A farmyard suggested in her mind a scene of cheerful bustle, with churns and flails and smiling dairymaids, and teams of horses drinking knee-deep in duck-crowded ponds. As she wandered among the gaunt grey buildings of Yesney Manor Farm, her first impression was one of crushing stillness and desolation, as though she had happened on some lone deserted homestead long given over to owls and cobwebs. Then came a sense of furtive, watchful hostility, the same shadow of unseen things that seemed to lurk in the wooded combs and coppices. From behind heavy doors and shuttered windows came the restless stamp of hoof or rasp of chain-halter. 
and at times a muffled bellow from some stalled beast. From a distant corner a shaggy dog watched her with intent, unfriendly eyes. As she drew near, it slipped quietly into its kennel, and slipped out again as noiselessly when she had passed by. A few hens, questing for food under a rick, stole away under a gate at her approach. Sylvia felt that if she had come across any human beings in the wilderness of barn and byre, they would have fled wraith-like from her gaze. At last, turning a corner quickly, she came upon a living thing that did not fly from her. A stretch in a pool of mud was an enormous sow, gigantic beyond the town woman's wildest computation of swine flesh, and speedily alert to resent and, if necessary, repel the unwanted intrusion. It was Sylvia's turn to make an unobtrusive retreat. As she threaded her way past rickyards and cowsheds and long blank walls, she started suddenly at a strange sound, the echo of a boy's laughter, golden and equivocal. Jan, the only boy employed on the farm, a tow-headed, wizened-faced yokel, was visibly at work on a potato cleaning halfway up the nearest hillside, and Mortimer, when questioned, knew of no other probable or possible begetter of the hidden mockery that had ambushed Sylvia's retreat. The memory of that untraceable echo was added to her other impressions of a furtive, sinister something that hung around Yesney. 3. Of Mortimer she saw very little. Farm and woods and trout streams seemed to swallow him up from dawn till dusk. Once, following the direction she had seen him take in the morning, she came to an open space in a nut copse further shut in by huge yew trees, in the centre of which stood a stone pedestal, surmounted by a small bronze figure of a youthful pan. It was a beautiful piece of workmanship, but her attention was chiefly held by the fact that a newly cut bunch of grapes had been placed as an offering at its feet. Grapes were none too plentiful at the manor house, and Sylvia snatched the bunch angrily from the pedestal contemptuous annoyance dominated her thoughts as she strolled slowly homeward, and then gave way to a sharp feeling of something that was very near fright. Across a thick tangle of undergrowth, a boy's face was scowling at her, brown and beautiful, with unutterably evil eyes. It was a lonely pathway. All pathways round Yesney were lonely, for the matter of that and she sped forward without waiting to give a closer scrutiny to the sudden apparition. It was not till she had reached the house that she discovered that she had dropped the bunch of grapes in her flight. "'I saw a youth in the wood today,' she told Mortimer that evening, brown-faced and rather handsome, but a scoundrel to look at. A gypsy lad, I suppose.' "'A reasonable theory,' said Mortimer. Only there aren't any gypsies in these parts at present. Then who was he? asked Sylvia, and as Mortimer appeared to have no theory of his own, she passed on to recount the finding of the votive offering. I suppose it was your doing, she observed. It's a harmless piece of lunacy, but people would think you dreadfully silly if they knew of it. Did you meddle with it in any way? asked Mortimer. I... I threw the grapes away. It seems so silly," said Sylvia, watching Mortimer's impassive face for a sign of annoyance. 4. I don't think you were wise to do that, he said reflectively. I've heard it said that the wood gods are rather horrible to those who molest them. Horrible, perhaps, to those who believe in them. But you see, I don't," retorted Sylvia. All the same said Mortimer, in his even, dispassionate tone. I should avoid the woods and orchards if I were you, and give a wide berth to the horned beasts on the farm. It was all nonsense, of course, but in that lonely, wood-girt spot nonsense seemed able to rear a bastard brood of uneasiness. Mortimer, said Sylvia suddenly, 
I think we will go back to town sometime soon. Her victory had not been so complete as she had supposed. It had carried her on to ground that she was already anxious to quit. I don't think you will ever go back to town, said Mortimer. He seemed to be paraphrasing his mother's prediction as to himself. Sylvia noted with dissatisfaction and some self-contempt that the course of her next afternoon's ramble took her instinctively clear of the network of woods. As to the horned cattle, Mortimer's warning was scarcely needed, for she had always regarded them as of doubtful neutrality at the best. Her imagination unsexed the most matronly dairy cows and turned them into bulls liable to see red at any moment. The ram who fed in the narrow paddock below the orchards she had adjudged, after ample and cautious probation, to be of docile temper. Today, however, she decided to leave his docility untested, for the usually tranquil beast was roaming with every sign of restlessness from corner to corner of his meadow. A low, fitful piping, as of some reedy flute, was coming from the depth of a neighbouring corpse, and there seemed to be some subtle connection between the animal's restless pacing and the wild music from the wood. Sylvia turned her steps in an upward direction and climbed the heather-clad slopes that stretched in rolling shoulders high above Yesney. She had left the piping notes behind her but across the wooded combs at her feet the wind brought her another kind of music, the straining bay of hounds in full chase. Yesney was just on the outskirts of the Devon and Somerset country, and the hunted deer sometimes came that way. Sylvia could presently see a dark body, breasting hill after hill and sinking again and again out of sight as he crossed the combs, while behind him steadily swelled that relentless chorus and she grew tense with the excited sympathy that one feels for any hunted thing in whose capture one is not directly interested. And at last he broke through the outermost line of oak scrub and fern and stood panting in the open, a fat September stag carrying a well-furnished head. His obvious course was to drop down to the brown pools of undercombe and thence make his way toward the red deer's favoured sanctuary, the sea. To Sylvia's surprise, however, he turned his head to the upland slope and came lumbering resolutely onward over the heather. It will be dreadful, she thought. The hounds will put him down under my very eyes. But the music of the pack seemed to have died away for a moment, and in its place she heard again that wild piping, which rose now on this side, now on that, as though urging the failing stag to a final effort. Sylvia stood well aside from his path, half hidden in a thick growth of whortled bushes, and watched him swing stiffly upward, his flanks dark with sweat, the coarse hair on his neck showing light by contrast. The pipe music shrilled suddenly around her, seeming to come from the bushes at her very feet. And at the same moment the great beast slewed round and bore directly down upon her. In an instant, her pity for the hunted animal was changed to wild terror at her own danger. The thick heather roots mocked her scrambling efforts at flight, and she looked frantically downward for a glimpse of oncoming hounds. The huge antler spikes were within a few yards of her, and in a flash of numbing fear she remembered Mortimer's warning to beware of horned beasts on the farm. And then with a quick throb of joy she saw that she was not alone. A human figure stood a few paces aside, knee-deep in the whortle bushes. "'Drive it off!' she shrieked, but the figure made no answering movement. The antlers drove straight at her breast. The acrid smell of the hunted animal was in her nostrils. But her eyes were filled with the horror of something she saw, other than her oncoming death. And in her ears rang the echo of a boy's laughter golden and equivocal end of the music on the hill by saki read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama the insanity of jones a study in reincarnation 
by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Sames. The Insanity of Jones. A Study in Reincarnation. By Algernon Blackwood. Adventures come to the adventurous, and mysterious things fall in the way of those who, with wonder and imagination, are on the watch for them. But the majority of people go past the doors that are left half ajar, thinking them closed, and fail to notice the faint stirrings of the great curtain that hangs ever in the form of appearances between them and the world of causes behind. For only to the few whose inner senses have been quickened, perchance by some strange suffering in the depths, or by a natural temperament bequeathed from a remote past, comes the knowledge, not too welcome, that this greater world lies ever at their elbow, and that any moment a chance combination of moods and forces may invite them to cross the shifting frontier. Some, however, are born with this awful certainty in their hearts, and are called to no apprenticeship, and to this select company Jones undoubtedly belonged. All his life he had realized that his senses brought to him merely a more or less interesting set of sham appearances, that space as men measure it was utterly misleading, that time as the clock ticked it in a succession of minutes was arbitrary nonsense, and in fact that all his sensory perceptions were but a clumsy representation of real things behind the curtain, things he was forever trying to get at, and that sometimes he actually did get at. He had always been tremblingly aware that he stood on the borderland of another region, a region where time and space were merely forms of thought, where ancient memories lay open to the sight, and where the forces behind each human life stood plainly revealed, and he could see the hidden springs at the very heart of the world. Moreover, the fact that he was a clerk in a fire insurance office and did his work with strict attention never allowed him to forget for one moment that, just beyond the dingy brick walls, where the hundred men scribbled with pointed pens beneath the electric lamps, there existed this glorious region, where the important part of himself dwelt and moved and had its being. For in this region he pictured himself playing the part of a spectator to his ordinary workaday life watching like a king the stream of events, but untouched in his own soul by the dirt, the noise, and the vulgar commotion of the outer world. And this was no poetic dream merely. Jones was not playing prettily with idealism to amuse himself. It was a living, working belief. So convinced was he that the external world was the result of a vast deception, practised upon him by the gross senses, that when he stared at a great building like St. Paul's, he felt it would not very much surprise him to see it suddenly quiver like a shape of jelly, and then melt utterly away, while in its place stood all at once revealed the mass of colour, or the great intricate vibrations, or the splendid sound, the spiritual idea which it represented in stone. For something in this way it was that his mind worked, yet to all appearances and in the satisfaction of all business claims, Jones was normal and unenterprising. He felt nothing but contempt for the wave of modern psychism. He hardly knew the meaning of such words as clairvoyance and clairaudience. He had never felt the least desire to join the Theosophical Society, and to speculate in theories of astral plane life or elementals. He attended no meetings of the Psychical Research Society and knew no anxiety as to whether his aura was black or blue, nor was he conscious of the slightest wish to mix in with the revival of cheap occultism, which proved so attractive to weak minds of mystical tendencies and unleashed imaginations. There were certain things he knew, but none he cared to argue about, and he shrank instinctively from attempting to put names to the contents of this other region knowing well that such names could only limit and define things that, according to any standards in use in the ordinary world, were simply undefinable and elusive, so that although this was the way his mind worked, 
There was clearly a very strong leaven of common sense in Jones. In a word, the man the world and the office knew as Jones was Jones. The name summed him up and labelled him correctly. John Enderby Jones. Among the things that he knew, and therefore never cared to speak or speculate about, one was that he plainly saw himself as the inheritor of a long series of past lives, the net result of painful evolution, always as himself, of course, but in numerous different bodies, each determined by the behaviour of the preceding one. The present John Jones was the last result to date of all the previous thinking, feeling, and doing of John Jones in earlier bodies and in other centuries. He pretended to no details, nor claimed distinguished ancestry, for he realised his past must have been utterly commonplace and insignificant to have produced his present. But he was just as sure he had been at this weary game for ages as that he breathed, and it never occurred to him to argue, to doubt, or to ask questions. And one result of this belief was that his thoughts dwelt upon the past rather than upon the future, that he read much history, and felt specially drawn to certain periods whose spirit he understood instinctively, as though he had lived in them, and that he found all religions uninteresting, because, almost without exception, they start from the present and speculate ahead as to what men shall become, instead of looking back and speculating why men have got here as they are. In the insurance office he did his work exceedingly well, but without much personal ambition. Men and women he regarded as the impersonal instruments for inflicting upon him the pain or pleasure he had earned by his past workings, for chance had no place in his scheme of things at all. And while he recognised that the practical world could not get along unless every man did his work thoroughly and conscientiously, he took no interest in the accumulation of fame or money for himself, and simply, therefore, did his plain duty with indifference as to results. In common with others who lead a strictly impersonal life, he possessed the quality of utter bravery, and was always ready to face any combination of circumstances, no matter how terrible, because he saw in them the just working out of past causes he had himself set in motion, which could not be dodged or modified. And whereas the majority of people had little meaning for him, either by way of attraction or repulsion, the moment he met someone with whom he felt his past had been vitally interwoven, his whole inner being leapt up instantly and shouted the fact in his face, and he regulated his life with the utmost skill and caution, like a sentry on watch for an enemy whose feet could already be heard approaching. Thus, while the great majority of men and women left him uninfluenced, since he regarded them as so many souls merely passing with him along the great stream of evolution, there were, here and there, individuals with whom he recognised that his smallest intercourse was of the gravest importance. These were persons with whom he knew in every fibre of his being he had accounts to settle, pleasant or otherwise, arising out of dealings in past lives, and into his relations with these few, therefore. He concentrated, as it were, the efforts that most people spread over their intercourse with a far greater number. By what means he picked out these few individuals, only those conversant with the startling process of the subconscious memory may say. But the point was that Jones believed the main purpose, if not quite the entire purpose, of his present incarnation lay in his faithful and thorough settling of these accounts, and that if he sought to evade the least detail of such settling, no matter how unpleasant, he would have lived in vain, and would return to his next incarnation with this added duty to perform. For according to his beliefs there was no chance, and could be no ultimate shirking, and to avoid a problem was merely to waste time and lose opportunities for development. And there was one individual with whom Jones had long understood clearly he had a very large account to settle, and towards the accomplishment of which all the main currents of his being seemed to bear him with unswerving purpose. For when he first entered the insurance office as a junior clerk ten years before, and through a glass door had caught sight of this man seated in an inner room, 
one of his sudden overwhelming flashes of intuitive memory had burst up into him from the depths, and he had seen, as in a flame of blinding light, a symbolical picture of the future rising out of a dreadful past. And he had, without any act of definite volition, marked down this man for a real account to be settled. With that man I shall have much to do, he said to himself, as he noted the big face look up and meet his eyes through the glass. There is something I cannot shirk, a vital relation out of the past of both of us. And he went to his desk trembling a little, and with shaking knees, as though the memory of some terrible pain had suddenly laid its icy hand upon his heart, and touched the scar of a great horror. It was a moment of genuine terror when their eyes had met through the glass door, and he was conscious of an inward shrinking and loathing that seized upon him with a great violence, and convinced him in a single second that the settling of this account would be almost, perhaps, more than he could manage. The vision passed as swiftly as it came, dropping back again into the submerged region of his consciousness, but he never forgot it and the whole of his life thereafter became a sort of natural though undeliberate preparation for the fulfilment of the great duty when the time should be ripe. In those days, ten years ago, this man was the assistant manager, but had since been promoted as manager to one of the company's local branches, and soon afterwards Jones had likewise found himself transferred to this same branch. A little later again, the branch at Liverpool, one of the most important, had been in peril, owing to mismanagement and defalcation, and the man had gone to take charge of it, and again, by mere chance apparently, Jones had been promoted to the same place. And this pursuit of the assistant manager had continued for several years, often too in the most curious fashion, and though Jones had never exchanged a single word with him, or been so much as noticed indeed by the great man, the clerk understood perfectly well that these moves in the game were all part of a definite purpose. Never for one moment did he doubt that the invisibles behind the veil were slowly and surely arranging the details of it all, so as to lead up suitably to the climax demanded by justice, a climax in which himself and the manager would play the leading roles. It is inevitable, he said to himself, and I feel it may be terrible, but when the moment comes I shall be ready, and I pray God that I may face it properly, and act like a man. Moreover, as the years passed and nothing happened, he felt the horror closing in upon him with steady increase, for the fact was Jones hated and loathed the manager with an intensity of feeling he had never before experienced towards any human being. He shrank from his presence, and from the glance of his eyes, as though he remembered to have suffered nameless cruelties at his hands, and he slowly began to realise, moreover, that the matter to be settled between them was one of very ancient standing, and that the nature of the settlement was a discharge of accumulated punishment which would probably be very dreadful in the manner of its fulfilment. When, therefore, the chief cashier one day informed him that the man was to be in London again, this time as general manager of the head office, and said that he was charged to find a private secretary for him from among the best clerks, and further intimated that the selection had fallen upon himself, Jones accepted the promotion quietly, fatalistically, yet with a degree of inward loathing hardly to be described, for he saw in this merely another move in the evolution of the inevitable nemesis, which he simply dared not seek to frustrate by any personal consideration, and at the same time he was conscious of a certain feeling of relief, that the suspense of waiting might soon be mitigated. A secret sense of satisfaction, therefore, accompanied the unpleasant change, and Jones was able to hold himself perfectly well in hand when it was carried into effect, and he was formally introduced as private secretary to the general manager. Now the manager was a large, fat man, with a very red face and bags beneath his eyes. Being short-sighted, he wore glasses that seemed to magnify his eyes, which were always a little bloodshot. In hot weather, 
A sort of thin slime covered his cheeks, for he perspired easily. His head was almost entirely bald, and over his turned-down collar his great neck folded in two distinct reddish collops of flesh. His hands were big, and his fingers almost massive in thickness. He was an excellent businessman, of sane judgment and firm will, without enough imagination to confuse his course of action by showing him possible alternatives, and his integrity and ability caused him to be held in universal respect by the world of business and finance. In the important regions of a man's character, however, and at heart, he was coarse, brutal almost to savagery, without consideration for others, and as a result often cruelly unjust to his helpless subordinates. In moments of temper, which were not infrequent, his face turned a dull purple, while the top of his bald head shone by contrast like white marble, and the bags under his eyes swelled till it seemed they would presently explode with a pop, and at these times he presented a distinctly repulsive appearance. But to a private secretary like Jones, who did his duty regardless of whether his employer was beast or angel, and whose mainspring was principle and not emotion, this made little difference. Within the narrow limits in which any one could satisfy such a man, he pleased the general manager, and more than once his piercing intuitive faculty amounting almost to clairvoyance, assisted the chief in a fashion that served to bring the two closer together than might otherwise have been the case, and caused the man to respect in his assistant a power of which he possessed not even the germ himself. It was a curious relationship that grew up between the two, and the cashier who enjoyed the credit of having made the selection profited by it indirectly as much as anyone else. So for some time the work of the office continued normally and very prosperously. John Enderby Jones received a good salary, and in the outward appearance of the two chief characters in this history there was little change noticeable, except that the manager grew fatter and redder, and the secretary observed that his own hair was beginning to show rather greyish at the temples. There were, however, two changes in progress and they both had to do with Jones, and are important to mention. One was that he began to dream evilly. In the region of deep sleep, where the possibility of significant dreaming first develops itself, he was tormented more and more with vivid scenes and pictures, in which a tall, thin man, dark and sinister of countenance, and with bad eyes, was closely associated with himself. Only the setting was that of a past age, with costumes of centuries gone by, and the scenes had to do with dreadful cruelties that could not belong to modern life as he knew it. The other change was also significant, but is not so easy to describe, for he had in fact become aware that some new portion of himself, hitherto unawakened, had stirred slowly into life out of the very depths of his consciousness. This new part of himself amounted almost to another personality, and he never observed its least manifestation without a strange thrill at his heart, for he understood that it had begun to watch the manager. It was the habit of Jones, since he was compelled to work among conditions that were utterly distasteful, to withdraw his mind wholly from business once the day was over. During office hours he kept the strictest possible watch upon himself, and turned the key on all inner dreams, lest any sudden uprush from the deeps should interfere with his duty. But once the working day was over, the gates flew open, and he began to enjoy himself. He read no modern books on the subjects that interested him, and, as already said, he followed no course of training, nor belonged to any society that dabbled with half-told mysteries. But once released from the office desk in the manager's room, he simply and naturally entered the other region, because he was an old inhabitant, a rightful denizen, and because he belonged there. It was, in fact, really a case of dual personality, and a carefully drawn agreement existed between Jones of the Fire Insurance Office and Jones of the Mysteries, by the terms of which, under heavy penalties, 
neither region claimed him out of hours. For the moment he reached his rooms under the roof in Bloomsbury, and had changed his city coat to another, the iron doors of the office clanged far behind him, and in front, before his very eyes, rolled up the beautiful gates of ivory, and he entered into places of flowers and singing and wonderful veiled forms. Sometimes he quite lost touch with the outer world, forgetting to eat his dinner or go to bed, and lay in a state of trance, his consciousness working far out of the body. And on other occasions he walked the streets on air, halfway between the two regions, unable to distinguish between incarnate and discarnate forms, and not very far, probably, beyond the strata where poets, saints, and the greatest artists have moved and thought, and found their inspiration. But this was only when some insistent bodily claim prevented his full release, and more often than not he was entirely independent of his physical portion, and free of the real region, without let or hindrance. One evening he reached home utterly exhausted after the burden of a day's work. The manager had been more than usually brutal, unjust, ill-tempered, and Jones had been almost persuaded out of his settled policy of contempt into answering back. Everything seemed to have gone amiss, and the man's coarse, underbred nature had been in the ascendant all day long. He had thumped the desk with his great fists, abused, found fault unreasonably, uttered outrageous things, and behaved generally as he actually was, beneath the thin veneer of acquired business varnish. He had done and said everything to wound all that was woundable in an ordinary secretary, and though Jones fortunately dwelt in a region from which he looked down upon such a man, as he might look down upon the blundering of a savage animal, the strain had nevertheless told severely upon him, and he reached home, wondering for the first time in his life whether there was perhaps a point beyond which he would be unable to restrain himself any longer. For something out of the usual had happened. At the close of a passage of great stress between the two, every nerve in the secretary's body tingling from undeserved abuse, the manager had suddenly turned full upon him in the corner of the private room where the safe stood, in such a way that the glare of his red eyes, magnified by the glasses, looked straight into his own, and at this very second that other personality in Jones, the one that was ever watching, rose up swiftly from the depths within and held a mirror to his face. A moment of flame and vision rushed over him, and for one single second, one merciless second of clear sight, he saw the manager as the tall dark man of his evil dreams, and the knowledge that he had suffered at his hands some awful injury in the past crashed through his mind like the report of a cannon. It all flashed upon him and was gone, changing him from fire to ice and then back again to fire, and he left the office with the certain conviction in his heart that the time for his final settlement with the man, the time for the inevitable retribution, was at last drawing very near. According to his invariable custom, however, he succeeded in putting the memory of all this unpleasantness out of his mind with the changing of his office coat, and after dozing a little in his leather chair before the fire, he started out, as usual, for dinner in the Soho French restaurant, and began to dream himself away into the region of flowers and singing, and to commune with the invisibles that were the very sources of his real life and being. For it was in this way that his mind worked, and the habits of years had crystallized into rigid lines along which it was now necessary and inevitable for him to act. At the door of the little restaurant he stopped short, a half-remembered appointment in his mind. He had made an engagement with someone, but where, or with whom, had entirely slipped his memory. He thought it was for dinner, or else to meet just after dinner, and for a second it came back to him that it had something to do with the office. But, whatever it was, he was quite unable to recall it, and a reference to his pocket engagement book showed only a blank page. Evidently 
he had even omitted to enter it, and after standing a moment vainly trying to recall either the time, place, or person, he went in and sat down. But though the details had escaped him, his subconscious memory seemed to know all about it, for he experienced a sudden sinking of the heart, accompanied by a sense of foreboding anticipation, and felt that beneath his exhaustion there lay a centre of tremendous excitement. The emotion caused by the engagement was at work, and would presently cause the actual details of the appointment to reappear. Inside the restaurant the feeling increased instead of passing. Someone was waiting for him somewhere. Someone whom he had definitely arranged to meet. He was expected by a person that very night, and just about that very time. But by whom? Where? A curious inner trembling came over him, and he made a strong effort to hold himself in hand and to be ready for anything that might come and then suddenly came the knowledge that the place of appointment was this very restaurant, and, further, that the person he had promised to meet was already here, waiting somewhere quite close beside him. He looked up nervously and began to examine the faces round him. The majority of the diners were Frenchmen, chattering loudly with much gesticulation and laughter, and there was a fair sprinkling of clerks like himself, who came because the prices were low and the food good, but there was no single face that he recognised until his glance fell upon the occupant of the corner seat opposite, generally filled by himself. There's the man who's waiting for me, thought Jones instantly. He knew it at once. The man, he saw, was sitting well back into the corner, with a thick overcoat buttoned tightly up to the chin. His skin was very white, and a heavy black beard grew far up over his cheeks. At first the secretary took him for a stranger, but when he looked up and their eyes met, a sense of familiarity flashed across him, and for a second or two Jones imagined he was staring at a man he had known years before. For barring the beard it was the face of an elderly clerk who had occupied the next desk to his own when he first entered the service of the insurance company, and had shown him the most painstaking kindness and sympathy in the early difficulties of his work. But a moment later the illusion passed, for he remembered that Thorpe had been dead at least five years. The similarity of the eyes was obviously a mere suggestive trick of memory. The two men stared at one another for several seconds, and then Jones began to act instinctively, and because he had to. He crossed over and took the vacant seat at the other's table facing him, for he felt it was somehow imperative to explain why he was late, and how it was he had almost forgotten the engagement altogether. No honest excuse, however, came to his assistance, though his mind had begun to work furiously. Yes, you are late, said the man quietly, before he could find a single word to utter. But it doesn't matter. Also, you had forgotten the appointment, but that makes no difference either. I knew that there was an engagement, Jones stammered, passing his hand over his forehead. But somehow... You will recall it presently, continued the other in a gentle voice, and smiling a little. It was in deep sleep last night we arranged this, and the unpleasant occurrences of today have for the moment, obliterated it. A faint memory stirred within him as the man spoke, and a grove of trees with moving forms hovered before his eyes and then vanished again, while for an instant the stranger seemed to be capable of self-distortion and to have assumed vast proportions with wonderful flaming eyes. Oh, he gasped, it was there, in the other region. Of course said the other, with a smile that illuminated his whole face. You will remember presently, all in good time, and meanwhile you have no cause to feel afraid. There was a wonderful soothing quality in the man's voice, like the whispering of a great wind, and the clerk felt calmer at once. They sat a little while longer, but he could not remember that they talked much or ate anything. He only recalled afterwards that the head waiter came up and whispered something in his ear, 
and that he glanced round and saw the other people were looking at him curiously, some of them laughing, and that his companion then got up and led the way out of the restaurant. They walked hurriedly through the streets, neither of them speaking, and Jones was so intent upon getting back the whole history of the affair from the region of deep sleep that he barely noticed the way they took, yet it was clear he knew where they were bound, or just as well as his companion, for he crossed the streets often ahead of him, diving down alleys without hesitation, and the other followed always without correction. The pavements were very full, and the usual night crowds of London were surging to and fro in the glare of the shop lights, but somehow no one impeded their rapid movements, and they seemed to pass through the people as if they were smoke and as they went the pedestrians and traffic grew less and less, and they soon passed the mansion-house and the deserted space in front of the Royal Exchange, and so on, down Fenchurch Street, and within sight of the Tower of London, rising dim and shadowy in the smoky air. Jones remembered all this perfectly well, and thought it was his intense preoccupation that made the distance seem so short, but it was when the Tower was left behind and they turned northwards, that he began to notice how altered everything was, and saw that they were in a neighbourhood where houses were suddenly scarce, and lanes and fields beginning, and that their only light was the stars overhead. And as the deeper consciousness more and more asserted itself to the exclusion of the surface happenings of his mere body during the day, the sense of exhaustion vanished and he realised that he was moving somewhere in the region of causes behind the veil, beyond the gross deceptions of the senses, and released from the clumsy spell of space and time. Without great surprise, therefore, he turned and saw that his companion had altered, had shed his overcoat and black hat, and was moving beside him absolutely without sound. For a brief second he saw him tall as a tree, extending through space like a great shadow, misty and wavering of outline, followed by a sound like wings in the darkness. But when he stopped, fear clutching at his heart, the other resumed his former proportions, and Jones could plainly see his normal outline against the green field behind. Then the secretary saw him fumbling at his neck, and at the same moment the black beard came away from the face in his hand. Then you are Thorpe, he gasped, yet somehow without overwhelming surprise. They stood facing one another in the lonely lane, trees meeting overhead and hiding the stars, and a sound of mournful sighing among the branches. I am Thorpe, was the answer, in a voice that almost seemed part of the wind and I have come out of our past to help you, for my debt to you is large, and in this life I had but small opportunity to repay. Jones thought quickly of the man's kindnesses to him in the office, and a great wave of feeling surged through him as he began to remember dimly the friend by whose side he had already climbed, perhaps, through vast ages of his soul's evolution. To help me now, he whispered. You will understand me when you enter into your real memory and recall how great a debt I have to pay for old faithful kindnesses of long ago, sighed the other in a voice like falling wind. Between us, though, there can be no question of debt, Jones heard himself saying, and remembered the reply that floated to him on the air, and the smile that lightened for a moment the stern eyes facing him. Not of debt, indeed, but of privilege. Jones felt his heart leap out towards this man, this old friend, tried by centuries and still faithful. He made a movement to seize his hand, but the other shifted like a thing of mist, and for a moment the clerk's head swam and his eyes seemed to fail. Then you are dead, he said under his breath with a slight shiver. Five years ago I left the body you knew, replied Thorpe. I tried to help you then instinctively, 
not fully recognizing you. But now I can accomplish far more. With an awful sense of foreboding and dread in his heart, the secretary was beginning to understand. It has to do with... with... Your past dealings with the manager. As the wind rose louder among the branches overhead and carried the remainder of the sentence into the air, Jones's memory, which was just beginning to stir among the deepest layers of all, shut down suddenly with a snap and he followed his companion over fields and down sweet-smelling lanes, where the air was fragrant and cool, till they came to a large house, standing gaunt and lonely in the shadows at the edge of a wood. It was wrapped in utter stillness, with the windows heavily draped in black, and the clerk, as he looked, felt such an overpowering wave of sadness invade him that his eyes began to burn and smart and he was conscious of a desire to shed tears. The key made a harsh noise as it turned in the lock, and when the door swung open into a lofty hall, they heard a confused sound of rustling and whispering, as of a great throng of people pressing forward to meet them. The air seemed full of swaying movement, and Jones was certain he saw hands held aloft and dim faces claiming recognition, while in his heart already oppressed by the approaching burden of vast accumulated memories, he was aware of the uncoiling of something that had been asleep for ages. As they advanced he heard the doors close with a muffled thunder behind them, and saw that the shadows seemed to retreat and shrink away towards the interior of the house, carrying the hands and faces with them. He heard the wind singing round the walls and over the roof, and its wailing voice mingled with the sound of deep collective breathing that filled the house like the murmur of a sea. And as they walked up the broad staircase and through the vaulted rooms where pillars rose like the stems of trees, he knew that the building was crowded row upon row with the thronging memories of his own long past. This is the house of the past, whispered Thorpe beside him as they moved silently from room to room. The house of your past. It is full from cellar to roof with the memories of what you have done, thought, and felt from the earliest stages of your evolution until now. The house climbs up almost to the clouds and stretches back into the heart of the wood you saw outside but the remoter halls are filled with the ghosts of ages ago too many to count and even if we were able to waken them you could not remember them now some day though they will come and claim you and you must know them and answer their questions for they can never rest till they have exhausted themselves again through you, and justice has been perfectly worked out. But now follow me closely, and you shall see the particular memory for which I am permitted to be your guide, so that you may know and understand a great force in your present life and may use the sword of justice, or rise to the level of a great forgiveness, according to your degree of power. Icy thrills ran through the trembling clerk, and as he walked slowly beside his companion, he heard from the vaults below, as well as from more distant regions of the vast building, the stirrings and sighing of the serried ranks of sleepers, sounding in the still air like a cord swept from unseen strings stretched somewhere among the very foundations of the house. Stealthily, picking their way among the great pillars, they moved up the sweeping staircase and through several dark corridors and halls, and presently stopped outside a small door in an archway where the shadows were very deep. Remain close by my side, and remember to utter no cry whispered the voice of his guide, and as the clerk turned to reply he saw his face 
was stern to whiteness, and even shone a little in the darkness. The room they entered seemed at first to be pitchy black, but gradually the secretary perceived a faint reddish glow against the farther end, and thought he saw figures moving silently to and fro. Now watch, whispered Thorpe, as they pressed close to the wall near the door and waited. But remember to keep up absolute silence it is a torture scene jones felt utterly afraid and would have turned to fly if he dared for an indescribable terror seized him and his knees shook but some power that made escape impossible held him remorselessly there and with eyes glued upon the spots of light he crouched against the wall and waited the figures began to move more swiftly each in its own dim light that shed no radiance beyond itself and he heard a soft clanking of chains and the voice of a man groaning in pain then came the sound of a door closing and thereafter joan saw but one figure the figure of an old man naked entirely and fastened with chains to an iron framework on the floor his memory gave a sudden leap of fear as he looked for the features and white beard were familiar, and he recalled them as though of yesterday. The other figures had disappeared, and the old man became the centre of the terrible picture. Slowly, with ghastly groans, as the heat below him increased to a steady glow, the aged body rose in a curve of agony, resting upon the iron frame only where the chains held wrists and ankles fast. Cries and gasps, filled the air, and Jones felt exactly as though they came from his own throat, and as if the chains were burning into his own wrists and ankles, and the heat scorching the skin and flesh upon his own back. He began to writhe and twist himself. Spain, whispered the voice at his side, and four hundred years ago. And the purpose, gasped the perspiring clerk though he knew quite well what the answer must be. To extort the name of a friend to his death and betrayal, came the reply through the darkness. A sliding panel opened with a little rattle in the wall immediately above the rack, and a face framed in the same red glow appeared and looked down upon the dying victim. Jones was only just able to choke a scream, for he recognized the tall, dark man of his dreams. With horrible, gloating eyes he gazed down upon the writhing form of the old man, and his lips moved as in speaking, though no words were actually audible. He asks again for the name, explained the other, as the clerk struggled with the intense hatred and loathing that threatened every moment to result in screams and action. His ankles and wrists pained him so that he could scarcely keep still, but a merciless power held him to the scene. He saw the old man, with a fierce cry, raise his tortured head and spit up into the face at the panel, and then the shutter slid back again, and a moment later the increased glow beneath the body, accompanied by awful writhing, told of the application of further heat. There came the odour of burning flesh. The white beard curled and burned to a crisp. The body fell back limp upon the red-hot iron, and then shot up again in fresh agony. Cry after cry, the most awful in the world, rang out with deadened sound between the four walls, and again the panel slid back creaking, and revealed the dreadful face of the torturer. Again the name was asked for, and again it was refused and this time after the closing of the panel a door opened and the tall thin man with the evil face came slowly into the chamber his features were savage with rage and disappointment and in the dull red glow that fell upon them he looked like a very prince of devils in his hands he held a pointed iron at white heat now the murder came from thorpe in a whisper that sounded as if it was outside the building and far away jones knew quite well what was coming but was unable even to close his eyes he felt all the fearful pains himself just as though he were actually the sufferer 
but now, as he stared, he felt something more besides, and when the tall man deliberately approached the rack and plunged the heated iron first into one eye and then into the other, he heard the faint fizzing of it and felt his own eyes burst in frightful pain from his head. At the same moment, unable longer to control himself, he uttered a wild shriek and dashed forward to seize the torturer and tear him into a thousand pieces. Instantly, in a flash, the entire scene vanished. Darkness rushed in to fill the room, and he felt himself lifted off his feet by some force like a great wind and borne swiftly away into space. When he recovered his senses, he was standing just outside the house, and the figure of Thorpe was beside him in the gloom. The great doors were in the act of closing behind him, but before they shut, he fancied he caught a glimpse of an immense veiled figure standing upon the threshold with flaming eyes, and in his hand a bright weapon like a shining sword of fire. Come quickly now. All is over, Thorpe whispered. And the dark man, gasped the clerk as he moved swiftly by the other's side. In this present life is the manager of the company. And the victim was yourself. And the friend he, I, refused to betray. I was that friend answered Thorpe, his voice with every moment sounding more and more like the cry of the wind. You gave your life in agony to save mine. And again in this life we have all three been together. Yes, such forces are not soon or easily exhausted, and justice is not satisfied till all have reaped what they sowed. Jones had an odd feeling that he was slipping away into some other state of consciousness. Thorpe began to seem unreal. Presently he would be unable to ask more questions. He felt utterly sick and faint with it all, and his strength was ebbing. Oh, quick, he cried. Now tell me more. Why did I see this? What must I do? The wind swept across the field on their right and entered the wood beyond with a great roar, and the air round him seemed filled with voices and a rushing of hurried movement. To the ends of justice, answered the other, as though speaking out of the centre of the wind and from a distance, which is sometimes entrusted to the hands of those who suffered and were strong. One wrong cannot be put right by another wrong, but your life has been so worthy that the opportunity is given to... The voice grew fainter and fainter. Already it was far overhead with the rushing wind. You may punish Here Jones lost sight of Thorpe's figure altogether, for he seemed to have vanished and melted away into the wood behind him. His voice sounded far across the trees, very weak and ever rising. Or if you can rise to the level of a great forgiveness. The voice became inaudible. The wind came crying out of the wood again. Jones shivered and stared about him. He shook himself violently and rubbed his eyes. The room was dark. The fire was out. He felt cold and stiff. He got up out of his armchair, still trembling, and lit the gas. Outside the wind was howling, and when he looked at his watch, he saw that it was very late, and he must go to bed. He had not even changed his office coat. He must have fallen asleep in the chair, as soon as he came in, and he had slept for several hours. Next day, and for several weeks thereafter, the business of the office went on as usual, and Jones did his work well and behaved outwardly with perfect propriety. 
no more visions troubled him, and his relations with the manager became, if anything, somewhat smoother and easier. True, the man looked a little different, because the clerk kept seeing him with his inner and outer eye promiscuously, so that one moment he was broad and red-faced, and the next he was tall, thin, and dark enveloped, as it were, in a sort of black atmosphere tinged with red, while at times a confusion of the two sights took place, and Jones saw the two faces mingled in a composite countenance that was very horrible indeed to contemplate. But beyond this occasional change in the outward appearance of the manager, there was nothing that the secretary noticed as the result of his vision, and business went on more or less as before, and perhaps even with a little less friction. But in the rooms under the roof in Bloomsbury, it was different, for there it was perfectly clear to Jones that Thorpe had come to take up his abode with him. He never saw him, but he knew all the time he was there. Every night on returning from his work he was greeted by the well-known whisper, Be ready when I give the sigh, and often in the night he woke up suddenly out of deep sleep and was aware that Thorpe had that minute moved away from his bed, and was standing, waiting and watching, somewhere in the darkness of the room. Often he followed him down the stairs, though the dim gas-jet on the landings never revealed his outline, and sometimes he did not come into the room at all, but hovered outside the window, peering through the dirty panes, or sending his whisper into the chamber in the whistling of the wind. For Thorpe had come to stay, and Jones knew that he would not get rid of him until he had fulfilled the ends of justice and accomplished the purpose for which he was waiting. Meanwhile, as the days passed, he went through a tremendous struggle with himself and came to the perfectly honest decision that the level of great forgiveness was impossible for him and that he must, therefore, accept the alternative and use the secret knowledge placed in his hands, and execute justice. And once this decision was arrived at, he noticed that Thorpe no longer left him alone during the day as before, but now accompanied him to the office, and stayed more or less at his side all through business hours as well. His whisper made itself heard in the streets and in the train, and even in the manager's room where he worked, sometimes warning, sometimes urging but never for a moment suggesting the abandonment of the main purpose, and more than once so plainly audible that the clerk felt certain others must have heard it as well as himself. The obsession was complete. He felt he was always under Thorpe's eye day and night, and he knew he must acquit himself like a man when the moment came, or prove a failure in his own sight as well as in the sight of the other. And now that his mind was made up, nothing could prevent the carrying out of the sentence. He bought a pistol, and spent his Saturday afternoons practising at a target in lonely places along the Essex shore, marking out in the sand the exact measurements of the manager's room. Sundays he occupied in like fashion, putting up at an inn overnight for the purpose, spending the money that usually went into the savings bank on travelling expenses and cartridges. Everything was done very thoroughly, for there must be no possibility of failure, and at the end of several weeks he had become so expert with his six-shooter that at a distance of twenty-five feet, which was the greatest length of the manager's room, he could pick the inside out of a halfpenny nine times out of a dozen, and leave a clean, unbroken rim. There was not the slightest desire to delay. He had thought the matter over from every point of view his mind could reach, and his purpose was inflexible. Indeed, he felt proud to think that he had been chosen as the instrument of justice in the infliction of so well-deserved and so terrible a punishment. Vengeance may have had some part in his decision, but he could not help that, for he still felt at times the hot chains burning his wrists and ankles with fierce agony through to the bone. He remembered the hideous pain of his slowly roasting back, and the point when he thought death 
must intervene to end his suffering, but instead new powers of endurance had surged up in him, and awful further stretches of pain had opened up, and unconsciousness seemed farther off than ever. Then at last the hot irons in his eyes, it all came back to him, and caused him to break out in icy perspiration at the mere thought of it. The vile face at the panel, the expression of the dark face. His fingers worked, his blood boiled. It was utterly impossible to keep the idea of vengeance altogether out of his mind. Several times he was temporarily balked of his prey. Odd things happened to stop him when he was on the point of action. The first day, for instance, the manager fainted from the heat. Another time, when he had decided to do the deed, the manager did not come down to the office at all. And a third time, when his hand was actually in his hip pocket, he suddenly heard Thorpe's horrid whisper telling him to wait, and turning he saw that the head cashier had entered the room noiselessly without his noticing it. Thorpe evidently knew what he was about, and did not intend to let the clerk bungle the matter. He fancied, moreover, that the head cashier was watching him. He was always meeting him in unexpected corners and places, and the cashier never seemed to have an adequate excuse for being there. His movements seemed suddenly of particular interest to others in the office as well. The clerks were always being sent to ask him unnecessary questions, and there was apparently a general design to keep him under a sort of surveillance, so that he was never much alone with the manager in the private room where they worked. And once the cashier had even gone so far as to suggest that he could take his holiday earlier than usual, if he liked, as the work had been very arduous of late, and the heat exceedingly trying. He noticed, too, that he was sometimes followed by a certain individual in the streets, a careless-looking sort of man who never came face to face with him or actually ran into him, but who was always in his train or omnibus, and whose eye he often caught observing him over the top of his newspaper, and who on one occasion was even waiting at the door of his lodgings when he came out to dine. There were other indications, too, of various sorts, that led him to think something was at work to defeat his purpose, and that he must act at once before these hostile forces could prevent. And so the end came very swiftly, and was thoroughly approved by Thorpe. It was towards the close of July, and one of the hottest days London had ever known for the city was like an oven, and the particles of dust seemed to burn the throats of the unfortunate toilers in street and office. The portly manager, who suffered cruelly, owing to his size, came down perspiring and gasping with the heat. He carried a light-coloured umbrella to protect his head. He'll want something more than that, though, Jones laughed quietly to himself when he saw him enter. The pistol was safely in his hip pocket every one of its six chambers loaded. The manager saw the smile on his face and gave him a long, steady look as he sat down to his desk in the corner. A few minutes later he touched the bell for the head cashier, a single ring, and then asked Jones to fetch some papers from another safe in the room upstairs. A deep inner trembling seized the secretary as he noticed these precautions for he saw that the hostile forces were at work against him, and yet he felt he could delay no longer and must act that very morning, interference or no interference. However, he went obediently up in the lift to the next floor, and while fumbling with the combination of the safe, known only to himself, the cashier and the manager, he heard again Thorpe's horrid whisper just behind him. You must do it today. You must do it. Today, He came down again with the papers and found the manager alone. The room was like a furnace, and a wave of dead heated air met him in the face as he went in. The moment he passed the doorway he realized that he had been the subject of conversation between the head cashier and his enemy. They had been discussing him. Perhaps an inkling of his secret had somehow got into their minds. They had been watching him for days past. They had become 
suspicious. Clearly he must act now, or let the opportunity slip by, perhaps forever. He heard Thorpe's voice in his ear, but this time it was no mere whisper, but a plain human voice speaking out loud. Now, it said, do it now. The room was empty. Only the manager and himself were in it. Jones turned from his desk where he had been standing and locked the door leading into the main office. He saw the army of clerks scribbling in their shirt sleeves, for the upper half of the door was of glass. He had perfect control of himself, and his heart was beating steadily. The manager, hearing the key turn in the lock, looked up sharply. What's that you're doing? he asked quickly. Only locking the door, sir, replied the secretary in a quite even voice. Why, who told you to? The voice of justice, sir, replied Jones, looking steadily into the hated face. The manager looked black for a moment, and stared angrily across the room at him. Then suddenly his expression changed as he stared, and he tried to smile. It was meant to be a kind of smile, evidently, but it only succeeded in being frightened. That is a good idea in this weather, he said lightly but it would be much better to lock it on the outside, wouldn't it, Mr. Jones? I think not, sir. You might escape me then. Now you can't. Jones took his pistol out and pointed it at the other's face. Down the barrel he saw the features of the tall, dark man, evil and sinister. Then the outline trembled a little, and the face of the manager slipped back into its place. It was white as death and shining with perspiration. You tortured me to death four hundred years ago, said the clerk in the same steady voice, and now the dispensers of justice have chosen me to punish you. The manager's face turned to flame and then back to chalk again. He made a quick movement towards the telephone bell, stretching out a hand to reach it, but at the same moment Jones pulled the trigger and the wrist was shattered, splashing the wall behind with blood. That's one place where the chains burnt, he said quietly to himself. His hand was absolutely steady, and he felt that he was a hero. The manager was on his feet with a scream of pain, supporting himself with his right hand on the desk in front of him, but Jones pressed the trigger again, and a bullet flew into the other wrist, so that the big man, deprived of support, fell forward with a crash onto the desk. You damned madman! shrieked the manager. Drop that pistol! That's another place, was all Jones said, still taking careful aim for another shot. The big man, screaming and blundering, scrambled beneath the desk, making frantic efforts to hide. But the secretary took a step forward and fired two shots in quick succession into his projecting legs, hitting first one ankle and then the other, and smashing them horribly. Two more places where the chains burnt, he said, going a little nearer. The manager, still shrieking, tried desperately to squeeze his bulk behind the shelter of the opening beneath the desk. But he was far too large, and his bald head protruded through on the other side. Jones caught him by the scruff of his great neck and dragged him yelping out onto the carpet. He was covered with blood and flopped helplessly upon his broken wrists. Be quick now, cried the voice of Thorpe. There was a tremendous commotion and banging at the door, and Jones gripped his pistol tightly. Something seemed to crash through his brain, clearing it for a second, so that he thought he saw beside him a great veiled figure with drawn sword and flaming eyes and sternly approving attitude. Remember the eyes! Remember the eyes! His thought in the air above him. Jones felt like a god with a god's power. Vengeance disappeared from his mind. He was acting impersonally as an instrument in the hands of the invisibles who dispense justice and balance accounts. He bent down and put the barrel close into the other's face, smiling a little as he saw the childish efforts of the arms to cover his head. Then he pulled the trigger, and a bullet went straight into the right eye, blackening the skin. Moving the pistol two inches the other way, he sent another bullet crashing into the left eye. Then 
he stood upright over his victim with a deep sigh of satisfaction. The manager wriggled convulsively for the space of a single second, and then lay still in death. There was not a moment to lose, for the door was already broken in, and violent hands were at his neck. Jones put the pistol to his temple and once more pressed the trigger with his finger, but this time there was no report. Only a little dead click answered the pressure, for the secretary had forgotten that his pistol had only six chambers, and that he had used them all. He threw the useless weapon on to the floor, laughing a little out loud, and turned, without a struggle, to give himself up. I had to do it, he said quietly, while they tied him up. It was simply my duty, and now I am ready to face the consequences, and Thorpe will be proud of me, for justice has been done, and the gods are satisfied. He made not the slightest resistance, and when the two policemen marched him off through the crowd of shuddering little clerks in the office, he again saw the veiled figure moving majestically in front of him, making slow, sweeping circles with the flaming sword to keep back the host of faces that were thronging in upon him from the other region. End of The Insanity of Jones A Study in Reincarnation by Algernon Blackwood Recording by Andy Sames The Monster Maker by W. C. Morrow This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org org recording by jeff chestnut the monster maker by w c morrow a young man of refined appearance but evidently suffering great mental distress presented himself one morning at the residence of a singular old man who was known as a surgeon of remarkable skill the house was a queer and primitive brick affair entirely out of date and tolerable only in the decayed part of the city in which it stood it was large gloomy and dark and had long corridors and dismal rooms and it was absurdly large for the small family man and wife that occupied it the house described the man is portrayed but not the woman he could be agreeable on occasion but for all that he was but animated mystery his wife was weak, wan, reticent, evidently miserable, and possibly living a life of dread or horror, perhaps witness of repulsive things, subject of anxieties, and victim of fear and tyranny. But there is a great deal of guessing in these assumptions. He was about sixty-five years of age, and she about forty. He was lean, tall, and bald, with thin smooth-shaven face and very keen eyes kept always at home and was slovenly the man was strong the woman weak he dominated she suffered although he was a surgeon of rare skill his practice was almost nothing for it was a rare occurrence that the few who knew of his great ability were brave enough to penetrate the gloom of his house and when they did so it was with deaf ear turned to sundry ghoulish stories that were whispered concerning him. These were, in great part, but exaggerations of his experiments in vivisection. He was devoted to the science of surgery. The young man who presented himself on the morning just mentioned was a handsome fellow, yet of evident weak character and unhealthy temperament, sensitive and easily exalted or depressed. A single glance convinced the surgeon that his visitor was seriously affected in mind, for there was never bolder skull-grin of melancholia, fixed and irredeemable. A stranger would not have suspected any occupancy of the house. The street door, old, warped, and blistered by the sun, was locked, and the small, faded green window blinds were closed. The young man rapped at the door. 
No answer. He rapped again. Still no sign. He examined a slip of paper, glanced at the number on the house, and then, with the impatience of a child, he furiously kicked the door. There were signs of numerous other such kicks. A response came in the shape of a shuffling footstep in the hall, a turning of the rusty key, and a sharp face that peered through a cautious opening in the door. "'Are you the doctor?' asked the young man. "'Yes, yes, come in,' briskly replied the master of the house. The young man entered. The old surgeon closed the door and carefully locked it. "'This way,' he said, advancing to a rickety flight of stairs. The young man followed. The surgeon led the way up the stairs, turned into a narrow, musty-smelling corridor at the left, traversed it, rattling the loose boards under his feet, at the farther end opened a door at the right, and beckoned his visitor to enter. The young man found himself in a pleasant room, furnished in antique fashion, and with hard simplicity. "'Sit down,' said the old man, placing a chair so that its occupant should face a window that looked out upon a dead wall about six feet from the house. He threw open the blind, and a pale light entered. He then seated himself near his visitor, and directly facing him, and with a searching look that had all the power of a microscope, he proceeded to diagnosticate the case. Well, he presently asked. The young man shifted uneasily in his seat. I, I have come to see you, he finally stammered, because I'm in trouble. Ah. Yes, you see, I, that is, I have given it up. Ah. There was pity added to sympathy in the ejaculation. That's it, given it up, added the visitor. He took from his pocket a roll of banknotes, and with the utmost deliberation he counted them out upon his knee. Five thousand dollars, he calmly remarked. That is for you. It's all I have. But I presume, I imagine, no, that is not the word. Assume, yes, that's the word. Assume that five thousand, is it really that much? Let me count. He counted again. That five thousand dollars is a sufficient fee for what I want you to do. The surgeon's lips curled pityingly, perhaps disdainfully also. What do you want me to do? he carelessly inquired. The young man rose, looked around with a mysterious air, approached the surgeon, and laid the money across his knee. Then he stooped and whispered two words in the surgeon's ear. These words produced an electric effect. The old man started violently, then springing to his feet, he caught his visitor angrily and transfixed him with a look that was as sharp as a knife. His eyes flashed, and he opened his mouth to give utterance to some harsh imprecation when he suddenly checked himself. The anger left his face, and only pity remained. He relinquished his grasp, picked up the scattered notes, and, offering them to the visitor, slowly said, I do not want your money. You are simply foolish. You think you are in trouble. Well, you don't know what trouble is. Your only trouble is that you have not a trace of manhood in your nature. You are merely insane. I shall not say pusillanimous. You should surrender yourself to the authorities and be sent to a lunatic asylum for proper treatment. The young man keenly felt the intended insult, and his eyes flashed dangerously. You old dog! You insult me thus? he cried. Grand airs these you give yourself! Virtuously indignant, old murderer you! Don't want my money, eh? When a man comes to you himself and wants it done, you fly into a passion and spurn his money, but let an enemy of his come and pay you, and you are only too willing. How many such jobs have you done in this miserable old hole? It is a good thing for you that the police have not run you down and brought spade and shovel with them. Do you know what is said of you? Do you think you have kept your windows so closely shut that no sound has ever penetrated beyond them? 
where do you keep your infernal implements he had worked himself into a high passion his voice was hoarse loud and rasping his eyes bloodshot started from their sockets his whole frame twitched and his fingers writhed but he was in the presence of a man infinitely his superior two eyes like those of a snake burned two holes through him an overmastering inflexible presence confronted one weak and passionate the result came sit down commanded the stern voice of the surgeon it was the voice of father to child of master to slave the fury left the visitor who weak and overcome fell upon a chair meanwhile a peculiar light had appeared in the old surgeon's face the dawn of a strange idea a gloomy ray strayed from the fires of the bottomless pit the baleful light that illumines the way of the enthusiast the old man remained a moment in profound abstraction gleams of eager intelligence bursting momentarily through the cloud of sombre meditation that covered his face then broke the broad light of a deep impenetrable determination there was something sinister in it suggesting the sacrifice of something held sacred after a struggle mind had vanished conscience taking a piece of paper and a pencil the surgeon carefully wrote answers to questions which he peremptorily addressed to his visitor such as his name age place of residence occupation and the like and the same inquiries concerning his parents together with other particular matters does any one know you came to this house he asked no you swear it yes but your prolonged absence will cause alarm and lead to search i have provided against that how by depositing a note in the post as i came along announcing my intention to drown myself the river will be dragged what then asked the young man shrugging his shoulders with careless indifference rapid undercurrent you know a good many are never found there was a pause are you ready finally asked the surgeon perfectly the answer was cool and determined the manner of the surgeon, however, showed much perturbation. The pallor that had come into his face at the moment his decision was formed became intense. A nervous tremulousness came over his frame. Above it all shone the light of enthusiasm. "'Have you a choice in the method?' he asked. "'Yes. Extreme anesthesia.' "'With what agent?' "'The surest and quickest.' Do you desire any, any subsequent disposition? No, only nullification, simply blowing out as of a candle in the wind, a puff, then darkness without a trace. A sense of your own safety may suggest the method. I leave it to you. No delivery to your friends? None whatever. Another pause. Did you say you were quite ready? asked the surgeon. Quite ready. And perfectly willing? Anxious. Then wait a moment. With this request, the old surgeon rose to his feet and stretched himself. Then, with the stealthiness of a cat, he opened the door and peered into the hall, listening intently. There was no sound. He softly closed the door and locked it. Then he closed the window blinds and locked them. This done, he opened a door leading into an adjoining room, which, though it had no window, was lighted by means of a small skylight. The young man watched closely. A strange change had come over him. While his determination had not one whit lessened, a look of great relief came into his face displacing the haggard, despairing look of a half-hour before. Melancholic then, he was ecstatic now. The opening of the second door disclosed a curious sight. 
in the center of the room directly under the skylight was an operating table such as is used by demonstrators of anatomy a glass case against the wall held surgical instruments of every kind hanging in another case were human skeletons of various sizes in sealed jars arranged on shelves were monstrosities of divers kinds preserved in alcohol there were also among innumerable other articles scattered about the room a mannequin a stuffed cat a desiccated human heart plaster casts of various parts of the body numerous charts and a large assortment of drugs and chemicals there was also a lounge which could be opened to form a couch the surgeon opened it and moved the operating table aside giving its place to the lounge come in he called to his visitor the young man obeyed without the least hesitation take off your coat he complied lie down on that lounge in a moment the young man was stretched at full length eyeing the surgeon the latter undoubtedly was suffering under great excitement but he did not waver his movements were sure and quick selecting a bottle containing a liquid he carefully measured out a certain quantity while doing this he asked have you ever had any irregularity of the heart no the answer was prompt but it was immediately followed by a quizzical look in the speaker's face i presume he added you mean by your question that it might be dangerous to give me a certain drug under the circumstances however i fail to see any relevancy in your question this took the surgeon aback but he hastened to explain that he did not wish to inflict unnecessary pain and hence his question he placed the glass on his stand approached his visitor and carefully examined his pulse wonderful he exclaimed why it is perfectly normal because i am wholly resigned indeed it has been long since i knew such happiness it is not active but infinitely sweet you have no lingering desire to retract none whatever the surgeon went to the stand and returned with the draught take this he said kindly the young man partially raised himself and took the glass in his hand he did not show the vibration of a single nerve he drank the liquid draining the last drop then he returned the glass with a smile thank you he said you are the noblest man that lives may you always prosper and be happy you are my benefactor my liberator bless you bless you you reach down from your seat with the gods and lift me up into glorious peace and rest i love you i love you with all my heart these words spoken earnestly in a musical low voice and accompanied with a smile of ineffable tenderness pierced the old man's heart a suppressed convulsion swept over him intense anguish wrung his vitals perspiration trickled down his face the young man continued to smile ah it does me good said he the surgeon with a strong effort to control himself sat down upon the edge of the lounge and took his visitor's wrist counting the pulse how long will it take the young man asked ten minutes two have passed the voice was hoarse ah oh, only eight minutes more delicious delicious i feel it coming what was that ah oh, i understand music beautiful coming coming is that that water trickling dripping doctor well thank you thank you noble man my savior my bena bena factor trickling trickling dripping dripping doctor 
Well, doctor. Past hearing, muttered the surgeon. Doctor. And blind. Response was made by a firm grasp of the hand. Doctor. And numb. Doctor. The old man watched and waited. Tripping. Tripping. The last drop had run. There was a sigh and nothing more. The surgeon laid down the hand. The first step, he groaned, rising to his feet. Then his whole frame dilated. The first step, the most difficult yet the simplest. A providential delivery into my hands of that for which I have hungered for forty years. No withdrawal now. It is possible because scientific, rational but perilous. If I succeed, if I shall succeed, I will succeed. And after success, what? Yes, what? Publish the plan and the result? The gallows. So long as it shall exist, and I exist, the gallows. That much. But how account for its presence? Ah, that pinch is hard. I must trust to the future. He tore himself from the reverie and started. I wonder if she heard or saw anything. With that reflection, he cast a glance upon the form on the lounge and then left the room, locked the door, locked also the door of the outer room, walked down two or three quarters, penetrated to a remote part of the house and rapped at a door. It was opened by his wife. He, by this time, had regained complete mastery over himself. I thought I heard someone in the house just now, he said, but I can find no one. I heard nothing. He was greatly relieved. I did hear someone knock at the door less than an hour ago, she resumed, and I heard you speak, I think. Did he come in? No. The woman glanced at his feet and seemed perplexed. I am almost certain, she said, that I heard footfalls in the house, and yet I see that you are wearing slippers. Oh, I had on my shoes then. That explains it, said the woman, satisfied. I think the sound you heard must have been caused by rats. Ah, that was it, exclaimed the surgeon. Leaving, he closed the door, reopened it, and said, I do not wish to be disturbed today. He said to himself as he went down the hall, All is clear there. He returned to the room in which his visitor lay and made a careful examination. Splendid specimen, he softly exclaimed. Every organ sound, every function perfect. Fine, large frame, well-shaped muscles, strong and sinewy, capable of wonderful development if given opportunity, I have no doubt it can be done. Already I have succeeded with a dog, a task less difficult than this, for in a man the cerebrum overlaps the cerebellum, which is not the case with the dog. This gives a wide range for accident, with but one opportunity in a lifetime. In the cerebrum the intellect and the affections, in the cerebellum the senses and the motor forces, in the medulla oblongata, control of the diaphragm. In these two latter lie all the essentials of simple existence. The cerebrum is merely an adornment. That is to say, reason and the affections are almost purely ornamental. I have already proved it. My dog, with its cerebrum removed, was idiotic, but it retained its physical senses to a certain degree. While thus ruminating, he made careful preparations. He moved the couch, replaced the operating table under the skylight, selected a number of surgical instruments, prepared certain drug mixtures, and arranged water, towels, and all the accessories of a tedious surgical operation. Suddenly he burst into laughter. Poor fool, 
he exclaimed paid me five thousand dollars to kill him didn't have the courage to snuff his own candle singular singular the queer freaks these madmen have you thought you were dying poor idiot allow me to inform you sir that you are as much alive at this moment as ever you were in your life but it will be all the same to you you shall never be more conscious than you are now and for all practical purposes so far as they concern you you are dead henceforth though you shall live by the way how should you feel without a head <laughs> but that's a sorry joke he lifted the unconscious form from the lounge and laid it upon the operating table about three years afterwards the following conversation was held between a captain of police and a detective she may be insane suggested the captain i think she is and yet you credit her story i do singular not at all i myself have learned something what much in one sense little in another you have heard those queer stories of her husband well they are all nonsensical probably with one exception he is generally a harmless old fellow but peculiar he has performed some wonderful surgical operations the people in his neighborhood are ignorant and they fear him and wish to be rid of him hence they tell a great many lies about him and they come to believe their own stories the one important thing that i have learned is that he is almost insanely enthusiastic on the subject of surgery especially experimental surgery and with an enthusiast there is hardly such a thing as a scruple it is this that gives me confidence in the woman's story you say she appeared to be frightened doubly so first she feared that her husband would learn of her betrayal of him second the discovery itself had terrified her but a report of this discovery is very vague argued the captain he conceals everything from her she is merely guessing in part yes in another part no she heard the sounds distinctly though she did not see clearly horror closed her eyes what she thinks she saw is i admit preposterous but she undoubtedly saw something extremely frightful there are many peculiar little circumstances he has eaten with her but few times during the last three years and nearly always carries his food to his private rooms she says that he either consumes an enormous quantity throws much away or is feeding something that eats prodigiously he explains this to her by saying that he has animals with which he experiments this is not true again he always keeps the door to these rooms carefully locked and not only that but he has had the doors doubled and otherwise strengthened and has heavily barred a window that looks from one of the rooms upon a dead wall a few feet distance what does it mean asked the captain a prison for animals perhaps certainly not why because in the first place cages would have been better in the second place the security that he has provided is infinitely greater than that required for the confinement of ordinary animals all this is easily explained he has a violent lunatic under treatment i had thought of that but such is not the fact how do you know by reasoning thus he has always refused to treat cases of lunacy he confines himself to surgery the walls are not padded for the woman has heard sharp blows upon them no human strength however morbid could possibly require such resisting strength as has been provided he would not be likely to conceal a lunatic's confinement from the woman no lunatic could consume all the food that he provides so extremely violent mania as these precautions indicate could not continue three years if there is a lunatic in the case it is very probable that there should have been communication with someone outside concerning the patient and there has been none 
the woman has listened at the keyhole and has heard no human voice within and last we have heard the woman's vague description of what she saw you have destroyed every possible theory said the captain deeply interested and have suggested nothing new unfortunately i cannot but the truth may be very simple after all the old surgeon is so peculiar that i am prepared to discover something remarkable have you suspicions i have of what a crime the woman suspects it and betrays it certainly because it is so horrible that her humanity revolts so terrible that her whole nature demands of her that she hand over the criminal to the law so frightful that she is in mortal terror so awful that it has shaken her mind what do you propose to do asked the captain secure evidence i may need help you shall have all the men you require go ahead but be careful you are on dangerous ground you would be a mere plaything in the hands of that man two days afterwards the detective again sought the captain i have a queer document he said exhibiting torn fragments of paper on which there was writing the woman stole it and brought it to me she snatched a handful out of a book getting only a part of each of a few leaves these fragments which the men arranged as best they could were the detective explained torn by the surgeon's wife from the first volume of a number of manuscript books which her husband had written on one subject the very one that was the cause of her excitement about the time that he began a certain experiment three years ago continued the detective he removed everything from the suite of two rooms containing his study and his operating room in one of the bookcases that he removed to a room across the passage was a drawer which he kept locked but which he opened from time to time as is quite common with such pieces of furniture the lock of the drawer is a very poor one and so the woman while making a thorough search yesterday found a key on her bunch that fitted this lock she opened the drawer drew out the bottom book of a pile so that its mutilation would more likely escape discovery saw that it might contain a clue and tore out a handful of the leaves she had barely replaced the book locked the drawer and made her escape when her husband appeared he hardly ever allows her to be out of his sight when she is in that part of the house the fragments read as follows the motory nerves i had hardly dared to hope for such a result although inductive reasoning had convinced me of its possibility my only doubt having been on the score of my lack of skill their operation has been only slightly impaired and even this would not have been the case had the operation been performed in infancy before the intellect had sought and obtained recognition as an essential part of the whole therefore i state as a proved fact that the cells of the motory nerves have inherent forces sufficient to the purposes of those nerves but hardly so with the sensory nerves these latter are in fact an offshoot of the former evolved from them by natural though not essential heterogeneity and to a certain extent are dependent on the evolution and expansion of a contemporaneous tendency that developed into mentality or mental function both of these latter tendencies these evolvements are merely refinements of the motory system and not independent entities that is to say they are the blossoms of a plant that propagates from its roots the motory system is the first nor am i surprised that such prodigious muscular energy is developing it promises yet to surpass the wildest dreams of human strength i account for it thus the powers of assimilation had reached their full development they had formed the habit of doing a certain amount of work they sent their products to all parts of the system as a result of my operation the consumption of these products was reduced fully one half that is to say about one half of the demand for them was withdrawn 
but force of habit required the production to proceed this production was strength vitality energy thus double the usual quantity of this strength this energy was stored in the remaining developed a tendency that did surprise me nature no longer suffered the distraction of extraneous interferences and at the same time being cut in two as it were with reference to this case did not fully adjust herself to the new situation as does a magnet which when divided at the point of equilibrium renews itself in its two fragments by investing each with opposite poles but on the contrary being severed from laws that theretofore had controlled her and possessing still that mysterious tendency to develop into something more potential and complex she blindly having lost her lantern pushed her demands for material that would secure this development and as blindly used it when it was given her hence this marvellous veracity this insatiable hunger this wonderful ravisness and hence also there being nothing but the physical part to receive this vast storing of energy this strength that is becoming almost hourly herculean almost daily appalling it is becoming a serious narrow escape to-day by some means while i was absent it unscrewed the stopper of the silver feeding pipe which i have already herein termed the artificial mouth and in one of its curious antics allowed all the chyle to escape from its stomach through the tube its hunger then became intense i may say furious i placed my hands upon it to push it into a chair when feeling my touch it caught me clasped me around the neck and would have crushed me to death instantly had i not slipped from its powerful grasp thus i always had to be on my guard i have provided the screw stopper with a spring catch and usually docile when not hungry slow and heavy in its movements which are of course purely unconscious any apparent excitement in movement being due to local irregularities of the blood supply of the cerebellum which if i did not have it enclosed in a silver case that is immovable i should expose an the captain looked at the detective with a puzzled air i don't understand it at all said he nor i agreed the detective what do you propose to do make a raid do you want a man three the strongest men in your district why the surgeon is old and weak nevertheless i want three strong men and for that matter prudence really advises me to take twenty at one o'clock the next morning a cautious scratching sound might have been heard in the ceiling of the surgeon's operating room shortly afterwards the skylight sash was carefully raised and laid aside a man peered into the opening nothing could be heard that is singular thought the detective he cautiously lowered himself to the floor by a rope and then stood for some moments listening intently there was a dead silence he shot the slide of a dark lantern and rapidly swept the room with the light it was bare with the exception of a strong iron staple and ring screwed to the floor in the center of the room with a heavy chain attached the detective then turned his attention to the outer room it was perfectly bare he was deeply perplexed returning to the inner room he called softly to the men to descend while they were thus occupied he re-entered the outer room and examined the door a glance sufficed it was kept closed by a spring attachment and was locked with a strong spring lock that could be drawn from the inside the bird has just flown mused the detective a singular accident the discovery and proper use of this thumb bolt might not have happened once in fifty years if my theory is correct by this time the men were behind him he noiselessly drew the spring bolt opened the door 
and looked out into the hall. He heard a peculiar sound. It was as though a gigantic lobster was floundering and scrambling in some distant part of the old house. Accompanying the sound was a loud, whistling breathing and frequent rasping gasps. These sounds were heard by still another person, the surgeon's wife, for they originated very near her rooms, which were a considerable distance from her husband's. She had been sleeping lightly, tortured by fear and harassed by frightful dreams. The conspiracy into which she had recently entered for the destruction of her husband was a source of great anxiety. She constantly suffered from the most gloomy forebodings and lived in an atmosphere of terror. Added to the natural horror of her situation were those countless sources of fear which a fright-shaken mind creates and then magnifies. She was, indeed, in a pitiable state, having been driven first by terror to desperation and then to madness. Startled thus out of fitful slumber by the noise at her door, she sprang from her bed to the floor, every terror that lurked in her acutely tense mind and diseased imagination starting up and almost overwhelming her. The idea of flight, one of the strongest of all instincts, seized upon her, and she ran to the door, beyond all control of reason. She drew the bolt and flung the door wide open, and then fled wildly down the passage the appalling hissing and rasping gurgle ringing in her ears apparently with a thousandfold intensity. But the passage was in absolute darkness, and she had not taken a half-dozen steps when she tripped upon an unseen object on the floor. She fell headlong upon it, encountering in it a large, soft, warm substance that writhed and squirmed, and from which came the sounds that had awakened her. Instantly realizing her situation, she uttered a shriek such as only an unnameable terror can inspire, but hardly had her cry started the echoes in the empty corridor when it was suddenly stifled. Two prodigious arms had closed upon her and crushed the life out of her. The cry performed the office of directing the detective and his assistants and it also aroused the old surgeon who occupied rooms between the officers and the object of their search. The cry of agony pierced him to the marrow, and a realization of the cause of it burst upon him with frightful force. "'It has come at last!' he gasped, springing from his bed. Snatching from a table a dimly burning lamp and a long knife which he had kept at hand for three years, he dashed into the corridor. The four officers had already started forward, but when they saw him emerge they halted in silence. In that moment of stillness the surgeon paused to listen. He heard the hissing sound and the clumsy floundering of a bulky living object in the direction of his wife's apartments. It evidently was advancing towards him. A turn in the corridor shut out the view. He turned up the light which revealed a ghastly pallor in his face. "'Wife!' he called. There was no response. He hurriedly advanced, the four men following quietly. He turned the angle of the corridor and ran so rapidly that by the time the officers had come in sight of him again he was twenty steps away. He ran past a huge, shapeless object sprawling, crawling, and floundering along and arrived at the body of his wife. He gave one horrified glance at her face and staggered away. Then a fury seized him. Clutching the knife firmly and holding the lamp aloft, he sprang toward the ungainly object in the corridor. It was then that the officer, still advancing cautiously, saw a little more clearly, though still indistinctly, the object of the surgeon's fury and the cause of the look of unutterable anguish in his face. The hideous sight caused them to pause. They saw what appeared to be a man, yet evidently was not a man. Huge, awkward, shapeless, a squirming, lurching, stumbling mass, completely naked. It raised its broad shoulders. It had no head. But instead of it, 
a small metallic ball surmounting its massive neck devil claimed the surgeon raising the knife hold there commanded a stern voice the surgeon quickly raised his eyes and saw the four officers and for a moment fear paralyzed his arm the police he gasped then with a look of redoubled fury he sent the knife to the hilt into the squirming mass before him the wounded monster sprang to its feet and wildly threw its arms about meanwhile emitting fearful sounds from a silver tube through which it breathed the surgeon aimed another blow but never gave it in his blind fury he lost his caution and was caught in an iron grasp the struggling threw the lamp some feet toward the officers and it fell to the floor shattered to pieces simultaneously with the crash the oil took fire and the corridor was filled with flame the officers could not approach beyond them was the spreading blaze and secure behind it were two forms struggling in a fearful embrace they heard cries and gasps and saw the gleaming of a knife the wood in the house was old and dry it took fire at once and the flame spread with great rapidity the four officers turned and fled barely escaping with their lives in an hour nothing remained of the mysterious old house and its inmates but a blackened ruin end of the monster maker recording by jeff chestnut The Fortunes of Sir Robert Ardagh by J. Sheridan Le Fanu. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Fortunes of Sir Robert Ardagh. In the south of Ireland and on the borders of the county of Limerick, there lies a district of two or three miles in length which is rendered interesting by the fact that it is one of the very few spots throughout this country in which some vestige of aboriginal forests still remain it has little or none of the lordly character of the american forest for the axe has felled its oldest and its grandest trees but in the close wood which survives live all the wild and pleasing peculiarities of nature its complete irregularity its vistas in whose perspective the quiet cattle are browsing its refreshing glades where the gray rocks arise from amid the nodding fern the silvery shafts of the old birch trees the knotted trunks of the hoary oak the grotesque but graceful branches which never shed their honours under the tyrant pruning hook the soft green sward the chequered light and shade the wild luxuriant weeds the lichen and the moss are all beautiful alike in the green freshness of spring or in the sadness and sere of autumn their beauty is of that kind which makes the heart full with joy appealing to the affections with a power which belongs to nature only this wood runs up from below the base to the ridge of a long line of irregular hills having perhaps in primitive times formed but the skirting of some mighty forest which occupied the level below but now alas whither have we drifted whither has the tide of civilization borne us it has passed over a land unprepared for it it has left nakedness behind it we have lost our forests but our marauders remain we have destroyed all that is picturesque while we have retained everything that is revolting in barbarism through the midst of this woodland there runs a deep gully or glen where the stillness of the scene is broken in upon by the brawling of a mountain stream which however in the winter season swells into a rapid and formidable torrent there is one point at which the glen becomes extremely deep and narrow 
the sides descend to the depth of some hundred feet and are so steep as to be nearly perpendicular the wild trees which have taken root in the crannies and chasm of the rock are so intersected and entangled that one can with difficulty catch a glimpse of the stream which wheels flashes and foams below as if exulting in the surrounding silence and solitude this spot was not unwisely chosen as a point of no ordinary strength for the erection of a massive square tower or keep one side of which rises as if in continuation of the precipitous cliff on which it is based originally the only mode of ingress was by a narrow portal in the very wall which overtopped the precipice opening upon a ledge of rock which afforded a precarious pathway cautiously intersected however by a deep trench cut out with great labour in the living rock so that in its pristine state and before the introduction of artillery into the art of war this tower might have been pronounced and that not presumptuously impregnable the progress of improvement and the increasing security of the times had however tempted its successive proprietors if not to adorn at least to enlarge their premises and about the middle of the last century when the castle was last inhabited the original square tower formed but a small part of the edifice the castle and a wide tract of the surrounding country had from time immemorial belonged to a family which for distinctness we shall call by the name of ardagh and owing to the associations which in ireland almost always attach to scenes which have long witnessed alike the exercise of stern feudal authority and of that savage hospitality which distinguished the good old times this building has become the subject and the scene of many wild and extraordinary traditions one of them i have been enabled by a personal acquaintance with an eye-witness of the events to trace to its origin and yet it is hard to say whether the events which i am about to record appear more strange and improbable as seen through the distorting medium of tradition or in the appalling dimness of uncertainty which surrounds the reality tradition says that sometime in the last century sir robert ardagh a young man and the last heir of that family went abroad and served in foreign armies and that having acquired considerable honour and emolument he settled at castle ardagh the building we have just now attempted to describe he was what the country people call a dark man that is he was considered morose preserved and ill-tempered and as it was supposed from the utter solitude of his life was upon no terms of cordiality with the other members of his family the only occasion upon which he broke through the solitary monotony of his life was during the continuance of the racing season and immediately subsequent to it at which time he was to be seen among the busiest upon the course betting deeply and unhesitatingly and invariably with success sir robert was however too well known as a man of honour and of too high a family to be suspected of any unfair dealing he was moreover a soldier and a man of intrepid as well as of a haughty character and no one cared to hazard a surmise the consequences of which would be felt most probably by its originator only gossip however was not silent it was remarked that sir robert never appeared at the race ground which was the only place of public resort which he frequented except in company with a certain strange-looking person who was never seen elsewhere or under other circumstances it was remarked too that this man whose relation to sir robert was never distinctly ascertained was the only person to whom he seemed to speak unnecessarily it was observed that while with the country gentry he exchanged no further communication than what was unavoidable in arranging his sporting transactions 
with this person he would converse earnestly and frequently tradition asserts that to enhance the curiosity which this unaccountable and exclusive preference excited the stranger possessed some striking and unpleasant peculiarities of person and of garb though it is not stated however what these were but they in conjunction with sir robert's secluded habits an extraordinary run of luck a success which was supposed to result from the suggestions and the immediate advice of the unknown were sufficient to warrant report in pronouncing that there was something queer in the wind and in surmising that sir robert was playing a fearful and a hazardous game and that in short his strange companion was little better than the devil himself years rolled quietly away and nothing very novel occurred in the arrangements of castle ardal excepting that sir robert parted with his odd companion but as nobody could tell whence he came so nobody could say whither he had gone sir robert's habits however underwent no consequent change he continued regularly to frequent the race meetings without mixing at all in the convivialities of the gentry and immediately afterwards to relapse into the secluded monotony of his ordinary life it was said that he had accumulated vast sums of money and as his bets were always successful and always large such must have been the case he did not suffer the acquisition of wealth however to influence his hospitality or his housekeeping he neither purchased land nor extended his establishment and his mode of enjoying his money must have been altogether that of the miser consisting merely in the pleasure of touching and telling his gold and in the consciousness of wealth sir robert's temper so far from improving became more than ever gloomy and morose he sometimes carried the indulgence of his evil dispositions to such a height that it bordered upon insanity during these paroxysms he would neither eat drink nor sleep on such occasions he insisted on perfect privacy even from the intrusion of his most trusted servants his voice was frequently heard sometimes in earnest supplication sometimes raised as if in loud and angry altercation with some unknown visitant sometimes he would for hours together walk to and fro throughout the long oak wainscoted apartment which he generally occupied with wild gesticulations and agitated pace in the manner of one who has been roused to a state of unnatural excitement by some sudden and appalling intimation these paroxysms of apparent lunacy were so frightful that during their continuance even his oldest and most faithful domestics dared not approach him consequently his hours of agony were never intruded upon and the mysterious causes of his sufferings appeared likely to remain hidden for ever on one occasion a fit of this kind continued for an unusual time the ordinary term of their duration about two days had been long past and the old servant who generally waited upon sir robert after these visitations having in vain listened for the well-known tinkle of his master's handbell began to feel extremely anxious he feared that his master might have died from sheer exhaustion or perhaps put an end to his own existence during his miserable depression these fears at length became so strong that having in vain urged some of his brother servants to accompany him he determined to go up alone and himself see whether any accident had befallen sir robert he traversed the several passages which conducted from the new to the more ancient parts of the mansion and having arrived in the old hall of the castle the utter silence of the hour for it was very late in the night the idea of the nature of the enterprise in which he was engaging himself a sensation of remoteness from anything like human companionship but more than all the vivid but undefined anticipation of something horrible came upon him with such oppressive weight 
that he hesitated as to whether he should proceed real uneasiness however respecting the fate of his master for whom he felt that kind of attachment which the force of habitual intercourse not unfrequently engenders respecting objects not in themselves amiable and also a latent unwillingness to expose his weakness to the ridicule of his fellow-servants combined to overcome his reluctance and he had just placed his foot upon the first step of the staircase which conducted to his master's chamber when his attention was arrested by a low but distinct knocking at the hall door not perhaps very sorry at finding thus an excuse even for deferring his intended expedition he placed the candle upon a stone block which lay in the hall and approached the door uncertain whether his ears had not deceived him this doubt was justified by the circumstance that the hall entrance had been for nearly fifty years disused as a mode of ingress to the castle the situation of this gate also which we have endeavoured to describe opening upon a narrow ledge of rock which overhangs a perilous cliff rendered it at all times but particularly at night a dangerous entrance this shelving platform of rock which formed the only avenue to the door was divided as i have already stated by a broad chasm the plank across which had long disappeared by decay or otherwise so that it seemed at least highly improbable that any man could have found his way across the passage in safety to the door more particularly on a night like this of singular darkness the old man therefore listened attentively to ascertain whether the first application should be followed by another he had not long to wait the same low but singularly distinct knocking was repeated so low that it seemed as if the applicant had employed no harder or heavier instrument than his hand and yet despite the immense thickness of the door with such strength that the sound was distinctly audible the knock was repeated a third time without any increase of loudness and the old man obeying an impulse for which to his dying hour he could never account proceeded to remove one by one the three great oaken bars which secured the door time and damp had effectually corroded the iron chambers of the lock so that it afforded little resistance with some effort as he believed assisted from without the old servant succeeded in opening the door and a low square-built figure apparently that of a man wrapped in a large black cloak entered the hall the servant could not see much of this visitor with any distinctness his dress appeared foreign the skirt of his ample cloak was thrown over one shoulder he wore a large felt hat with a very heavy leaf from under which escaped what appeared to be a mass of long sooty black hair his feet were cased in heavy riding boots such were the few particulars which the servant had time and light to observe the stranger desired him to let his master know instantly that the friend had come by appointment to settle some business with him the servant hesitated but a slight motion on the part of his visitor as if to possess himself of the candle determined him so taking it in his hand he ascended the castle stairs leaving the guest in the hall on reaching the apartment which opened upon the oak chamber he was surprised to observe the door of that room partly open and the room itself lit up he paused but there was no sound it looked in and saw sir robert his head and the upper part of his body reclining on a table upon which two candles burned his arms were stretched forward on either side and perfectly motionless it appeared that having been sitting at the table he had thus sunk forward either dead or in a swoon there was no sound of breathing all was silent except the sharp ticking of a watch which lay beside the lamp the servant coughed twice or thrice but with no effect his fears now almost amounted to certainty and he was approaching the table on which his master partly lay to satisfy himself of his death 
when Sir Robert slowly raised his head and, throwing himself back in his chair, fixed his eyes in a ghastly and uncertain gaze upon his attendant. At length he said slowly and painfully, as if he dreaded the answer, "'In God's name, what are you?' "'Sir,' said the servant, "'a strange gentleman wants to see you below.' At this intimation, Sir Robert, starting to his feet and tossing his arms widely upwards, uttered a shriek of such appalling and despairing terror that it was almost too fearful for human endurance. And long after the sound had ceased, it seemed to the terrified imagination of the old servant to roll through the deserted passages in bursts of unnatural laughter. After a few moments, Sir Robert said, can't you send him away why does he come so soon oh merciful powers let him leave me for an hour a little time i can't see him now try to get him away you see i can't go down now i have not strength oh god oh god let him come back in an hour it is not long to wait he cannot lose anything by it nothing 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 tell him that say anything to him the servant went down in his own words he did not feel the stairs under him till he got to the hall the figure stood exactly as he had left it he delivered his master's message as coherently as he could the stranger replied in a careless tone if sir robert will not come down to me i must go up to him the man returned and to his surprise he found his master much more composed in manner he listened to the message and though the cold perspiration rose in drops upon his forehead faster than he could wipe it away his manner had lost the dreadful agitation which had marked it before he rose feebly and casting a last look of agony behind him passed from the room to the lobby where he signed to his attendant not to follow him the man moved as far as the head of the staircase from whence he had a tolerably distinct view of the hall which was imperfectly lighted by the candle he had left there he saw his master reel rather than walk down the stairs clinging all the way to the banisters he walked on as if about to sink every moment from weakness the figure advanced as if to meet him and in passing struck down the light the servant could see no more but there was a sound of struggling renewed at intervals with silent but fearful energy it was evident however that the parties were approaching the door for he heard the solid oak sound twice or thrice as the feet of the combatants in shuffling hither and thither over the floor struck upon it after a slight pause he heard the door thrown open with such violence that the leaf seemed to strike the side wall of the hall for it was so dark without that this could only be surmised by the sound the struggle was renewed with an agony and intenseness of energy that betrayed itself in deep drawn gasps one desperate effort which terminated in the breaking of some part of the door producing a sound as if the doorpost was wrenched from its position was followed by another wrestle evidently upon the narrow ledge which ran outside the door overtopping the precipice this proved to be the final struggle it was followed by a crashing sound as if some heavy body had fallen over and was rushing down the precipice through the light bows that crossed near the top all then became still as the grave except when the moon of the night wind sighed up the wooden glen the old servant had not nerve to return through the hall and to him the darkness seemed all but endless but morning at length came and with it the disclosure of the events of the night near the door upon the ground lay sir robert's sword belt which had given way in the scuffle the huge splinter from the massive doorpost had been wrenched off by an almost superhuman effort one which nothing but the gripe of a despairing man could have severed and on the rocks outside were left the marks of the slipping and sliding of feet 
at the foot of the precipice not immediately under the castle but dragged some way up the glen were found the remains of sir robert with hardly a vestige of a limb or feature left distinguishable the right hand however was uninjured and in its fingers were clutched with the fixedness of death a long lock of coarse sooty hair the only direct circumstantial evidence of the presence of a second person end of the fortunes of sir robert ardagh by j sheridan le fanu read by lars rolander the open window by saki h h munro this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the open window my aunt will be down presently mr nuttel said a very self-possessed young lady of fifteen in the meantime you must try and put up with me frampton nuttel endeavoured to say the correct sum which should duly hatter the needs of the moment without unduly discounting the aunt that was to come privately he doubted more than ever whether these formal visits on a succession of total strangers would do much towards helping the nerve cure which he was supposed to be undergoing i know how it will be his sister had said when he was preparing to migrate to this rural retreat you will bury yourself down there and not speak to a living soul and your nerves will be worse than ever from mopping i shall just give you a letter of introductions to the people i know there some of them as far as i can remember were quite nice frampton wondered whether mrs sappleton the lady to whom he was presenting one of the letters of introduction came into the nice division do you know many of the people round here asked the niece when she judged that they had had sufficient silent communion hardly a soul said frampton my sister was staying here at the rectory you know some four years ago and she gave me letters of introduction to some of the people here he made the last statement in a tone of distinct regret then you know practically nothing about my aunt pursued the self-possessed young lady only her name and address admitted the caller he was wondering whether mrs sappleton was in the married or widowed state an undefinable something about the room seemed to suggest masculine habitation her great tragedy happened just three years ago said the child that would be since your sister's time her tragedy asked Fram. somehow in this restful country spot tragedies seemed out of place you may wonder why we keep that window wide open on an october afternoon said the niece indicating a large french window that opened to a lawn it is quite warm for the time of the year said frampton but has that window got anything to do with the tragedy out through that window three years ago to a day her husband and her two young brothers went off for their day shooting they never came back in crossing the moor to their favorite snipe shooting ground they were all three engulfed in a treacherous piece of bog it had been that dreadful wet summer you know and the places that were safe in other years gave away suddenly without warning the bodies were never recovered that was the dreadful part of it here the child's voice lost its self-possessed note and became falteringly human poor aunt always thinks that they'll come back some day they and the little brown spaniel that was lost with them and walk in that window just as they used to do that is why window is kept open every evening till it is quite dusk poor dear aunt she had often told me how they went out her husband with his white waterproof coat over his arm and ronnie her youngest brother singing bertie why do you bound as he always did to tease her because she said it got on her nerves do you know sometimes on still quiet evenings like this i almost get a creepy feeling that they will all walk in through that window she broke off with a little shudder it was a relief to frampton when the aunt bustled into the room with a whirl of apologies for being late in making her appearance i hope vera has been amusing you she said she has been very interesting said frampton i hope you don't mind the open window said mrs sappleton briskly my husband and brothers will be home directly from shooting and they always come in this way they went out for a snipe in the marshes today 
so they'll make a fine mess over my poor carpets. So like you men folk, isn't it? She rattled on cheerfully about the shooting and the scarcity of birds and the prospects for duck in the winter. To Frampton it was all purely horrible. It made a desperate but only partial successful effort to turn the talk on to a less ghastly topic. He was conscious that his hostess was giving only a fragment of her attention and her eyes were constantly straying past him to the open window and the lawn beyond. It was certainly an unfortunate coincidence that he should have paid his visit on this tragic anniversary. Doctor is ordering me complete rest, an absence of mental excitement, an avoidance of anything in the nature of violent physical exercise, announced Frampton, who labored under a tolerably widespread delusion that total strangers and chance acquaintances are hungry for the least detail of one's ailment and infirmities, their cause and cure. On a matter of diet, they are not so much in agreement, he continued. No? said Mrs. Appleton, in a voice that only replaced a yawn at the last moment. Then she suddenly brightened into alert attention, but not to what Frampton was saying. Here, they are at last, she cried, just in time for tea, and don't they look as if they are muddy up to their eyes? Frampton shivered slightly and turned towards her niece with a look intended to convey sympathetic comprehension. The child was staring out through the open window with a dazed horror in her eyes. In a chill shock of nameless fear, Frampton swung around in a seat and looked in the same direction. In the deepening twilight, three figures were walking across the lawn towards the window. They all carried guns under their arms, and one of them was additionally burdened with a white coat hung over his shoulders. A tired brown spaniel kept close at their heels. Noiselessly, they neared the house, and then a hoarse young voice chanted out of the dusk. I said, Birdie, why do you bound? Frampton grabbed wildly at his stick and hat. The hall door, the gravel drive, and the front gate were dimly noted stages in this headlong retreat. A cyclist came along the road, had to run into the hedge to avoid imminent collision. Here we are, my dear, said the bearer of the white Macintosh, coming in through the window. Fairly muddy, but most of it's dry. Who was that who bolted out as we came up? A most extraordinary man, a Mr. Nuttall said Mrs. Sappleton, could only talk about his illnesses and dashed off without a word of goodbye or apology when you arrived. One would think he had been a ghost. I expect it was the spaniel, said the niece calmly. He told me he had a horror of dogs. He was once hunted into a cemetery somewhere on the banks of the Ganges by a pack of Peria dogs and had to spend the night in a newly dug grave with creatures snarling and grinning and foaming just above him, enough to make anyone lose their nerve. Romance at short notice was her speciality. End of the open window. Recorded by Pooja Dubey, Mumbai, India. The Diary of Philip Westerly by Paul Compton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chuck Williamson. The Diary of Philip Westerly by Paul Compton. It has been ten years since my uncle, Philip Westerly, disappeared. Many theories have been advanced as to why and how he vanished so strangely and so completely. Many have wondered why a man should vanish and leave nothing behind him but a smashed mirror. But none of these theories or wild imaginings are half as fantastic as the story I gathered from the diary, which some whim prompted him to keep. But first, a word about Philip Westerly. He was a wealthy man, and also a cruel, selfish man. His wealth was attributed to this same cruelty and selfishness. He also had many whims. One of them was keeping a diary. Another was his love for mirrors. He was handsome in a cruel sort of way and almost effeminate in his liking to stand before them and admire himself 
this eccentricity was born out of the fact that covering one whole side of his room was a mirror of gigantic size the same mirror that is linked with his disappearance but read the excerpts from the diary of philip westerly august third afternoon billings asked me for an extension on that note today but i saw no reason why i should grant him any such thing when i told him this he began cursing me in a frightful manner he said i was cruel and that some day i would be called to account for the way i treated people i laughed outright at this but at the same time i feel a vague sense of uneasiness which even yet i have not dispelled night a remarkable thing has happened i had gone to my room to dress for dinner and i was standing before the mirror tying my tie i had begun the usual procedure that one follows when i noticed that no such action was recorded in the mirror true there was my reflection in the glass but it followed none of the movements that i made it was immobile i extended my hand to touch the reflection and encountered nothing but the polished surface of the mirror then i noticed a truly remarkable thing the reflection in the mirror wore no tie i stepped back aghast was this an illusion had my mind and vision been affected by some malady that i was not aware of impossible then i regarded the reflection with a more careful scrutiny there were a number of differences between it and myself for one thing it wore a stubby growth of beard on its face i was positive that i had visited the barber that very day and passed my hand across my chin to verify this it encountered nothing but smooth skin the lips of the man in the mirror drooped in a display of gnarled yellow fangs while my own bared nothing but two rows of gleaming well-cared-for teeth i was simultaneously with a feeling of disgust and fear and looked for further discrepancies i found them the feet and hands were abnormally large and the clothing of the thing was old baggy and covered with filth i dared not stay longer i tied the tie as best i could and descended hurriedly to dinner august fourth morning i awoke feeling jaded and tired my friend in the mirror is still with me ordinarily the reflection of myself in bed is caught in the mirror but not so this morning instead I saw that dweller within had, like myself, been having a night's rest. I hope he slept better than I did, for my own night was a series of fitful, restless tossings. Good morning, I said, rising. When I moved, he moved. As I advanced toward the mirror, he drew closer to me. I stopped and surveyed him. He resembled me only remotely, I hope. I smiled, and he responded with a wolfish twist of his mouth. I extended my hand as if I wanted to shake hands with him, but he drew back as if from fire. I can't understand the terror which he holds for me. I try not to show my fear in front of him, but I feel that animal-like he senses it i refer to the reflection as he him or it for i cannot bring myself to admit that the thing in the mirror is my reflection 
but i scarcely dare write what i do believe it to be i have always been skeptical about such things as souls but when i look into the mirror god help me night i am spending much more time in my room now i've spent most of the day here this thing is beginning to hold a morbid fascination for me i can't stay away for any length of time i wish i could my wife is beginning to worry about me she says i look pale she tells me i need rest a long rest if i could only confide in her in anyone but i can't i must fight and wait this out alone august fifth there has been little or no change in our relationship he still remains aloof today my wife came to my room to see how i was feeling she stood in such a position that looking into the mirror was unavoidable she stood there before the mirror arranging her hair she noticed nothing out of the ordinary but he was still there damn him he was still there and this time he snarled in triumph at me <sighs> one other remarkable thing my wife hadn't seen the thing there in the mirror but neither had i seen her reflection it was the same with peter my valet and anna the maid anna would have dusted the mirror had i not stopped her i must take no chances a close scrutiny might reveal him to me and they must not know they must not know august sixth three days three days of hell that's what it has been since i discovered that damn thing how he tortures me he has begun to mock me when he thinks he has given an extraordinarily clever impersonation he shakes with laughter i can't hear him laugh but i can see him and that's worse i can't stand it much longer august seventh we never know how much we will stand until we go through some ordeal such as i am now undergoing but i feel that my nerve is near the breaking point i have locked the door of my room anna leaves a tray outside my door sometimes i eat the food she brings but more often i don't my wife begs me to let her in but i tell her to go away i'm afraid to tell her i'm afraid to tell anyone i know what they do with people who have hallucinations no i can't tell neither can i leave god knows why but i can't august eighth it was the day before yesterday that i mentioned his mocking me today i tremble at the thought he is beginning to resemble me this morning i looked in the mirror and discovered that he had discarded his rags and was now dressed in one of my suits i ran to the wardrobe and discovered his clothes hanging where mine had been i turned and faced him he laughed and pointed toward my hands and feet they were bloated beyond recognition i dare not guess how far this change has gone i can write no more today august ninth the change is complete he looks more like me than i do myself he has grown more cruel with the change he taunts me with my ugliness finally i could stand it no longer i fled from the room at last i found the thing i was looking for a mirror 
when i came face to face with what i now am i nearly collapsed yes he has taken my form god pity me i've taken his i slunk back to the room in horror back to his laughter and the hell that is now my existence god knows what tomorrow will bring august tenth seven days since that devil has been in the mirror i have prayed to god that it may be the last it will i know it will he in the mirror senses it too i see the look of apprehension in his eyes damn him it's my turn to snarl in triumph now for when i lay down this pen for the last time perhaps i shall leap through the mirror and he exists only in the mirror god help me i am laying down my pen end of the diary of philip westerly el verdugo the executioner by honor de balzac translated by catherine prescott wormley this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read for you by chiquito crasto el verdugo the executioner by honor de balzac the clock of the little town of menda had just struck midnight at that moment a young french officer leaning on the parapet of a long terrace which bordered the gardens of the chateau de menda seemed buried in thoughts that were deeper than comported with the light-hearted carelessness of military life though it must be said that never were hour scene or night more propitious for meditation the beautiful sky of spain spread its dome of azure above his head the scintillation of the stars and the soft light of the moon illumined the delightful valley that lay at his feet resting partly against an orange tree in bloom the young major could see three hundred feet below him the town of menda at the base of the rock on which the castle is built turning his head he looked down upon the sea the sparkling waters of which encircled the landscape with a sheet of silver the chateau was illuminated the joyous uproar of a ball the sounds of an orchestra the laughter of the dancers came to him mingling with the distant murmur of the waves the coolness of the night gave fresh energy to his body that was tired with the heat of the day besides which the gardens were planted with trees so balmy and flowers so sweet that the young man felt as if plunged in a perfumed bath the chateau de menda belonged to a grandee of spain who was at this time living there with his family during the whole evening the eldest daughter had looked at the young officer with an interest expressing extreme sadness and such implied compassion on the part of a spaniard might well have caused the reverie of the frenchman clara was beautiful and though she had three brothers and one sister the wealth of the marquis de lagon seemed sufficient to justify victor marchand in believing that the young lady would be richly dowered but could he dare to believe that the daughter of the proudest noble in spain would be given to the son of a parisian grocer besides frenchmen were hated the marquis having been suspected by general g who governed the province of preparing an insurrection in favor of ferdinand the seventh the battalion commanded by victor marchand had quartered in the little town of menda to hold in check the neighboring districts which were under the control of the marquis de lagon a recent dispatch from marechal ney made it seem probable that the english would soon land a force upon the coast and he mentioned the marquis as the man who was believed to be in communication with the cabinet of london thus in spite of the cordial welcome which that spaniard had given to victor marchand and his soldiers the young officer held himself perpetually on his guard as he came from the ballroom to the terrace 
intending to cast his eye upon the state of the town and the outlying districts confided to his care. He asked himself how he ought to interpret the goodwill which the Marquis never failed to show him, and whether the fears of his general were warranted by the apparent tranquillity of the region. But no sooner had he reached the terrace that these thoughts were driven from his mind by a sense of prudence and also by natural curiosity. He saw in the town a great number of lights. Although it was a feast of St. James, he had that very morning ordered that all lights should be put out at the hour prescribed in army regulations, those of the chateau alone excepted. He saw, it is true, the bayonets of his soldiers gleaming here and there at their appointed posts. But the silence was solemn, and nothing indicated that the Spaniards were disregarding his orders in the intoxication of a fete. Endeavouring to explain to himself this culpable and deliberate infraction of rules on the part of the inhabitants, it struck him as the more incomprehensible, because he had left a number of officers in charge of patrols, who were to make their rounds through the night and enforce the regulations. With the impetuosity of youth, he was about to spring through an opening in the terrace wall and descend by the rocks more rapidly than by the usual road to a little outpost which he had placed at the entrance of the town, on the side toward the chateau, when a slight noise arrested him. He fancied he heard the light step of a woman on the gravelled path behind him. He turned his head and saw no one. But his eyes were caught by an extraordinary light upon the ocean. Suddenly he beheld a sight so alarming that he stood for a moment motionless with surprise fancying that his senses were mistaken. The white rays of the moonlight enabled him to distinguish sails at some distance. He tried to convince himself that this vision was an optical delusion caused by the caprices of the waves and the moon. At that moment a hoarse voice uttered his name. He looked through the opening in the wall and saw the head of the orderly who had accompanied him to the chateau rising cautiously through it. "'Is it you, Commander?' Yes. What is it? replied the young man in a low voice, a sort of presentiment warning him to act mysteriously. Those rascals are squirming like worms, said the man. And I have come, if you please, to tell you my little observations. Speak out. I have just followed from the chateau a man with a lantern who is coming this way. A lantern is mightily suspicious. I don't believe that Christian has any call to go and light the church tapers at this time of night. They want to murder us, said I to myself. So I followed his heels, and I discovered Commander close by here on a pile of rocks a great heap of faggots. He's after lighting a beacon of some kind up here, I'll be bound. A terrible cry echoing suddenly through the town stopped the soldier's speech. A brilliant light illuminated the young officer. The poor orderly was shot in the head and fell. A fire of straw and dry wood blazed up like a conflagration not thirty feet distant from the young commander. The music and the laughter ceased in the ballroom. The silence of death, broken only by moans, succeeded to the joyous sound of a festival. A single cannon shot echoed across the plain of the ocean. A cold sweat rolled from the officer's brow. He wore no sword. He was confident that his soldiers were murdered, and that the English were about to disembark. He saw himself dishonoured if he lived, summoned before a council of war to explain his want of vigilance. Then he measured with his eye the depths of the descent, and was springing towards it when Clara's hand seized his. Fly, she said. My brothers are following me to kill you. Your soldiers are killed. Escape yourself. At the foot of the rock over there, see, you will find Juanito's barb. Go, go. She pushed him, but the stupefied young man looked at her, motionless for a moment. Then, obeying the instinct of self-preservation which never abandons any man, even the strongest, he sprang through the park in the direction indicated, running among the rocks where goats alone had hitherto made their way. He heard Clara calling her brothers to pursue him. He heard the steps of his murderers. He heard the balls of several muskets whistling about his ears. But he reached the valley, found the horse, 
mounted him, and disappeared with the rapidity of an arrow. A few hours later, the young officer reached the headquarters of General G., whom he found at dinner with his staff. "'I bring you my head,' cried the commander of the lost battalion as he entered, pale and overcome. He sat down and related the horrible occurrence. An awful silence followed his tale. "'I think you were more unfortunate than criminal,' replied the terrible general, when at last he spoke. "'You are not responsible for the crime of those Spaniards, and unless the marshal should think otherwise, I absolve you.' These words gave but a feeble consolation to the unhappy officer. "'But when the emperor hears of it,' he cried, "'he will want to have you shot.' said the general. But we will see about that. Now, he said in a stern tone, not another word of this, except to turn it into a vengeance which shall impress with salutary terror of people who make war like savages. An hour later, a whole regiment, a detachment of cavalry, and a battery of artillery were on their way to Menda. The general and Victor marched at the head of the column. The soldiers, informed of the massacre of their comrades, were possessed by fury. The distance which separated the town of Menda from general headquarters was marched with marvellous rapidity. On the way, the general found all the villagers under arms. Each of the wretched hamlets was surrounded, and the inhabitants decimated. By one of those fatalities which are inexplicable, the British ships lay to without advancing. It was known later that these vessels carried the artillery and had outsailed the rest of the transports. Thus the town of Menda, deprived of the support it expected, and with the appearance of a British fleet in the offing, had led the inhabitants to suppose was at hand, was surrounded by French troops almost without a blow being struck. The people of the town, seized with terror, offered to surrender at discretion. With a spirit of devotion not rare in the peninsula, the slayers of the French soldiery, fearing from the cruelty of their commander that Menda would be given to the flames and the whole population put to the sword, proposed to the general to denounce themselves. He accepted their offer, making a condition that the inhabitants of the chateau, from the marquis to the lowest valet, should be delivered into his hands. This condition being agreed to, the general proceeded to pardon the rest of the population, and to prevent his soldiers from pillaging the town or setting fire to it. An enormous tribute was levied, and the wealthiest inhabitants held prisoner to secure payment of it, which payment was to be made within twenty-four hours. The general took all precautions necessary for the safety of his troops, and provided for the defense of the region from outside attack refusing to allow his soldiers to be billeted in the houses. After putting them in camp, he went up to the chateau and took possession of it. The members of the Lagan family and their servants were bound and kept under guard in the great hall where the ball had taken place. The windows of this room commanded the terrace which overhung the town. Headquarters were established in one of the galleries, where the general held, in the first place, a council as to the measure that should be taken to prevent the landing of the British. After sending an aide-de-camp to Marechal Ney, and having ordered batteries to certain points along the shore, the general and his staff turned their attention to the prisoners. Two hundred Spaniards who had delivered themselves up were immediately shot. After this military execution, the general ordered as many gibbets planted on the terrace as there were members of the family of Legon, and he sent for the executioner of the town. Victor Marchand took advantage of the hour before dinner to go and see the prisoners. Before long he returned to the general. "'I have come,' he said in a voice full of feeling, "'to ask for mercy.' "'You?' said the general in a tone of bitter irony. Alas, replied Victor, it is only a sad mercy. The Marquis, who has seen the gibbet set up, hopes that you will change that mode of execution. He asks you to behead his family as befits nobility. So be it, replied the general. They also ask for religious assistance and to be released from their bonds. 
they promised in return to make no attempt to escape. I consent, said the general, but I make you responsible for them. The Marquis offers you his whole fortune, if you will consent to pardon one of his sons. Really, exclaimed the general, his property already belongs to King Joseph. He stopped. A thought, a contemptuous thought wrinkled his brow, and he said presently, I will surpass his wishes. I comprehend the importance of his last request. Well, he shall buy the continuance of his name and lineage. But Spain shall forever connect with it the memory of his treachery and his punishment. I will give life and his whole fortune to whichever of his sons will perform the office of executioner on the rest. Go. Not another word to me on the subject. Dinner was served. The officers satisfied an appetite sharpened by exertion. A single one of them, Victor Marchand, was not at the feast. After hesitating long, he returned to the hall where the proud family of Legon were prisoners, casting a mournful look on the scene which now presented in that apartment where only two nights before he had seen the heads of the two young girls and the three young men turning giddily in the vaults. He shuddered as he thought how soon they would fall struck off by the sabre of the executioner. Bounded in their gilded chairs, the father and mother, the three sons and two daughters, sat rigid in a state of complete immobility. Eight servants stood near them, their arms bound behind their backs. These fifteen persons looked at one another gravely, their eyes scarcely betraying the sentiments that filled their souls. The sentinels, also motionless, watched them, but respected the sorrow of those cruel enemies. An expression of inquiry came upon the faces of all when Victor appeared. He gave the order to unbind the prisoners, and went himself to unfasten the cords that held Clara in her chair. She smiled sadly. The officer could not help touching softly the arms of the young girl as he looked with sad admiration at her beautiful hair and a supple figure. She was a true Spaniard, having the Spaniard complexion, the Spanish eyes with their curved lashes, and their large pupils blacker than a raven's wing. "'Have you succeeded?' she said, with one of those funereal smiles in which something of girlhood lingers. Victor could not keep himself from groaning. He looked in turn at the three brothers, and then at Clara. One brother, the eldest, was thirty years of age. Though small and somewhat ill-made, with an air that was haughty and disdainful, he was not lacking in a certain nobility of manner, and he seemed to have something of that delicacy of feeling which made the Spanish chivalry of other days so famous. He was named Juanito. The second son, Felipe, was almost twenty years of age. He resembled Clara. The youngest was eight. A painter would have seen in the features of Manuelo a little of that Roman constancy that David had given to children in his Republican pages. The head of the old Marquis, covered with flowing white hair, seemed to have escaped from a picture of Murillo. As he looked at them, the young officer shook his head, despairing that any one of these four beings would accept the dreadful bargain of the general. Nevertheless, he found courage to reveal it to Clara. The girl shuddered for a moment. Then she recovered her calmness, and went to her father, kneeling at his feet. Oh, she said to him, may Juanito swear that he will obey faithfully the orders that you will give him, and our wishes will be fulfilled. The Marquise quivered with hope, but when, leaning against her husband, she heard the horrible confidence that Clara now made to him, the mother fainted. Juanito, on hearing the offer, bounded like a lion in his cage. Victor took upon himself to send the guard away, after obtaining from the Marquis a promise of absolute submission. The servants were delivered to the executioner, who hanged them. When the family were alone, with no one but Victor to watch them, the old father rose. Juanito, he said. Juanito answered only with a motion of his head that signified refusal. Falling back on his chair and looking at his parents with dry and awful eyes, Clara went up to him with a cheerful air and sat upon his knee. 
dear Juanito, she said, passing her arm around his neck and kissing his eyelids. If you knew how sweet death would seem to me if given by you, think, I should be spared the odious touch of an executioner. You would save me from all the woes that await me, and, oh, dear Juanito, you would not have me belong to anyone, therefore. Her velvet eyes cast gleams of fire at Victor, as if to rouse in the heart of Juanito his hatred of the French. Have courage, said his brother Felipe. Otherwise our race, our almost royal race, must die extinct. Suddenly Clara rose. The group that had formed about Juanito separated, and the son, rebellious with good reason, saw before him his old father standing erect, who said in solemn tones, Juanito, I command you to obey. The young count remained immovable. Then his father knelt at his feet. Involuntarily, Clara, Felipe, and Manuelo imitated his action. They all stretched out their hands to him, who was to save the family from extinction, and each seemed to echo the words of the father. My son, can it be that you would fail in Spanish energy and true feeling? Will you leave me longer on my knees? Why do you consider your life, your sufferings only? Is this my son? he added, turning to his wife. He consents, cried the mother, in despair, seeing a motion of Juanito's eyelids, the meaning of which was known to her alone. Mariquita, the second daughter, was on her knees, pressing her mother in her feeble arms, and as she wept hot tears, her little brother scolded her. At this moment, the chaplain of the chateau entered the hall. The family instantly surrounded him and led him to Juanito. Victor, unable to endure the scene any longer, made a sign to Clara and went away, determined to make one more attempt upon the general. He found him in fine good humour, in the midst of a banquet, drinking with his officers, who were growing hilarious. An hour later, one hundred of the leading inhabitants of Menda assembled on the terrace, according to the orders of the general, to witness the execution of the Legon family. A detachment of soldiers were posted to restrain the Spaniards, stationed beneath the gallows on which the servants had been hanged. The heads of the burghers almost touched the feet of these martyrs. Thirty feet from this group was a block, and on it glittered a scimitar. An executioner was present in case Juanito refused his obedience at the last moment. Soon the Spaniards heard, in the midst of the deepest silence, the steps of many persons the measured sound of the march of soldiers, and the slight rattle of their accoutrements. These noises mingled with the gay laughter of the officers, as a few nights earlier the dances of a ball had served to mask the preparation for a bloody treachery. All eyes turned to the chateau and saw the noble family advancing with inconceivable composure. Their faces were serene and calm. One member alone, pale, undone, leaned upon the priest who spent his powers of religious consolation upon this man, the only one who was to live. The executioner knew, as did all present, that Juanito had agreed to accept his place for that one day. The old Marquis and his wife, Clara, Mariquita, and the two younger brothers walked forward and knelt down a few steps distant from the fatal block. Juanito was led forward by the priest. When he reached the place, the executioner touched him on the arm and gave him, probably, a few instructions. The confessor, meantime, turned the victims so that they might not see the fatal blows. But, like true Spaniards, they stood erect, without faltering. Clara was the first to come forward. Juanito, she said, have pity on my want of courage. Begin with me. At this instance, the hurried steps of a man were heard, and Victor Marchand appeared on the terrace. Clara was already on her knees, her white neck bared for the scimitar. The officer turned pale, but he ran with all his might. The general grants your life if you will marry me. 
he said to her in a low voice. The Spanish girl cast upon the officer a look of pride and contempt. Go on, Juanito, she said in a deep voice, and her head rolled at Victor's feet. The Marquise de Leganes made one convulsive movement as she heard that sound. It was the only sign she gave of sorrow. Am I placed right this way, my good Juanito? asked the little Manuelo of his brother. Ah, you are weeping, Mariquita, said Juanito to his sister. Yes, she said. I think of you, my poor Juanito. How lonely you will be without us. Soon the grand figure of the Marquis came forward. He looked at the blood of his children. He turned to the mute and motionless spectators and said in a strong voice, stretching his hand toward Juanito, Spaniards, I give my son my fatherly blessing. Now, Marquis, strike without fear. You are without reproach. But when Juanito saw his mother approach him, supported by the priest, he cried out, she bore me. A cry of horror broke from all present. The noise of the feast and the jovial laughter of the officers ceased at that terrible clamor. The Marquise comprehended that Juanito's courage was exhausted, and springing with one bound over the parapet, she was dashed to pieces on the rocks below. A sound of admiration rose. Juanito had fallen senseless. General! said an officer who was half drunk. Marcia has just told me the particulars of that execution down there. I will bet you never ordered it. Do you forget, messieurs, cried General G, that five hundred French families are plunged in affliction, and that we are now in Spain? Do you wish to leave our bones in its soil? After that allocution, no one, not even a sub-lieutenant, had the courage to empty his glass. In spite of the respect with which he is surrounded, in spite of the title El Verdugo, the executioner, which the King of Spain bestowed as a title of nobility on the Marquis de Leganes, he is a prey to sorrow. He lives in solitude, and is seldom seen, overwhelmed with the burden of his noble crime, he seems to await with impatience the birth of a second son, which will give him the right to rejoin the shades who ceaselessly accompany him. End of El Verdugo, The Executioner, by Honor de Balzac, read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. The Bold Dragoon or The Adventure of My Grandfather by Washington Irving. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Bold Dragoon by Washington Irving. My grandfather was a bold dragoon, for it's a profession, do you see? that has run in the family. All my forefathers have been dragoons and died upon the field of honour except myself. And I hope my posterity may be able to say the same. However, I don't mean to be vainglorious. Well, my grandfather, as I said, was a bold dragoon and had served in the Low Countries. In fact, he was one of that very army which, according to my uncle Toby, swore so terribly in Flanders. He could swear a good stick himself, and, moreover, was the very man that introduced the doctrine Corporal Trim mentions of radical heat and radical moisture, or, in other words, the mode of keeping out the dams of ditch water by burnt brandy. Be that as it may. It's nothing to the purport of my story. I only tell it to show you that my grandfather was a man not easily to be humbugged. He had seen service, or, according to his own phrase, he had seen the devil, and that's saying everything. Well, gentlemen, 
my grandfather was on his way to england for which he intended to embark at ostend bad luck to the place for one where i was kept by storms and headwinds for three long days and the devil of a jolly companion or pretty face to comfort me well as i was saying my grandfather was on his way to england or rather to ostend no matter which it's all the same so one evening towards nightfall he rode jollily into bruges very like you all know bruges gentlemen of a queer old-fashioned flemish town once they say a great place for trade and money-making in old times when the mineers were in their glory but almost as large and as empty as an irishman's pocket at the present day well gentlemen it was the time of the annual fair all bruges was crowded and the canals swarmed with dutch boats and the streets swarmed with dutch merchants and there was hardly any getting along for goods wares and merchandises and peasants in big breeches and women in a half a score of petticoats my grandfather rode jollily along in his easy slashing way for he was a saucy sunshiny fellow staring about him at the motley crowd and the old houses with gable ends to the streets and storks nests on the chimneys winking at your vrouws who showed their faces at the windows and joking the women right and left in the street all of whom laughed and took it in amazing good part for though he did not know a word of their language yet he always had a knack of making himself understood among the women well gentlemen it being the time of the annual fair all the crown was crowded every inn and tavern full as my grandfather applied in vain from one to the other for admittance at length he rode up to an old rackety inn that looked ready to fall to pieces and which all the rats would have run away from if they could have found room in any other house to put their heads it was just such a queer building as you see in dutch pictures with a tall roof that reached up into the clouds and as many garrets one over the other as the seven heavens of mahomet nothing had saved it from tumbling down but a stork's nest on the chimney which always brings good luck to a house in the low countries and at the very time of my grandfather's arrival there were but two of these long-legged birds of grace standing like ghosts on the chimney top faith but they've kept the house on its legs to this very day for you may see it at any time you pass through bruges as it stands there yet only it is turned into a brewery a brewery of strong flemish beer at least it was so when i came that way after the battle of waterloo my grandfather eyed the house curiously as he approached it might not altogether have struck his fancy had he not seen in large letters over the door here were cooped man good and drunk my grandfather had learnt enough of the language to know that the sign promised good liquor this is the house for me said he stopping short before the door the sudden appearance of a dashing dragoon was an event in an old inn frequented only by the peaceful sons of traffic a rich burgher at antwerp a stately ample man in a broad flemish hat and who was the great man and great patron of the establishment sat smoking a clean long pipe on one side of the door a fat little distiller of geneva from shayadam sat smoking on the door and a comely hostess in crimped cap beside him and the hostess's daughter a plump flanders lass with long gold pendants in her ears was at a side window Humph! said the rich burgher of antwerp with a sulky glance at the stranger dead toivel said the fat little distiller of shayadam the landlord saw with the quick glance of a publican that the new guest was not at all at all to the taste of the old ones and to tell the truth he did not himself like my grandfather's saucy eye he shook his head 
Not a garret in the house but was full. Not a garret, echoed the landlady. Not a garret, echoed the daughter. The burgher of Antwerp and the little distiller of Shiredam continued to smoke their pipes sullenly, eyeing the enemy askance from under their broad hats, but said nothing. My grandfather was not a man to be browbeaten. He threw the reins on his horse's neck, cocked his hat on one side, stuck one arm akimbo, slapped the broad thigh with the other hand. Faith and troth, said he, but I'll sleep in this house this very night. My grandfather had on a tight pair of buckskins. The slap went to the landlady's heart. He followed up the wow by jumping off his horse and making his way past the staring mine ears into the public room. Maybe you've been in the bar room of an old Flemish inn. Faith, but a handsome chamber it was as you'd wish to see. With a brick floor, a great fireplace, with a whole Bible history in glazed tiles. And then the mantelpiece, pitching itself head foremost out of the wall, with a whole regiment of cracked teapots and earthen jugs paraded on it, not to mention half a dozen great delf platters hung about the room by way of pictures, and the little bar in one corner, and the bouncing barmaid inside of it with a red calico cap and yellow eardrops. My grandfather snapped his fingers over his head as he cast an eye around the room. Fate! This is the very house I've been looking after, said he. There was some farther show of resistance on the part of the garrison, but my grandfather was an old soldier and an Irishman to boot, and not easily repulsed, especially after he had got into the fortress. So he blarneyed the landlord, kissed the landlord's wife, tickled the landlord's daughter, chucked the barmaid under the chin, and it was agreed on all hands that it would be a thousand pities and a burning shame into the bargain to turn such a bold ragoon into the streets. So they laid their heads together, that is to say my grandfather and the landlady, and it was at length agreed to accommodate him with an old chamber that had for some time been shut up. "'Some say it's haunted,' whispered the landlord's daughter. "'But you're a bold dragoon, and I say you don't fear ghosts.' "'The devil a bit,' said my grandfather, pinching her plump cheek. "'But if I should be troubled by ghosts, I've been to the Red Sea in my time, and have a pleasant way of laying them, my darling. My darling. And then he whispered something to the girl which made her laugh and give him a good-humoured box in the ear. In short, there was nobody knew better how to make his way among the petticoats than my grandfather. In a little while, as was his usual way, he took complete possession of the house, swaggering all over it into the stable to look after his horse, into the kitchen to look after his supper. He had something to say or do with every one, smoked with the Dutchman, drank with the Germans, slapped the men on the shoulders, tickled the women under the ribs. Never since the day of Ali Croker had such a rattling blade been seen. The landlord stared at him with astonishment. The landlord's daughter hung her head and giggled whenever he came near. And as he turned his back and swaggered along, his tight jacket setting off his broad shoulders and plump buckskins and his long sword trailing by his side, the maids whispered to one another, What a proper man! At supper my grandfather took command of the table d'hôte, as though he had been at home, helped everybody, not forgetting himself, talked with everyone, whether he understood their language or not and made his way into the intimacy of the rich burgher of Antwerp, who had never been known to be sociable with anyone during his life. In fact, he revolutionized the whole establishment, and gave it such a rouse that the very house reeled with it. He outsat everyone at table excepting the little fat distiller of Shiredam, who had sat soaking for a long time before he broke forth. But when he did, he was a very devil incarnate. He took a violent affection for my grandfather. So they sat drinking and smoking and telling stories and singing Dutch and Irish songs, 
without understanding a word each other said, until the little Hollander was fairly swamped with his own gin and water and carried off to bed, whooping and hiccuping and trolling the burden of a low Dutch love song. Well, gentlemen, my grandfather was shown to his quarters, a huge staircase composed of loads of hewn timber, and through long rigmarole passages hung with blackened paintings of fruit and fish and game and country frolics and huge kitchens and portly burgomasters, such as you see about old-fashioned Flemish inns, till at length he arrived at his room. An old times chamber it was, sure enough, and crowded with all kinds of trumpery. It looked like an infirmary for decayed and superannuated furniture, where everything diseased and disabled was sent to nurse, or to be forgotten. Or rather, it might have been taken for a general congress of old legitimate movables, where every kind and country had a representative, though two chairs were alike. Such high backs and low backs and leather bottoms and worsted bottoms and straw bottoms and no bottoms and, and cracked marble tables with curiously carved legs holding balls in their claws as though they were going to play at ninepins. My grandfather made a bow to the motley assemblage as he entered and, having undressed himself, placed his light in the fireplace, asking pardon of the tongs seemed to be making love to the shovel in the chimney corner and whispering soft nonsense in its ear. The rest of the guests were by this time sound asleep, for your mine ears are huge sleepers. The housemaids, one by one, crept up yawning to their attics, and not a female head in the inn was laid on a pillow that night without dreaming of the bold dragoon. My grandfather, for his part, got into bed and drew over him one of those great bags of down under which they smother a man in the low countries. And there he lay, melting between two feather beds, like an anchovy sandwich between two slices of toast and butter. He was a warm-complexioned man, and this smothering played the very deuce with him. So, Sure enough, in a little while it seemed as if a legion of imps were twitching at him and all the blood in his veins was in fever heat. He lay still, however, until all the house was quiet, except the snoring of the mine ears from the different chambers, who answered one another in all kinds of tones and cadences like so many bullfrogs in a swamp. The quieter the house became, the more unquiet became my grandfather. He waxed warmer and warmer until at length the bed became too hot to hold him. Maybe the maid has warmed it too much, said the curious gentleman inquiringly. I'd rather think the contrary, replied the Irishman. But, be that as it may, it grew too hot for my grandfather. Faith, there's no standing this any longer, says he. So he jumped out of bed and went strolling about the house. What for? said the inquisitive gentleman. Why, to cool himself, to be sure, replied the other. Or perhaps to find a more comfortable bed, or perhaps. But no matter what he went for, he never mentioned, and there's no use in taking up our time and conjecturing. Well, my grandfather had been for some time absent from his room, and was returning perfectly cool when just as he reached the door he heard a strange noise within. He paused and listened. It seemed as if someone was trying to hum a tune in defiance of the asthma. He recollected the report of the rooms being haunted, but he was no believer in ghosts, so he pushed the door gently ajar and peeped in. Egad, gentlemen, there was a gamble carrying on within enough to have astonished St. Anthony. By the light of the fire he saw a pale, weazen-faced fellow in a long flannel gown and a tall white nightcap with a tassel to it, who sat by the fire with a bellows under his arm by way of bagpipe, from which he forced the asthmatical music that had bothered my grandfather. As he played too he kept twitching about with a thousand queer contortions, nodding his head and bobbing about his tassel nightcap. 
My grandfather thought this very odd and mighty presumptuous, and was about to demand what a business he had to play his wind instruments in another gentleman's quarters, when a new cause of astonishment met his eye. From the opposite side of the room a long-backed, bandy-legged chair, covered with leather and studded all over in a coxcomical fashion with little brass nails, got suddenly into motion, thrust out first a claw foot, then a crooked arm, and at length, making a leg, slided gracefully up to an easy chair of tarnished brocade, with a hole in its bottom, and led it gallantly out in a ghostly minuet about the floor. The musician now played fiercer and fiercer, and bobbed his head and his nightcap about like mad. By degrees the dancing mania seemed to seize upon all the other pieces of furniture. The antique long-bodied chairs paired off in couples and led down a country dance. A three-legged stool danced a hornpipe, though horribly puzzled by its supernumerary leg while the amorphous tongs seized the shovel round the waist and whirled it about the room in a German waltz. In short, all the movables got in motion, capering about, pirouetting, hands across, right and left, like so many devils, all except a great clothes press, which kept curtsying and curtsying like a dowager in one corner in exquisite time to the music being either too corpulent to dance, or perhaps at a loss for a partner. My grandfather concluded the latter to be the reason, so, being like a true Irishman devoted to the sex, and at all times ready for a frolic, he bounced into the room, calling to the musician to strike up Paddy O'Rafferty, capered up to the clothes press, and seized upon two handles to lead her out, when, whiz, the whole revel was at an end. The chairs, tables, tongs, and shovels slunk in an instant as quietly into their places as if nothing had happened. And the musician vanished up the chimney, leaving the bellows behind him in a hurry. My grandfather found himself seated in the middle of the floor, with the clothes press sprawling before him, and the two handles jerked off and in his hands. Then, after all, this was a mere dream, said the inquisitive gentleman. The devil a bit of a dream, replied the Irishman. There never was a truer fact in this world. Faith, I should have liked to see any man tell my grandfather it was a dream. Well, gentlemen, as the clothes press was a mighty heavy body, and my grandfather likewise, particularly in rear, you may easily suppose two such heavy bodies coming to the ground would make one bit of a noise. Faith! The old mansion shook as though it had mistaken it for an earthquake. The whole garrison was alarmed. The landlord who slept just below hurried up with a candle to inquire the cause. But with all his haste, his daughter had hurried to the scene of uproar before him. The landlord was followed by the landlady, who was followed by the bouncing barmaid, who was followed by the simpering chambermaids, all holding together, as well as they could, such garments as they had first lain hands on, but all in a terrible hurry to see what the devil was to pay the chamber of the bold dragoon. My grandfather related the marvellous scene he had witnessed and the prostrate clothes press and the broken handles bore testimony to the fact. There was no contesting such evidence, particularly with a lad of my grandfather's complexion, who seemed able to make good every word either with sword or shillelagh. So the landlord scratched his head and looked silly, as he was apt to do when puzzled. The landlady scratched, oh, she did not scratch her head, but she knit her brow, and did not seem half pleased with the explanation. But the landlady's daughter corroborated it by recollecting that the last person who had dwelt in the chamber was a famous juggler who had died of St. Vitus's dance and no doubt had infected all the furniture. This set all things to right, particularly when the chambermaids declared that they all had witnessed strange carryings on in that room, and as they declared this upon their honours, they could not remain a doubt upon the subject. And did your grandfather go to bed again in that room? said the inquisitive gentleman. That's more than I can tell. Where he passed the rest of the night was a secret he never disclosed. 
In fact, though he had seen much service, he was but indifferently acquainted with geography, and apt to make blunders in his travels about inns at night that it would have puzzled him sadly to account for in the morning. "'Was he ever apt to walk in his sleep?' said the knowing gentleman. "'Never that I heard of.'" End of The Bold Dragoon or The Adventure of My Grandfather by Washington Irving Read for you by Chiquito Craster, Birmingham, Alabama. The Tomb of Hyre by A. C. Benson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Craster. The Tomb of Hyrie by A. C. Benson In the old days, when the Romans were taking Britain for their own, there lived in Cambria a great prince called Hyrie. He was forty summers old. He had long been wed, but had no son to reign after him. Many times had he fought with the Romans, but his tribe had been driven slowly backward to the northern mountains. Here for a time he dwelt in some peace, but the Romans crept ever nearer, and Hyri, who was a brave and generous prince and a great warrior, was sore afflicted, seeing the end that must come. He dwelt in a high valley of moorland, where his tribe kept such herds as yet remained to them. Hyri often asked himself in what he and his people had wronged the gods, that they should be thus vexed for he was, as it seemed, like a wild beast with his back to a wall, fighting with innumerable foes. To the north and east and south and west lay great mountains, and behind them to west and north lay the sea. To south and east the Romans held the land, so that the Cambrians were penned in a corner. One day heavy news came. A great army of the Romans had come by sea to the estuary in the south. The next day the scouts saw them marching up the pass like ants, in countless numbers, with a train of baggage, and the day after, when the sun went down, the watch-fires burnt in a long line across the southern moorland, and the sound of the horns the Romans blew came faintly upon the wind. All day the tribesmen drove in their cattle up to the great camp that lay on a low hill in the centre of the vale. Hyrie held a council with his chiefs and it was determined that next day they should give them battle. That night, when Hyrie was sitting in his hut, his beloved wife beside him, they came to see him the chief priest of the tribe. He was an old man, hard and cruel, and Hyrie loved him not, and he hated Hyrie secretly, being jealous of his power. He came in, his white priestly robe bound about the waist with a girdle of gold, and Hyrie rose to do him honour, making a sign to his wife that she should leave the room. So she withdrew softly. Then the priest sat down. He asked first of Hyri whether it was determined to fight on the morrow, and Hyri said it was so determined. Then the priest said, Lord Hyri, tomorrow is the feast of the god of death, and he claims a victim, if we are to be victorious. Now Hyri hated the sacrifices of men, and the priest knew it. And so for a while Hyrie sat in silence, frowning and beating his foot upon the ground, while the priest watched him with bright and evil eyes. Then Hyrie said, Tomorrow must many men, both violent and timid, die. Surely that were enough for the god. But the priest said, Nay, my lord, it is not enough. The law saith that unless a victim should offer himself, the priest should choose a victim, and the victim must be goodly, for we are in an evil case. Then Hyri looked at the priest and said, Whom have ye chosen? For he saw that the priests had named a victim among themselves. So the priest said, We have named Nephri, be content. Now Nephri was a lad of fifteen summers, cousin to Hyri. His father was long dead and Hyri loved the boy who was brave and gracious, and had hoped in his heart that Nephri would succeed him as prince of the tribe. Then Hyri was very wroth, and said, 
Lord Priest, that may not be. Nephri is next of kin to myself, and will grow up a mighty warrior, and he shall be chief after me. If the gods grant him life, look you, tomorrow we shall lose many mighty men, and it may be that I shall myself fail. For I have been heavy-hearted for many days, and I think that the gods are calling me, and Nephri we cannot spare. Then the priest said, Lord Hyrie, the gods choose whom they will by the mouth of their priests. It were better that Nephri should perish than that the people should be lost. And, indeed, the gods have spoken. For I prayed that the victim should be shown me, hoping that it might be some common man. But hardly had I done my prayer when Nephri came to my hut to bring an offering. And my heart cried out, Arise, for this is he. The gods have chosen him, not I, and Nephri must die for the people. Then Hyri was grievously troubled, for he reverenced the gods and feared the priests. And he rose up, with anger and holy fear striving within him, and said, Prepare then for the sacrifice. Only tell not Nephri. I myself will bring him. It may be that the gods will provide another victim. For he hoped within his heart that the Romans might attack at dawn, so that the sacrifice should tarry. Then the priest rose up and said, Lord Hyrie, I would it were otherwise, but we must in all things obey the gods. The sacrifice is held at dawn, and I will go and set all things in order. So Hyrie rose and bowed to the priest. But he knew in his heart that the priest sorrowed not, but rather exulted in the victim he had chosen. Then Hyrie sent word that Nephri should come to him, and presently Nephri came in haste, having risen from his bed, with the warm breath of sleep about him. And there went, as it were, a sword through Hyrie's heart, to see the boy so fair and gracious, and so full of love and bravery. Then Hyrie made the boy sit beside him, and embraced him with his arm. And then he said, Nephri, I have sent for you in haste, for there is a thing that I must tell you. Tomorrow we fight the Romans, and something tells me in my heart that it will be our last fight. Whether we shall conquer or be conquered I know not, but it is a day of doom for many. And now hearken. I have prayed many times in my heart for a son, but no son is given me. But I hoped that you would reign after me if indeed there shall be any people left to rule. And if it so fall out, remember that I spoke with you tonight, and bid you be brave and just, loving your people and fearing the gods, and forget not that I love you well. And Nephri, half in awe and half in eager love for the great prince, his cousin, said, I will not forget. Then Hyrie kissed him on the cheek and said, Dear lad, I know it. And now you must sleep, for there is a sacrifice at dawn, and you must be there with me. But before you sleep, and I would have you sleep here in my hut tonight, pray to the Father of the gods to guide and strengthen me, for we are as naught in his hands. And I have a grievous choice to make, a choice between honour and love, and I know not which is the stronger. Then Hyrie spread a bearskin on the floor, and bed Nephri sleep, and he himself sat long in thought looking upon the embers. And it was quiet in the hut. Only he saw, by the firelight, the boy's bright eye watching him, till he chid him lovingly, saying, Sleep, Nephri, sleep. And Hyri himself lay down to sleep, for he knew that a weary day of fighting lay before him. But the priest went to the other chiefs and spake with each of them, saying that the gods had chosen Nephri for the victim of the sacrifice, but that Hyri would fain forbid it. But the priest did worse than that, for he told many of the tribesmen the same story, and though they were sorry that Nephri should die, yet they feared the gods exceedingly, and did not think to dispute their will. About an hour before the dawn, when there was a faint light in the air and the breeze began to blow chill from the hills, and the stars went out one by one, the chiefs began to gather their men, and there was sore discontent in the camp. All night had the rumour spread beside the fires and in the huts that Hyrie would resist the will of the gods, 
and save Nephery from death, and many of the soldiers told the chiefs that if this was so they would not fight. So the chiefs assembled in silence before the hut of Hairi, for they feared him greatly, but they feared the gods more, and they had resolved that Nephery should die. While they stood together, Hairi came suddenly out among them. He carried a brand in his hand, which lit up his pale face and bright armour, and he came like a man risen from the dead. Then the oldest chief, by name Griff, drew near, and Hairi asked him of the Romans, and the chief said that they were not stirring yet. Then Hairi held up his hand. Every now and then came the crying of cocks out of the camp, but in the silence was heard the faint sound of trumpets from the moorland, and Hairi said, They come. Then Griff, the chief, said, Then must the sacrifice be made in haste. And he turned to Hyrie and said, Lord Hyrie, it is rumoured in the camp that Nephri is the chosen victim, but that you seek to save him. And Hyrie looked sternly at him and said, And wherefore are the purposes of the gods revealed? Lo, I will bring Nephri myself to the sacrifice, and we shall see what will befall. Then the chiefs were glad in their hearts and said, Lord Hyrie, it is well. The ways of the gods are dark, but they rule the lives of men, and who shall say them nay? And Hyri said, Ay, they are dark enough. Then he made order that the scouts should go forth from the camp, and while he yet spake the procession of priests in their white robes passed like ghosts to the huts on their way to the temple. And Hyri said, We must follow. And he called to Nephri, but the boy did not answer. Then Hyrie went within and found him sleeping very softly, with his face upon his hand, and he looked upon him for a moment, and then he put his hand upon his head, and the boy rose up, and Hyrie said, It is time, dear Nephri, and pray still for me, for the gods have not showed me light. So Nephri marvelled, and tried to make a prayer, and he was filled with wonder at the thought of the sacrifice for he had never been present at a sacrifice before. And he was curious to see a man slain, for the sight of death in those grievous years of battle had lost its terrors even for children. So Nephri rose up, and Hyrie smiled upon him, and took the boy's hand, and the two went out together. Then they came with the chiefs through the camp. The precinct of the goddess was at the upper end to the north. It was a thick grove of alders, through which no eye could pierce, and it was approached by a slanting path, so that none could see the precinct. So presently they came to the place and entered it, and Hyrie felt the boy's hand cold within his own. But it was not fear, for Nephri was fearless, but only eagerness to see what would be done. They passed inside the precinct. None was allowed to enter except the priests and the chiefs and certain captains. It was a dolorous place, in truth. All around ran a wall of high slabs of slate. At the upper end, on a pedestal, stood the image of the god, a rude and evil piece of handiwork. It was a large and shapeless figure, with hands outspread. In the head of it glared two wide and cruel eyes, painted with paint, red-rimmed and horrible. The pedestal was stained with rusty stains, and at the foot lay a tumbled heap that was like the body of a man, as indeed it was, for the victim was left lying where he fell, until another victim was slain. All around the body sprouted rank grasses out of the paved floor. The priest stood round the image, the chief priest in front holding a bowl and a long thin knife. Two of them held torches which cast a dull glare on the image. The chiefs arranged themselves in lines on each side, and Hyrie, still holding Nephri by the hand, walked up to within a few feet of the image, and there stood silent. Then the chief priest made a sign, and at that two other priests came out with a large box of wood and shovels, and they took the bones of the victim up and laid them in the box, in which they clattered as they fell, and Nephri watched them curiously, but shuddered not, and when the poor broken body was borne away, then Nephri began to look round for the victim. But the priest began a hymn. Their loud, sad voices rang out very strangely on the chilly air. 
and the tribesmen without hearing the sound trembled for fear and cast themselves upon the ground then there was silence and the chief priest came forward and made signs to hairi to draw near and hairi advanced and said to nephri as he did so now child be brave and nephri looked up at hairi with parted lips and then it suddenly came into his mind that he was indeed to be the victim but he only looked up with a piteous and inquiring glance at hairi and hairi drew him to the pedestal then there was a terrible silence and the hearts of the chiefs beat fast for fear and horror and some of them turned away their faces and the tears came to their eyes then the priest raised his knife while nephri watched him but hairi stepped forward and said lord priest i have chosen hold thy hand the law saith that a victim must die and that one may offer himself to die ye have chosen nephri for none has offered himself but i bid thee hold for here i offer myself as a victim to the god then there was an awful silence and the priest looked fiercely and evilly upon nephri and made as though he would have smitten him but hairi seized the priest's hand in both his own and with great strength drove the knife into his own breast stood for a moment then swayed and fell and as he lay he said my father i come the last victim at the shrine and then he drew out the knife sobbed and died but the chiefs crowded round to look upon him and griff said we are undone our king is dead and who shall lead us then he scowled evilly upon the priests and said this is your work men of blood and as ye have slain our king ye shall fight for us today and see if the god will protect you then if he saves you we shall know that you have spoken truly and if he saves you not then ye are false priests and the chief scribe assent and griff the eldest chief commanded that weapons should be given them and that they should be guarded and fight with the vanguard but nephri cast himself upon the body of hairi and wept sore but while they stood came a scout in terror and told them that the romans were indeed advancing so the temple was emptied in a moment and nephri sat by the body of the dead and looked upon it but the chiefs hastened to the wall of the camp and it was now day in the light that fell pale and cold from the eastern hills they saw the romans creeping across the moor in black dots and patches and the sound of the horns drew nearer then they arrayed themselves and went out in the white morning and the women watched from the wall but hairi's wife was told the tale and went to the temple but dared not enter for no woman might set foot therein and she wailed sitting at the gate calling upon hairi to come forth but hairi lay on his back before the image the blood flowing from his breast while nephri held his head upon his knee then went the battle very evilly for the tribe little by little they were driven back upon the camp and they were like sheep without a shepherd and still the chiefs hoped in the help of the god but the priests were smitten down one by one and last of all the chief priest fell his bowels gushing from a wound in his side and cursed the god and died cursing then the heavens overclouded blacker and blacker the clouds gathered with a lurid redness underneath like copper till a mighty storm fell upon them just as the cambrians broke and fled back to the camp and watched the steady advance of the roman line with the eagles bowing and nodding as they swept over the uneven moor then suddenly they were aware of a strange thing whence it came they knew not but suddenly under the camp wall there appeared the figure of a man in armor on a white horse it was the form of hairi as they had often seen him ride forth on his white charger to battle and behind him seemed to be a troop of dark and shadowy horsemen hairi seemed to turn around and raise a sword in the air as he had often done in life and then with a great rendering of the heavens and a mighty crash of thunder the troop of horses swept down upon the roman line then came a fearful sound from the moorland and those who gazed from the wall saw the romans waver 
and turn. And in a moment they were in flight, melting away in the moor as stones that roll from a cliff after a frost, and all men held their breath in silence, for they saw the Romans flying, and none to pursue, except that some thought that they saw the white horse ride hither and thither, and the flash of the waving sword of Hyri. There followed a strange and dreadful night. The list of warriors was called, and many were absent. From hour to hour a few wounded men crawled in, and in the morning, seeing that the Romans were not near at hand, they sent out a party with horses to bring in the wounded and the dead. All the priests were among the slain. Those of the chiefs that were alive held a meeting, and resolved that the camp must now be held, for the Romans would attack the next day, and they sent the women and children with the herds away to a secret place in the mountains, all but Hyrie's wife, who would not leave the camp. Then the other chiefs would have made Griff the old chief prince of the tribe, but he refused it, saying that Hyrie had wished Nephri to be chief, and that none but Nephri should succeed. So search was made for Nephri, and he was found in Hyrie's hut with Hyrie's wife. He had stayed beside the body till it grew stiff and cold, and the eyes had glazed, and then he had feared to be alone with it, and had crept away. So they put a crown upon Nephri's head, and each of the chiefs in turn knelt before him and kissed his hand, and Nephri bore himself proudly, but gently, as a prince should, rising as each chief approached, and then he was led out before the people, and they were told that Nephri was the prince by wish of Hyrie, and no one disputed the matter. Then in the grey dawn a scout came in haste, and said that three Romans were approaching the camp, and that one was a herald, and the old chief asked Nephri what his will was. And the boy looked him in the face and said, Let them be brought hither. So the chiefs were again summoned, and the Romans came slowly into the camp. The herald came in front, and he was followed by an officer of high rank, as could be seen from his apparel and the golden trappings of the horse that bore him, and another officer followed behind. And the herald, who knew something of the Cambrian language, said that this was the Lord Legate himself, and that he was come to make terms. The chiefs looked at each other in silence, for they knew that the Romans must needs have taken the camp that day if they had assaulted it. The legate was a young man with a short beard, very much burnt by the sun, and bearing himself like a great gentleman. He looked upon him with a careless and lordly air, and when they came into the presence of the chiefs, the three dismounted, and the legate looked round to see which was the prince. And the old chief put Nephri forward, and said to the herald, here is our king. And the legate bowed to Nephri, and looked at him in surprise. And the herald said, in the Cambrian language to Nephri, that the legate was fain to arrange a truce, or indeed a lasting peace, if that was possible. Then the old chief said to Nephri, My lord, ask him wherefore the legate has come. And Nephri asked the herald, and the herald asked the legate. And the legate said, smiling to the herald, Tell him anything but the truth say that it is our magnanimity. And then he added in a lower tone, turning to the other officer, Though the truth is that the men will not dare to attack the place after the rout of yesterday. And the legate added to the herald, Say that the Romans respect courage, and have seen that the Cambrians are worthy foes, and we would not press them hard. It is a peaceful land of allies that we desire, and not a land conquered and made desolate. So the herald repeated the words. Then the old chief bed Nephri said that they must have time to consider, adding that it would not be well to seem eager for peace. Then he said to the other chiefs, Yes, this is our salvation. So they conferred together, and at last it was decided to tell the legate that they would be friends and allies, but that the boundaries of the land must be respected, and that the Romans must withdraw beyond those boundaries. And this the legate accepted and it was determined that all the land that could be seen from the camp should be left to the Cambrians, and that the mountains should be as a wall to them, and this too the legate approved. So in the space of an hour the Cambrians were relieved of their foes, and were in peace in their own land, and the legate was royally entertained. But before he went he asked through the herald where the great warrior was who had led the last charge on the day before, for he had taken him to be the prince of the land. 
Then the old chief said, He is sick and may not come forth. Then the legate rode away, and Nephri rode a little way with him to do him honour, and after courteous greetings they departed. Then the old chief and Nephri talked long together, and they determined what they would do. Then the people were assembled, and Nephri spoke first, and said that he was young and could not put words together, but he added that the old chief knew his will and would announce it. Then the old chief stood forward and told the people the story of Hyrie's death and how he had died for the people, and then he told them that he had made the priests fight, and that the gods had surely shown that they were false priests, for they were slain, and the gods had not protected them, and that Nephri was prince by the will of Hyri. And then he said that Hyri, with his latest breath, had said that he should be the last victim, and that thus it should be. For Hyri, he said, has become a god indeed, and fought for us, and has conquered the Romans. And therefore, he said, the Lord Nephri has decreed that the precinct of the god should not indeed be destroyed, for that were impious, but that a great mound should be raised over the face, and that it should be the tomb of Hyri, and that peaceful offerings should be made there, and that it should be kept as a day of festival, and that Nephri himself should be priest as well as prince, and his successors for ever. And the people all applauded, for they had dreaded the bloody sacrifices. And the next day, and for many days, they laboured until over the whole precinct they had raised a mighty mound, burying the image of the god. And for Hyrie's body they made a chamber of stone, and they laid him therein, with his face upward to the sky, and made great lamentation over him. When all things were in order, a solemn feast was held, and Nephri, on the top of the mound, made a sacrifice of fruits and milk, and blessed the people in the name of Hyri, and he made order that to make the place more blessed, all weddings should thenceforth be celebrated upon the mound, so that it should be the precinct of life and not of death. And the people rejoiced. That night Nephri slept in the hut of Hyri, and at the dead time of darkness, when all was silent in the camp, except for the pacing of the sentry to and fro, Nephri awoke and saw in the hut the form of Hyri standing, only brighter and fairer than when he lived. And he looked upon Nephri with a smile, as though his heart was full of joy. Then he came near, and said in a voice like the voice of a distant fall of water, Nephri, dear child, thou hast done well and wisely. Be just and merciful and loving to all, and rule with diligence, and grieve not. Then Nephri would have asked him of the place wherein his spirit abode, but could not find words, for he was full of wonder, though not afraid. But Hyri smiled again, as though he knew his thoughts, and said, Ask me not that, for I may not tell, but only this I may tell you, that no man who has lived wisely and bravely need fear the passage. It is but a flying shadow on the path, like a cloud on the hill, and then he stands all at once in a fairer place. Neither need he fear that he lays aside with the body the work and labour of life, for he works and labours more abundantly, and his labour is done in joy, without fear or heaviness, and for all such spirits is their high and true labour waiting. Therefore, Nephri, fear not, and though I cannot come to thee again, for thou shalt live and be blessed, yet will I surely await thee yonder. And then there came a darkness, and the form of Hyrie seemed to fade gradually away, as though he were withdrawn along some secret path, and there went others with him, and Nephri slept. And in the morning came Hyrie's wife and said to Nephri that Hyrie had stood beside her in the night and comforted her. And I know, she said, that he lives and waits for me. So the land had peace, and Nephri ruled wisely and did justice among the mountains by the sea. End of the Tomb of Hyrie by A. C. Benson. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama.